Simon & Schuster Audio presents Zeros by Scott Westerfeld, Margot Lanigan, and Deborah Biancotti. Read by Amber Benson. For everyone with a power, whether or not you found it yet. So many powers, so few heroes. Chapter 1. Scam. More coffee? Ethan jumped. It had been a long night. Okay. The waitress wasn't even listening, the coffee pot dipping towards Ethan's cup. Which was fine. Coffee was crap and he was already wired, but it gave him an excuse to keep sitting there. He'd spent the last two hours hunched in a back booth of the moonstruck diner, staring out the window at the Cambria Central Bank. It was right across the street, and it opened at eight. Want anything else? The waitress asked. I'm good, thanks. He drank some more coffee, still crap. At least the bitter java gave him a reason to seem jumpy. Nobody would look at him and say, Hey, that kid is real jumpy. Must have something to do with the army green duffel bag under his feet. Nope, nobody would blame the bag. He glanced around the diner. Everyone was wrapped up in their own 6 a.m. thoughts. Nobody was even looking at him. Okay, one girl was looking at him, but she glanced away like she'd been caught staring. So apart from that one cute girl at the front of the diner, nobody was looking at him. Besides, this was the middle of Main Street. Nobody would come rolling in to seize Ethan and his bag and haul them both out into the dawn. Nothing bad ever happened here in Cambria, California, population half a million during a college term. The diner was filling up with delivery guys on breaks, respectable citizens in suits, and the occasional group of clubbers winding down. All Ethan had to do was watch the bank and wait for the doors to open. Easy. As long as the waiting didn't kill him. More coffee? Seriously, it's been five minutes. Can you stop with the coffee? The waitress looked stung. Sorry, Ethan said. But she was already gone. He pulled the duffel bag up and wedged it into a corner of the booth like a makeshift pillow, which was pretty funny given what was in the bag. It was the stuff in the bag that was keeping him awake. That and the people looking for it. He'd always known the voice would do this one day. Get him into serious trouble. The voice didn't care about consequences. The voice didn't weigh up the pros and cons and then say, Hey, Ethan, this is how you can get what you want. The voice wasn't sentient like that. It wasn't smart. It didn't negotiate. The voice just went for it. It lied and lied, and most of the time Ethan didn't even know where the lies came from when they poured out of his mouth. How did the voice know half that stuff? But Ethan had always known that one day he'd pay for all those lies. Right now he was hoping today was not that day. Chapter 2 Scam The evening before had started well. A date with a beautiful woman, a pre-med student from the north side. Ethan put on his best shirt, a pen-striped button-up his sister had bought him last year, promising it would drive girls crazy. The pre-med girl was way out of his league, even with the shirt. But the voice had talked her into it. He could see her trying to understand it herself. She was at least four years older than him, way more sophisticated and much hotter. But every time she seemed uncertain, Ethan would draw her back in. Or rather, the voice would. It would just say the right thing about the midnight art house film they'd seen, or the obscure pre-med stuff she was into, or Ethan's plan to study at the Sorbonne one day. Whatever the hell the Sorbonne was. But then it got late and exhausting and, frankly, kind of expensive. He'd used up all his cash buying movie tickets and caramel popcorn and drinks from a wine bar so divey that Indira had called it quaint. The wine was 15 bucks a glass. 
Ethan didn't even like wine. If it had been up to him, he would have scammed his way through the night. The voice was great at getting stuff for free. But Indira clung to Ethan's side, watching his every move like he was some exotic breed she'd never seen before. A teenage kid from the wrong side of town. She probably thought he was quaint, too, in a divey way. It was pretty clear that the voice could never convince Indira to do anything more than talk and smile and cling. A nice girl from the north side? She probably wouldn't even make out on a first date. So the voice switched itself to mute while Ethan worked out what he wanted to do next. When he decided all he wanted was to go home, the voice sorted that out too. He left Indira standing by her car in front of the art house cinema. She seemed to glow, lit by the marquee lights announcing a lineup of classic films. Her long summer dress billowed in the night sea breeze. She looked confused by his sudden departure, maybe a little hurt. This blows, Ethan muttered to himself, in his real voice. He hated how sad she looked. But he didn't have the energy to turn around. It was all the fault of that stupid art house film. Who knew it could be that boring? Watching it had sucked the life out of him. As Ethan walked away, he rubbed his jaw with the palms of both hands. His muscles always felt weird after a long night of letting the voice talk for him like he'd been speaking a foreign language. It left a taste in his mouth, too. Oily charm with notes of bullshit. The worst part was, he had no way home. He was totally out of cash, so a cab was out of the question, and buses didn't run this late. Indira would have given him a ride, but of course the voice had spun some crap about his vintage Jaguar parked a few streets away just to get rid of her. The voice sucked at planning ahead. The voice just knew when Ethan wanted out. It also liked to twist the knife sometimes. It had claimed the jaguar was a present from his dad. Yeah, right. Luckily, it was summer, and Cambria's nightclub strip was still in full swing. There were plenty of people to hitch a ride with on Ivy Street. Ethan followed the thudding drumbeat until he reached the crowd. Light spilled from canopied doorways, and people shouted at each other, deafened by music that rebounded from the pavement and warehouse walls. The voice could talk Ethan's way into one of the clubs, but once inside, no one would hear him over the music. He'd be just another gawky 17-year-old with a mousy buzz cut and too many freckles. No, what he needed was somebody here outside. A muddle of tribes skirted each other on Ivy, Hipsters and scene kids, crumpled coked-up suits from the stripper bar, a few raver wannabes in summer outfits showing lots of skin. They were mostly older than Ethan, which meant they mostly had cars. Somebody could be talked into giving him a lift home. Just ahead of him, a guy exited one of the clubs from a side door, which probably meant he was staff and sober enough to drive. Ethan sped up. The guy walked with a steady purpose, he had an army green duffel bag over one shoulder. Ethan let himself drift into the guy's way until the bag slapped against him. Hey, watch it, he said in his own voice. The guy spun to face him. He was a few inches shorter than Ethan, but twice as big across the shoulders, and he had no neck. The sort of guy who could crush you with an annoyed glare. His right hand dropped into a jacket pocket, like he was ready to pull a knife. Whoa, Ethan backed away. My mistake, sorry about that. The guy scanned Ethan. His eyes were piercing, way too blue, almost electric. But a moment later, he smiled, eased his hand out of his pocket, and gripped Ethan's shoulder. It was like being held up by a wall. Sorry, man, the guy said. His voice was calm and low. Did I hit you? No problem, you missed, actually. Ethan sputtered, fear beating in his chest. All he wanted was to be on the same side as this guy in his next fight. He let the voice take over. Taylor, send me over to help you out. That was one of the voice's specialties. Names. The big guy paused, looking him up and down, not smiling anymore. Taylor sent you? An edge of disbelief in the low rumble of his voice. How's a squirt like you gonna help? Ethan hated when this happened. 
The voice would get him into situations that only the voice could get him out of. Then he was stuck, listening and waiting, letting it talk. Taylor said you were bad off last night. Wasn't sure you'd remember the way to his house. The voice sounded like it was making a joke, so Ethan tried to smile. The guy stared at him another moment, then laughed. Abruptly, like that was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard. What a dickhead. I worked off that hangover in the gym this morning. How do you know, Taylor? My sister's in his old army unit, Ethan heard himself say, and cringed. Thing was, his sister really was in the army. Stuff could go really wrong when the voice told the truth. What if the guy asked for his sister's name? What would the voice say then? But the guy relaxed, like he understood everything now. So your family. Taylor wants you to join the team. Ethan nodded, because it seemed like the right thing to do. He said I should learn from the best. The voice twisted his throat like it was imitating someone. Nobody better than the Craig. A low thunder of laughter spilled out of the Craig, who reached over and took Ethan's shoulder again. The weight of his hand almost buckled Ethan's knees. He'd tell you to say that. What a dickhead. He shoved Ethan, sending him stumbling a few steps backward. Come on, cars this way. The Craig headed for a side street. Ethan took a breath and followed. Hell, maybe he could still get a ride home out of this. Chapter 3 Scam the Craig owned just about the crappiest car Ethan had ever seen. It was an old beat-up Ford sedan. Either it was brown or it was covered in enough dirt to make it look that way. It was hard to tell. The Craig saw his expression and laughed that sharp, abrupt laugh again. <laughs> Lesson one, kid. Skip the fancy cars. Too easy to spot. Don't let your ride make you an easy mark. Someone sets up on you, they'll be looking for a fancy car. Ethan shrugged. There was kind of a paranoid logic to what the Craig was saying. Plus, his right hand had sunk into his pocket again, and Ethan still couldn't decide what was in there. A gun? A knife? Even at 4 a.m., it was way too hot to be wearing a jacket. Craig noticed the direction of his gaze. You're not carrying, are you? Ethan clenched his jaw, not trusting the voice. He shook his head. Good. Craig looked both ways up and down the street, then opened the Ford's back door and slung the duffel bag across the seats. For now, your job is to keep your eyes open. Ethan nodded mutely. A trickle of cold ran down his spine. He was about to get into a car with a strange man, a really strange man who was armed and probably a criminal with a duffel bag full of who knew what and head for some place unknown. He opened his mouth to let the voice take over. It could say whatever it wanted, lie, plead, beg, as long as the Craig let Ethan walk away, back to Ivy Street, where he could charm some clueless raver into a ride home instead. But the voice didn't say anything, which meant there was nothing to say and no way out of this not without raising Craig's suspicions. Ethan wasn't sure what would happen if Craig called Taylor and found out that everything he'd said was a lie. But nothing good, that was for sure. So Ethan shut his mouth and got into the car. Chapter 4 Mob Kelsey never wanted nights like this to end. When the nightclubs closed at 4 a.m., she wasn't ready to leave. But the crowd was breaking into groups of two or three, looking for a way home or some other kind of fun or whatever else they were looking for. Kelsey hated it when the throngs of dancers shattered into lonely pieces, like the gears of some wonderful machine broken beyond recognition. She found Mikey leaning against the wall outside the Scheherazade. He looked beat, but he still managed to pull off that lazy rock god attitude. Knee out, one foot on the wall. He had a cigarette pinched between finger and thumb, and he was watching the crowd through his own exhaled smoke. She called his name. His eyes rolled toward her. 
Hey, little sis. She wasn't his sister, but Mikey liked to remind Kelsey that she was too young to hang out in the clubs. Want to get some pancakes? She asked. Sure. We should find some people, Kelsey said. You know, get a crew together. Mikey took a drag of his cigarette, said in a roiling stream of smoke, Don't you ever get sick of crowds? Kelsey laughed. Mikey, it's me you're talking to. He grinned. She found Remy next. He was trying to pick up a girl. Two girls, actually. And when one of them announced that she, oh my God, loved pancakes, Remy came with. That made five, including Kelsey. Five was okay, but six was better. As they headed up Ivy, Kelsey spotted her friend Ling coming out of the buzz. She swept up behind her, linking arms. Hey, girlfriend! Ling jumped and spun. When she saw it was Kelsey, she gave her hand a squeeze. I'm both wired and tired. Is that weird? Too wired and or tired for pancakes? Never. That made six, and Kelsey relaxed. A group was forming around her, like an engine whose last part had clicked into place, ready for the power switch to be thrown. She knew that if she guided them toward a common purpose, she could keep the group going the rest of the night, at least until the sun came up. The stupid sun always broke up parties. Kelsey had needed this, the crowd, as long as she could remember the boom and beat and feel of a group. Since the time when she was six and had run away from home, following the pulse of something in the distance. She'd ask Lee, her mom at the time, what it was she could feel. Was there a flood coming? No, darling. Lee had been watching TV, sprawled on the couch. We don't get floods around here. So, six-year-old Kelsey had walked out of the house in search of answers. She remembered it clearly. She'd opened the door and stepped into the dark street without the slightest fear, because she had to find the rumble and hum that made her fingertips tremble. She had to follow it to its source. It had turned out to be a high school football game, though it wasn't the game that had called her. It was the crowd. The temperature and pressure of their excitement had rolled across her like a wave. The parking lot security guard had found her an hour later, sitting on the hood of a pickup, eyes closed, feeling the sweet, nervous thrum of the home team running down the clock for a win. The home team, she was told later, hadn't won a game in ten years. Kelsey had never felt anything like it. When the guard asked her what such a tiny thing was doing there all alone, Kelsey had said, Floating. And she was floating now savoring the dregs of the night's energy and the little group she'd gathered. It was like writing an echo, a ghost of the dancing that had swept her away for long hours before. They headed for the moonstruck diner on Main Street. She wanted this. She wanted the group to stay together because life outside a group was boring. The good stuff only happened when she was part of something bigger than herself. And Kelsey was all about the good stuff. Chapter 5, Scam You part of that scene? The Craig hooked a thumb over his shoulder back at Ivy Street. Ethan answered for himself, without the voice. Me, not really too loud. Yeah, I hate doof doof music. Craig drummed on the steering wheel, hissing like a techno hi-hat. No wonder they all have to get high. Well, the Craig is here to help with that. Ethan didn't answer, just glanced over his shoulder at the duffel bag in the back seat. The Ford's windows were open, letting in lashes of wind that set the green vinyl of the bag shimmering. Relax, kid, the Craig said. That stuff stays in the club. We just move the profits. So that's money, huh? Ethan asked in his own voice. Course. Taylor told you that, right? He was kind of light on details. Craig chuckled. That's Taylor for you. 
Ethan made a noncommittal hmm noise and kept his jaw clamped against the voice. At least they were headed toward his neighborhood on the outskirts of Cambria. Maybe this wasn't a total disaster. But the crag was looking at him now. His two blue eyes glittered in the reflections of the headlights from the occasional traffic shooting past. Say, what unit's your sister with? Ethan tensed. Direct questions were easiest for the voice to answer, but they were the most dangerous, too. 101st Airborne, 320th Field Artillery, 2nd Battalion. Yep, that was the damn truth again. Craig smiled, satisfied. A girl in the artillery? That's badass. Those shells are heavy. Ethan agreed. It was true, his sister was hardcore, even if she was a Humvee mechanic and never went near any ordnance. Jess had shipped out a month ago, leaving him alone with Mom. His mother worked pretty much all the time, which was great during the summer. It meant he could stay out as late as he wanted. Still, Ethan would prefer to have Jess around. Hey, that's... Ethan almost raised a hand to point at the end of his street, but stopped himself just in time. The last thing he wanted was a guy like Craig, knowing where he lived. He figured he could walk back from wherever Craig was taking him. That's what? Ethan shook his head. Thought I saw somebody. I knew what to turn off back there. You must have good eyes, kid. Craig frowned at the rearview mirror. Ethan stayed quiet. The Craig went back to drumming on the wheel, humming some formless tune. They were leaving Cambria now. On one side of the car was a row of suburban houses spaced far apart. On the other side, it was just trees. They hadn't gotten on the highway, though, so at least they were headed someplace local. But the walk home was getting longer with every mile. Ethan opened his mouth again, hoping the boys had something up its sleeve, some perfect story that would get Craig to stop the car and let him out. Nothing. No sound came out. The voice was on mute again, which meant there were no words to get him what he wanted. Ethan had learned to hate the quiet. Five minutes later, the car began to slow. They pulled onto a dirt road that led into the trees. Craig turned off the headlights, taking the winding turns carefully. You don't want the lights on for this? Ethan asked. Don't want to spook anyone. They see the lights, they might think it's cops, and start shooting. In the darkness, the Craig's voice was grim. Ethan's stomach nodded tighter. What the hell had he gotten himself into? Gravel popped and crunched beneath the tires. The blackness was broken only by flickers of moonlight filtering through the trees. What's your name anyway, kid? Ethan was too freaked out to think he let the voice choose. Axel. Cool name. Your parents' Guns and Roses fans? Ethan wondered what Guns and Roses were. You bet. This answer seemed to please the Craig. I'll tell Taylor you did good. You had my back the whole way. Thanks, Craig. The voice sounded calm, but Ethan was half paralyzed with fear. If Taylor himself was at the end of this gravel road, there was no way the voice could convince him he'd send some strange kid to help move a bag full of money. The voice would remain silent while Ethan was beaten to death. The Ford slid to a halt. Through the darkness, Ethan made out an old cottage among the trees. It was run down and ancient, like something from a slasher movie. A black jeep sat next to it, a gun rack against its back window. None of this made Ethan feel any better about his chances of getting out of here alive. Craig saw him staring. You never been to Taylor's before? Sure I have, just never at night. The voice sounded calm, but inside, Ethan was screaming. This was it. Time to act. Sometimes, if he improvised, Ethan could force the voice to do something. Craig switched off the engine, but before he could pull the keys from the ignition, Ethan grabbed his arm. Wait. What? The Craig froze. His gaze swiveled out toward the darkness. His hand dropped into his jacket pocket again. Uh, I, I saw something. 
Ethan pointed out the front window, wanting with all his heart for Craig to be as terrified as he was. Uh, in those trees. What did you see? A cigarette flare. The voice had taken over now, spurred by Ethan's desire. Guy had a goatee, maybe? That mean anything to you? Are you serious? Craig pulled his hand out of his pocket. He was holding a big, gleaming cannon of a gun. You don't think it's Alvarez, do you? The voice asked. Damn, stay down. Oh yeah, Ethan was staying down. Craig opened his door and slipped out, crouching low behind the front end of the car. Ethan scooted over to the driver's seat and pulled the door closed. The car keys were right in front of him, dangling from the steering column. Okay, time to go. The voice could do no more. Ethan reached for the keys, but he needed a noise, something to divert Craig from the sound of the car's ignition. He leaned onto the horn as hard as he could. At the blare of noise, Craig hit the ground. He might have even screamed. Lights popped on in the scary little cottage. Ethan twisted the keys and turned over the engine. Then he slammed the Ford into reverse, shoving the accelerator down as far as it would go. The tires roared as the car swerved backward through the darkness, sending up a shower of gravel. He wished the voice would take over his whole body, turn him into some secret agent who could drive as well as he could lie. But it was just Ethan now, clinging to the wheel and hoping he wasn't about to crash into a tree. The car headlights were still off, but big security floods mounted on the cottage roof suddenly burst to life, spilling through the night. Ethan whispered a short prayer as the car catapulted backward into the dark. He waited for a shot to ring out, for the windshield to become a spiderweb of glass under a storm of bullets. But Craig, face down in the driveway in front of the cottage, was still pointing his gun into the trees. Probably he thought Ethan was just some panicky wannabe thug, not an imposter. Sometimes being a mousy 17-year-old could really pay off. Not often, but in those rare moments while stealing a car from a bunch of drug-dealing hoods and not wanting to get shot? And <laughs> yeah, definite payoff. The car reached an opening along the trees, and Ethan spun the steering wheel hard, sending the tires skidding until the car pointed back the way he'd come. He switched the headlights on and accelerated. A moment later, he was headed toward the public road, the Ford spitting gravel in its wake. Finally, the wheels hit asphalt. Ethan turned hard left, back toward home. That was when he remembered the duffel bag full of cash in the back seat. In a way, it only seemed fair. He'd practically earned it after everything he'd been through that night. But he had to put the bag someplace safe. Then he'd dump the car a long way from home so no one could trace it back to his house. Which meant that, after all this... Ethan still needed a ride home. He drove hard, the night air whipping through the open windows. Craig and Taylor would be following in that black jeep soon enough, and there'd be no talking them down. Trouble was, if Ethan kept speeding like this, a cop would pull him over and inevitably check the bag in the back seat. He nearly missed the turn off home, he was thinking so hard. But at the last minute, he spun the wheel and took the corner wide, fishtailing until the back tire bounced off the curb. He was about to pull up at the front of his house when he saw lights on in the living room. Damn, his mom was actually up. Ethan kept the car moving. Okay, there was no way to dump the bag without her noticing. She'd ask what was in it, and Ethan would be dead meat. He'd been scamming for as long as he'd been able to speak, but by now Mom could tell when it was the voice doing the talking. She'd slap him before he got two words out. He could try hiding it in the garage, but she was always snooping through his stuff, and bonus, she worked for the district attorney's office. Okay, stupid voice, what do we do now? The voice didn't answer, of course. It never spoke directly to Ethan. He could never get it to just tell him what to do, but it loved to talk to other people. He hit the accelerator. That was the key. Other people. People could be charmed, reasoned with, and convinced to do what you wanted. 
The voice might be deranged sometimes, but in the presence of a listener, it always knew what to say. He headed back to town. Maybe he could get the voice to tell someone else what he should do next. Chapter 6 Mob After an hour and then some of wandering the quiet streets of Cambria, the six of them headed to an all-night diner in the middle of town, an unlikely group all from different scenes but connected by the leftover energy of dancing. The Unwind, Mikey called it. The part that came after the clubbing for hours. They were tired, but no one was ready for the party to end. Not even Ling, who looked like she might actually be asleep, slumped against the red leather of the booth. Kelsey could feel Ling's connection to the group, the sizzle of the coffee she'd drunk before nodding off. Kelsey sat with her back against the window, letting the rising sun warm her. Her shadow across the table hardened as the dawn drew on. She'd start every day this way if she could. If only the Cambria clubs always stayed open late like they did in summer. Mikey gave her a smile. Did you have a good night, little sister? Kelsey nodded. Yeah, you? Sure. When I see you coming, I know it's going to be a good night. You always know how to pick the right club. Or maybe I make it the right club. Mikey laughed. <laughs> Is that why they always let you in? Kelsey felt herself blush. She doubted anyone else could spot it under her makeup. She always wore makeup to go clubbing. Without it, she looked too young. Of course, by now the bouncers all had standing orders to let her in. Most nights, she even got a few free drinks. They might not understand how, but the owners and managers knew she brought a good time. As the sun rose, though, the faces around her grew sleepier, coming down, coming out of it faces. Remy was playing with a salt shaker and staring at the girls across the table. Kelsey had thought they were sisters when she'd met them, but in the dawn light, they just looked like two girls who dressed the same. And who were, right now, ignoring Remy while he tried to find a way into their conversation. One of the girls said, The DJ was awesome tonight. Totally, Remy said. Both girls pretended not to hear. One turned to Kelsey. The guy on the door told me Driver's playing tonight. You like Driver? Kelsey nodded. She liked any music that got the crowd psyched, got them bonded, ready to dance and dance. Remy said, I like them. Flat, blank stares from the girls. Kelsey realized it was coming on fast, the moment when the group would begin to fracture and fall apart, no longer united by a common goal, to dance, to move. Their thoughts were beginning to turn in other directions, to real-life jobs and how can I get that girl to talk to me and ultimately getting home. It felt as though her heart were shrinking. A waitress approached, both arms loaded with plates that steamed in the sunlight. Slim super stack? Food got them energized again. The flash of anticipation, the buzz of hunger around the table made Kelsey smile. Mikey pointed at the empty space in front of him. Right here. He had to push the dozing Ling off his arm to eat his pancakes. Ling sat up and rubbed her eyes, making black tears of her mascara. Her long hair was a messy tangle, strands of it still clinging to Mikey's sleeve. Ling couldn't help but be beautiful. The waitress put another steaming plate in front of Kelsey, who claimed the syrup bottle and let it run until square pools formed in the crisscrosses of her waffles. After a long night of dancing, she needed sugar and carbs. She poured syrup until she had to eat her waffles with a spoon. One of the two new girls sniggered. At Kelsey, or her waffles, or both. Kelsey didn't care. Remy always went for the wrong kind of girls which was a shame because he was a decent guy when you got to know him. Right now, he was pushing his fork sideways through a stack of pancakes and dropping butter into the holes. He seemed to have forgotten about everything else. Kelsey let her gaze slide over his shoulder, hoping there was some other group of leftovers from the clubs. Maybe someone she knew, a table she could hop to, and this one fell apart. Half a dozen tables were occupied in the diner, but 
Most of the customers were office workers getting breakfast or truckers in the middle of a long hall. The only clubbers were couples. Couples were no fun. There was one guy at the back who looked like he'd been awake all night. He had a buzz cut and was dressed in a nice pinstripe shirt like he'd been on a date. The shirt was crumpled now, though, and he was alone. He sat with a hand clamped around his coffee cup, his eyes fixed on the window. As Kelsey watched, he downed the contents of his cup in a convulsive swallow, then tried to get the waitress's attention. The waitress was ignoring him like he was an ex-boyfriend or something. He half stood, holding up his coffee cup like a white flag. He must really need a caffeine kick. Most people didn't go for seconds of the coffee in this place. The waitress finally relented and brought the coffee pot over. The kid slid back into his booth. There was a green duffel bag in the booth beside him, which probably meant he was a hitchhiker. Kelsey wondered who would pick up a guy who managed to look hunted, edgy, and exhausted all at the same time. The buzz cut didn't help. He was too young to be any kind of off-duty soldier, so maybe he was some kind of military wannabe. She shuddered, feeling how alone he was. What is it? Mikey asked. Kelsey slid her gaze over to meet his. Nothing. As soon as their pancakes were done, the two girls Remy had brought along went home. They left barely enough money to cover their food with no tip or tax. Everyone gave their pile of crumpled bills dirty looks, but no one said anything to Remy. They all felt sorry for him. Great night, huh? Remy said. Kelsey nodded. An ache began to settle into her body. Not the sweet and muscle ache of having danced all night, but the dull pain of isolation. She glanced over at Mikey. He was chewing on a bent-up straw and staring at nothing, lost in his own thoughts. Ling had started in on Mikey's pancakes, leaning against him, her long black hair rolling down his shoulder like a scarf. Remy was restless, changing seats every few minutes. The two girls might have been annoying, but with them gone, the group was over. No point delaying the inevitable, Kelsey figured. She dug into her pocket and pulled out her last $20 bill. She dropped it on the table and flattened it out with the palm of her hand. Mikey leaned over and slid it back toward her. I got this, he told her. Kelsey grinned. She'd learned a long time ago that there was no arguing with Mikey. Thanks. Weird. Ling gestured at the window behind Kelsey with a fork full of stolen pancake. Kelsey craned her neck. All she saw was the empty street, the dawn light beginning to paint the pavement in a soft glow. Cambria Central Bank squatted on the opposite corner, the park beside it in shadow from the wide trees. There wasn't a shred of traffic anywhere. For a moment, it looked like the whole town had been abandoned. Then a blue car went past, driving slow. There it is again, Ling said. <laughs> There's what again? Mikey asked. I swear that same car's gone past three times. The car turned in front of the bank, heading away down central. Meth heads, Mikey said, driving in circles till they crash. Which kind of crash? Remy asked. Drug or automotive? Mikey laughed, but Kelsey watched the car disappear in the distance. Wouldn't tweakers get bored driving in circles? What would you know about tweakers? Mikey asked, with an older brother frown. Kelsey smiled up at him, trying to look innocent. Mikey didn't know her family history. Her father had never done meth, but a couple of his girlfriends had, back when Kelsey was a kid. One had lost a tooth in the kitchen sink one day. It had fallen like a ripe fruit from a tree. Tink. Kelsey had asked if the tooth fairy would come that night and how much she'd leave. The girlfriend had just shrugged and washed her tooth down the sink. They're probably lost, Ling said. She was pulling paper napkins from the metal dispenser on the table, wiping the syrup from her fingers. They all watched the street, a silent vigil to see if the strange blue car returned. It didn't. 
Anyone going to the Jones tonight? Remy asked. Sure. Kelsey turned back to the table. She had no idea who was playing, but she knew she'd be on Ivy Street again until the clubs closed. Sometimes she wished summer would last forever, so she never had to go to bed before dawn again. It was late June already, only a week till Cambria's big Fourth of July bash, which meant summer was a third gone. But at least there were two months left. The thought of dancing filled the empty space left by the end of the night. Okay, there it is again, Ling said quietly. Kelsey turned to the windows. The sun was warm on her face, bright in her eyes. But she could see the blue car gliding down the street, this time from the direction of the highway. You think we should call the police? Ling asked. Mikey laughed. And tell them what? That we've been out clubbing all night, completely free of the effects of alcohol, drugs, and sleep deprivation, and would like to report some suspicious personages. No one answered. The car rolled past the diner. Its windows were up, but Kelsey could make out three people inside. She squinted, trying to see their faces. Just then, the guy in the back seat turned to glance at the diner, and Kelsey drew back with a start. Oh my God, she muttered. Dad? Chapter 7 Scam he must have spaced out, because one moment the bank was shuttered and dark, and the next, a line of people was streaming in. Ethan stood and hoisted the duffel bag onto his shoulder. He left money for the check, then added another 20 bucks from the bundle he'd shoved into his pocket. The bag had no drugs in it, just like the Craig had promised. Only rolls of money wrapped in bright blue rubber bands, wads of used-looking 20s and 10s, all smelling of beer and sweat. Ethan hadn't counted the bills, but it was more than he'd ever seen. He got a funny thrill from not waiting for his change. Suddenly, twenty bucks seemed like nothing. Besides, he owed that waitress. Apart from the fact that he'd been a jerk to her, she'd helped him decide what to do next. When he'd ordered his first coffee, the voice had asked her what she'd do if someone gave her a big stack of money. Just outright asked her. Like that. Say, what would you do with a big old stack of money? And she'd said, Put it in the bank, I guess. Not very imaginative, but it was all he had right then. Put it in the bank, get it out of sight, ditch the green duffel bag. Ethan's legs were rubbery from sitting so long, and from nerves. He left the diner and crossed the road, checking the shadows of the park beside the bank. No black jeep, no sign of the Craig. Taylor and him were probably busting heads somewhere, trying to discover how some kid knew so much about their operation. The good thing was, they'd never figure that out. Inside the bank, there was already a short line of people waiting for tellers. Ethan hesitated. He wasn't stupid enough to deposit this much cash into an account. What if Mom found one of his bank statements? Forget it. He'd get a safe deposit box. Then he'd have plenty of time to figure out what to do next. He joined the back of the line. Maybe he could get his own apartment away from the prying eyes of his mother. Maybe take a road trip, leave Cambria behind for a couple of months. Ethan eased the bag onto his other shoulder. This could be a great summer. The line edged forward slowly, like a glacier receding. The gallon of coffee he'd consumed was ringing every nerve in his body. He kept waiting for the Craig to come through the door and beat him to a pulp. The security guard sat in a corner of the bank. He caught Ethan looking at the door every few minutes and gave him a flat, blank stare. He didn't seem like he'd be up to stopping an assault from the Craig. In fact, he seemed more interested in Ethan, probably wondering why this seedy-looking teenager was so jumpy. Ethan tried to give the security guy a reassuring smile. The guy continued to stare. The duffel bag grew heavier with each passing minute. Ethan dropped it to the floor in front of him and nudged it along with the toe of his shoe. He'd be glad to have all that cash safely stored in the bank's basement. Then he could relax. 
What's taking so long? He muttered. The girl in front of him half turned his way. She had short, straight hair, the tips dyed in a pink sawtooth pattern. Weird, but kind of cool. She was wearing a crisp blue and white uniform, like she was about to start a shift as a flight attendant. Back in the 50s. She held a phone in a sparkly case, and pink headphone cables disappeared under her hair. She bobbed in time to whatever she was listening to, sending her glossy hair bouncing. The next time the line shuffled forward, Ethan kicked his bag so it bumped the girl's ankles. She turned a blank expression toward him. Her eyes were unnaturally green, her mouth painted into a cute little pout. Ethan smiled at her. Suddenly, what he wanted was to be in familiar territory, not driving stolen cars or getting shot at, just charming someone. I like your hair, he heard the voice say. She frowned and pulled out one of her earbuds. What? I said I like your hair. Thanks. She turned the rest of the way around, looking him up and down. She was wearing a name tag, Marjorie. You don't look like a Marjorie, Ethan's voice said. She made a puzzled face, glanced down at her name tag and shrugged. They recycle these things like for decades. That explains it. You look more like a Sophie. She smiled. Close, Sonia. Ethan nodded. The voice always guessed girls' names almost right. Maybe it figured that exactly right was creepy. Wait, I get it now, the voice said. Your hair, lowbrow. Sonia's eyes widened. You know Patty Lowe? I so know Patty Lowe. Ethan had never heard of Patty Lowe in his life, but he could feel his muscles relaxing as he spoke, like someone who knew all the answers. I even know that photo, the one you based your hairstyle on. No way, Sonia said. Ethan gave her a confident smile. Not the cover of Lowbrow, but the special booklet that came with the acoustic versions. Oh, wow. Sonia nearly leaped into the air. I can't believe you know those. That's like her most obscure stuff. I know all her stuff. The voice knew everything, after all. Sonia was ecstatic now, launched by his lies into her own little reality. That's so awesome. I got this stupid job just so I could buy lowbrow. You get the joke on the cover, right? Sure. Where she's posing with Jay White? The sound of the name in his own mouth made Ethan sputter to a halt. Wait, the J. White? Sonia frowned. What? Uh, of course. Aw, oh, man. Ethan hated J. White. Producer and pop supremo, White's crimes against humanity numbered in the thousands, one for every tune he released. Rumor was he could record 20 a day before breakfast. The guy who ran over a couple of girls while he was high? That was his real voice talking. Ethan tried to slip back into the passive role, the listener. But he was too exhausted, too wired from coffee and anxiety. The ache from speaking with the voice was back now, as if the Craig had socked him in the jaw. He was in a bad place then, the girl muttered, turning away. Sure. For a moment, Ethan wanted to reconnect, but Sonia's pout was back in place, and it was beginning to annoy him. I mean, those two girls were probably having a crappy day, too, especially after they messed up the paint job on his SUV. She turned back to him, her expression one of complete betrayal. Ethan hadn't said that last part. The voice had. He'd only wanted her to stop talking to him, but the voice always gave Ethan exactly what he wanted. Sonia did exactly that, of course, stopped talking and turned away. She cranked her music until a tinny, Jay White-produced tune was spilling out of her skull. Great. Now he felt like crap. He hated when the voice insulted people. It was hard to take that stuff back. And the awful thing was, half the time, he didn't even remember exactly what the voice said. They weren't his words, after all. 
Last summer, he'd lost his three best friends in a single spray of insults. He'd been so angry, wanting those guys to hurt, really hurt, wanting them to leave him the hell alone, and just like Sonia, they had. Those three were the only people who really knew what Ethan was. They had their own powers to deal with. They understood. The Zeros, they'd called themselves as a joke. Like heroes, but not. They'd even tried to act like superheroes with stupid training exercises and code names, but at least they'd all been friends. Until he'd let the voice lash out. None of them had spoken to him since. The line inched forward. He tapped Sonia lightly on the shoulder. Hey. She turned and glared at him, head still bopping to the music. I'm sorry. He mouthed the words clearly. Sonia hesitated, her eyes narrowing. Finally, a half-smile crossed her face. After all, he was a fellow fan of Patty Lowe. At least she thought he was. She pulled one earbud out like she was about to say something, but then her gaze swiveled to a point over his shoulder, and she froze. Ethan turned. Three guys with very big guns had entered the bank. They wore all black clothes and white hockey masks. One of them lifted his rifle and shot it directly into the ceiling. The world flew apart into dust and noise. Ladies and gentlemen, the gunman said through the ringing echoes of the boom. Get your asses down on the floor! Chapter 8 Mob Kelsey heard the muffled gunshot through the bank wall, but mostly she felt it. The sudden focus of everyone inside, that wave of heat that came from a group of people united by a surge of adrenaline. There was a flood, a tsunami of energy from the customers, fear, shock, disbelief. All of it spinning together, strong enough that for a moment it was beyond Kelsey's control. It threatened to drown her, to drag her over into panic. But then her instincts kicked in and she pushed back, fought her way to the top to ride the wave. It was like blocking a fire hose with her hands. The spooked crowd was a geyser of energy, hot and furious. But she drew them up, up, up into her own calm place. She channeled them into peace. She fed them stillness, numbness, quiet. And she held them there. They all wanted the same thing, to be safe. That unity of purpose kept Kelsey in charge. It was all going to be okay. As long as no one got hurt. As long as nobody hurt her dad. She backed away from that thought, which threatened to spill over into the crowd. Of course, it was all going to be okay. Of course, it was. Kelsey had been waiting in the park by the bank since breakfast, trying to look inconspicuous. Just a bored kid, killing time before the mall opened. The blue car had returned right after she'd gotten rid of Ling and Mikey, telling them she wanted to walk home. This time, the car had pulled up right behind the bank. Three men had gotten out wearing hockey masks. She'd recognized her dad from his walk, the limp that he claimed was a knife wound, but was really from the time he'd blown out his knee stealing a 200-pound poker machine. For all his screw-ups, Dad had never done anything like this before. He'd never robbed a bank. As far as she knew, he'd never even held a gun. So what on earth did he think he was doing at Cambria Central Bank wearing a hockey mask and carrying that shotgun? She tried to call out to stop him, but... All alone, without a group around her, she'd never have the guts to accost three men with masks and guns. Damn it. Kelsey rested the back of her skull against the bank wall and closed her eyes. It helped her stay connected to the storm of emotions from the crowd inside. She couldn't find her dad in the sickly wash of fear. She'd never been able to pick out individuals once a group took on its own identity. This one was like a big scared animal with all its nerves jangling. She kept channeling the fear, replacing it with calm. The sooner this was over, the sooner everybody could go home. And that included her dad. Something was blinking, flashing above her. 
On the corner of the bank building, way up high, a blue light was pulsing. It made no sound, but it was bright enough to bleach the early morning daylight. Someone inside had triggered the bank's silent alarm. No doubt another alarm was pulsing at the central police station a few miles away. The cops would be here soon, and they'd take her dad away. After a screw-up as big as this one, maybe he wouldn't come back. Kelsey felt herself seizing up with panic. She hauled herself from the wall, breaking the connection she had with the crowd inside. The last thing she needed was for her fears to spread into the people in the bank. Come on, Dad, get out of there. There was nothing she could do now but watch. Chapter 9. Scam Let's get this over with, people, the gunman was saying. We all want a nice, quick job here, right? He sounded like he meant it. Ethan stared at the man in the hockey mask. He felt anesthetized. The shock of the gunshot was wearing off, replaced with a wave of numbness, like someone was pumping liquid Valium into his veins. He knew he should feel more panic, but all he could think about was that he really wished he'd taken a leak before leaving the diner. All that awful coffee, plus lying face down on a cold marble floor, was doing no favors to his bladder. He shifted his head to see the rest of the room. The whole place had fallen to its knees in one movement. People had screamed when the first shot went into the ceiling, and yet still dropped, like they couldn't wait to get to the ground. Even the security guard, who'd had a gun pointed right at his face until he'd tossed his own aside, seemed weirdly calm. The quiet felt unreal. Ethan looked at where Sonia lay, one cheek against the floor. She seemed as spacey as he felt. Her phone was clutched in her hand like a talisman, something bulletproof. She gazed back at Ethan, her eyes shiny in the morning light that streamed through the bank. He tried to give her a reassuring smile. She didn't smile back. He took a wary glance at the men with guns. Far as he could tell, none of them was the Craig. These guys were all too skinny. In Ethan's mind, Craig's neck had taken on epic proportions, like maybe it was the thickest part of his entire body. Okay, so this whole robbery thing had nothing to do with Ethan's stolen duffel bag full of money. It was just an amazingly shitty coincidence. The perfect end to his night. He eased the bag closer to him, willing it to disappear against his body. The gunman was talking again. We all want to get out of here safely and enjoy the rest of our lives, don't we? Ethan found he did. He really, really did. Still, it was kind of perverse for a guy to keep talking about safety while he was carrying the biggest gun Ethan had ever seen. If the gunman hadn't unloaded that thing so convincingly into the ceiling, it might have passed for something out of a cartoon. Plaster was still drifting through the air like fake snow in a crappy school play. The two other gunmen were behind the tills, scrambling through cash. Funny how they were the least calm people in the room. With their hockey masks and frantic movements, they seemed to belong to some separate insectoid branch of humanity, the sort of creature that didn't care about getting home safely. Ethan felt a spasm of fear low in his gut. But then, just like that, it was gone again, smoothed over by the Valium in the air. The vault's shut, one of the gunmen shouted. Someone push the panic button. He started swearing. He seemed to swear for a long time without breathing. The guy with the giant gun lowered his aim till the barrel was pointed at his own toes. Ethan reflected calmly how that seemed like a really bad idea. That same gun had taken out a sizable part of the ceiling, and the guy was already limping. He probably couldn't afford to lose a foot. Now he was tapping the rifle muzzle against the marble floor, glaring at the customers like the locked vault was their fault. Ethan tried to become one with the marble. Beside him, Sonia let out a whimper. Time to move, Big Gun said. Bag the cash! I'll see what I can scrape up from the civilians. The other two scrambled into motion. 
They began stuffing wads of cash into the canvas bags they'd brought with them. A bill floated down and landed a few feet from Ethan's face. A fifty. He was in no way tempted to reach for it. Big Gun was walking through the crowd slowly, his hockey mask swinging left and right. He was sizing them up, maybe trying to work out who had the most money in their pockets. Ethan's hand tightened on the straps of his duffel bag. Suddenly, Big Gun knelt. There was a muffled shriek from an elderly woman in a patterned dress. It's okay, Big Gun said. Just taking your watch, ma'am. At least he was polite, which only made him scarier. The woman let out small sobbing noises, but she let him have the watch. Ethan shut his eyes to stop himself from staring at the duffel bag. Footsteps came toward him across the marble floor, keeping time with the pulse going off in Ethan's neck. Big Gun was nearby. Nice ring, little girl. It's nothing, came Sonia's voice, defiant. Then you won't mind if I take it. Ethan opened his eyes. Sonia's hand was wrapped around her phone. On her middle finger was a ring with two concentric circles overlapping, like owl eyes. When the gunman reached down, she drew back her hand. They're not real diamonds or anything. They're totally fake. The man seemed to hesitate. Just give him the ring, Ethan hissed. Do what your boyfriend says, Big Gun told her. Sonia glared at Ethan. He's so not my boyfriend. But at least she pulled the ring off and sent it rolling across the floor. The gunman swept it up. He stayed on one knee, his hockey mask hanging in the corner of Ethan's vision. Hey, kid, what you got in the bag? Chapter 10, Scam. Ethan gave himself over to the voice. He didn't care what it said as long as it distracted this bank robber from the duffel bag. It came out low and raspy like nothing Ethan had ever heard from his own mouth before. You know, this is all going to hell, don't you, Jerry? The gunman froze. How do you know my name? Ethan shut his eyes, but the voice didn't stop talking. That's a great question, Jerry. You should think about that. How does some kid with his face on the floor of the biggest bank in Cambria know your name? Jerry didn't answer. The voice was taking one hell of a chance, talking to an armed robber like they were old friends. And just like always, there was no turning back. But then that feeling like liquid Valium was pouring back into the room, the tide of fear pulling out again. Ethan marveled that he could feel so calm. While you're thinking about that, Jerry, ask yourself, if I knew you'd be here, then who else did? The gunman's words came out with exaggerated calm. Tell me what you know, kid. Everything. Like why the silent alarm went off ten seconds after you showed up. A strained little snort forced its way out of Ethan. The voice wasn't very good at laughing. It all has to do with Nick over there. Jerry's hockey mask swung up toward his two armed colleagues. The voice continued in a whisper. Remember his drug charge back in March? The one that went away for no good reason? Jerry was quiet. Ethan figured he probably did remember. And ever since, Nick's been telling you about this bank job, how easy it'll be, how he wants you to do all the talking because you're such a nice guy who'd never hurt anyone. People trust you. And he gives you the biggest gun. How am I doing so far, Jerry? The two gunmen behind the tills were done gathering up the cash. Now they were making their way through the customers spread across the floor. As long as they didn't come over here, the voice struggled if there was more than one person to convince. Listen, Jerry, I like you, Ethan heard himself say. You just want what's best for Kelsey, after all. Poor kid still misses her mom. A guy like Nick who makes deals with the cops is a problem for everyone. 
No, Jerry muttered. No, no, no. The tip of the rifle was in front of Ethan's face, and it was shaking. Jerry's hand on the butt trembled. It didn't look like fear was making his hand shake, though. More like rage. Ethan shut his eyes as if that would protect him from bullets. Nick hasn't been in town that long, has he? Maybe he's the kind of guy who'd lead his buddies into a trap just to get out of a bullshit possession charge. Sirens! One of the other gunmen called. We gotta go! Damn it! Jerry stood and swung his gun up all in one movement. Ethan had a moment to breathe freely, a moment when he thought that the voice had done its work and he was free. Jerry had forgotten all about the duffel bag, and now the gunmen were about to make a run for it. But then Jerry shouted. You knew they'd be here, Nick! You son of a- And then the shooting started. Chapter 11 Mob After the shooting inside was over, a new crowd formed. It didn't feel like a dance club or a party. It was closer to the rubberneckers after an accident, drawn by the flashing lights, the police tape fluttering in the morning breeze. They milled around in the street, mostly directionless, except that everyone kept glancing at the bank doors. They were in there interviewing everyone, and it seemed to be taking hours. Kelsey was waiting, too, for her dad. They hadn't brought him out yet because the first guy out was someone in a body bag, and it wasn't her dad because, well, it just wasn't. No way her dad was dead. Right behind that was another guy, this one on a stretcher. He was alive, at least. Two paramedics carried him out while a third ran along beside, holding a drip high in the air. One of the cops lifted the yellow police tape so they could duck underneath and load the guy into a waiting ambulance. Then the ambulance sped off, and no more paramedics went in. Everybody else inside had to be alive and unhurt, right? Kelsey doubled over with relief, hands on her knees. She took a long breath. She wasn't an orphan. Not yet. Somebody asked if she was okay, and Kelsey straightened. She gave the stranger a tight smile and moved away to the edge of the crowd, trying to reconnect with the people in the bank. When the handful of shots had been fired, there'd been panic. A few minutes later, the police had stormed in and there'd been a swell of relief. Then nothing. Their emotions were scattered, the crowd beast broken into individuals. A new ripple of energy passed through the people outside. The bank doors opened and two cops came out, half dragging her dad in handcuffs. He looked dazed and suddenly ancient. But at least he was unhurt. Kelsey felt relief and grief and anger all at once. He was going back to prison. Every day for the last five years, he'd promised he would never disappear again. The crowd turned its attention to the man in handcuffs like a herd focusing on a predator. Not a lot of bank robberies in Cambria. Everyone wanted a good look at his face so they could tell the story when they got to work late. You wouldn't believe this guy, limping, skinny, burned out looking, robbed a bank and shot two people. Kelsey couldn't help it. She was part of the crowd now. She felt her grief begin to roll outward, tangling with their curiosity. And not just grief, her anger, too. How could her dad have risked all those people's lives? Hadn't he felt the fear he'd caused? He'd shredded all the trust Kelsey had ever put in him. She tried to rein in the emotion, to squeeze it all back inside her own body, but it was too late, and she was too exhausted. Of everything he'd done over the 16 years of Kelsey's life, nothing had been this wrong, this selfish. Maybe he hadn't meant to hurt anyone. She was sure he hadn't. But he'd still done something awful. He destroyed their future together. Bastard! A man beside her shouted, and a stir went through the crowd. The cops looked confused. They had a job to do and couldn't feel Kelsey's anger winding its way through the crowd. People began to press against the phalanx of police. 
They'd turned from docile onlookers into something hostile, something wrathful and righteous and dangerous. They were becoming a mob. Kelsey saw the look of terror on her father's face. No, 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 she breathed, trying to reel it all back in to break the connection between her own energy and the crowd's. She'd done this, molded a single entity from the spectators and given her own anger form. She took a dozen sharp, quick breaths, making herself hyperventilate. Dizziness cut her anger. With her influence gone, and with the police shouting terse orders, the mob dissipated. The crowd ebbed, but her dad still looked scared and lost. For the first time, she felt tears burn. Her father was pushed into a police car, which was soon nosing its way through the onlookers toward the clump of tall buildings at the city center. At last, the customers from the bank were let out. They stepped into the daylight, blinking and in shock. She felt them click into their own little tribe, united by what they'd been through. Kelsey could feel their shaken confidence that the world made sense. The seeds of a thousand nightmares were taking hold in their minds. They went down the stairs clinging to each other, except one guy. He wasn't in black clothes like the robbers, but two plainclothes detectives were guiding him toward a police car. He wore a pinstripe shirt and carried an army green duffel bag. He had a familiar expression, too, tired and strung out. The guy from the diner. What on earth did he have to do with all this? He wasn't handcuffed, so he was probably just a witness. Kelsey pulled out her phone. She had to get to the police station and make sure her dad was okay. She hoped Mikey was still awake. She needed a ride. It was barely ten in the morning. This was going to be a long day. Chapter 12 Scam Okay, Terrence, let's go over this again. Is this really your address? Ethan didn't answer aloud, just nodded. He was sitting across from two detectives at the Central Cambria Police Department. He had no idea what the boys had said wrong back in the bank, but he didn't want it screwing up again. One moment it had all been going smoothly, the voice reeling off a fake name, an address, and a few generic reactions to the robbery. No, he hadn't seen much, too busy hugging the floor, and oh, how about that? He must have left his ID back at his leafy north side home where he lived with his dad. The uniformed cop had looked ready to move on to the next interview. But suddenly, this detective wearing a grim expression had appeared out of nowhere, and Ethan had been politely but firmly hauled out of the bank, duffel bag and all. They knew something, but Ethan had no idea what. It wasn't about the duffel bag, which was on the floor beside him, ignored and unopened. He considered leaving it behind in the bank when they dragged him here. Just walk away and pretend it wasn't his, but what if he'd left fingerprints on it or DNA? People were always being busted by their DNA on cop shows, so he'd taken it with him. Plus, the money was his now. He couldn't just leave it. And anyhow, he had bigger problems. He snuck a glance around. The detective's desk was in the middle of a busy floor full of cops. What if someone who knew his mom recognized him? She was down here at the police station all the time doing her deputy DA work. With a bank robbery under investigation, she might even be here right now. Ethan hunched down in his chair. The detective continued. And you don't have a phone number yet, right, Terrence? Because you just moved here. Ethan nodded. Why the voice had gone with Terrence was beyond Ethan. Sometimes he figured it was just trolling him. Do you mind answering out loud? The other detective asked. She gave a sympathetic smile. Just so we're clear. Ethan sighed, letting the voice take over again. Yes, I moved here from Chicago. That's my new address right there. He gestured toward the yellow legal pad on the desk between them. And your dad doesn't have a cell phone? That's right, Detective King. 
The voice was good at stuff like that, remembering to call adults by their names. King was kind of nice. She had short hair and brown eyes that were just darker than her skin. She smiled when he called her by name. Her partner, Detective Fuentes, didn't look convinced by anything the voice said. He was taller, wider, and meaner looking. Ethan shifted his gaze back to King. And your mom? She asked. Don't have a mom, Ethan said too quickly. He reminded himself to let the voice handle this. Your dad got an email address? Fuentes asked. He's old-fashioned, doesn't trust the internet. King nodded and smiled, as if not trusting a bunch of wires made sense. Why were you in the bank, Terrence? To open a new account, we don't have a bank here yet, but then these three guys came in with guns, really big guns. Yeah, said King. You told us that. They were going to rob the place, but then they shot each other. That's all I remember. It was pretty traumatic, you know? So you keep saying, Fuente said. He had the kind of frown that looked like it wasn't going anywhere soon. None of them spoke to you? They shouted at us to stay down, then they said they were going to rob us. This girl beside me, they took the ring right off her finger. King asked, you didn't know any of these guys? How would I? I'm 17 for crying out loud, and I just moved here. Where would I meet guys who rob banks with shotguns? Semi-automatic rifles, Fuentes corrected him. Like I'd know what kind of guns they had. The voice sounded nervous, but Ethan had read that innocent people get nervous when they're interviewed by cops. Only criminals had the patience to stay calm and wait it out. Which high school you at? Fuentes asked. I'm not enrolled yet. My dad was thinking of Palmdale Academy. Ethan had to fight the crazy urge to laugh. He had about as much chance of getting into Palmdale as he did of a career with NASA. But the lie had done its work. For about a microsecond, King looked impressed. Then she gazed down at her notes. So you've never met Jerry Laszlo before? Who? She looked up. You didn't call one of the bank robbers by name? Ethan shifted in his seat, but the voice sounded certain. That's crazy. Isn't it? Fuentes leaned forward on heavy forearms. And yet we got you on video talking to them. Ethan blinked. They'd already seen the bank's security footage? That was fast. He gave the voice free reign. One of the robbers talked to us, yeah, the guy that took Sophie's ring. Sonia, King corrected him. Right. Great, they'd spoken to Sonia. Of course they'd spoken to Sonia. She'd probably told them about the weird conversation he'd had with Jerry Big Gun. She wouldn't let him take a ring. I told her to just give it to him, you know, so she wouldn't get killed. As the two detectives looked at each other, Ethan rubbed his jaw, which felt like he'd spent six hours in a dentist chair. The worst thing about the voice was that it felt like someone else was operating his mouth, pulling it open and snapping it shut in time with all the lies coming out of it. His ears were starting to itch from listening to himself lie so much. Fuentes said, We spoke to Sonia Stoller at length, Terrence. She said you knew the guy, said you had quite the conversation with him. A stifled sort of laugh escaped Ethan, but inside he was cringing. He should never have insulted that pop trash guru, Jay's stupid face white. He wished he could take it all back the whole damn morning and come to think of it, the night before, too. This was turning to a lousy summer after all. Just like last summer. If the voice hadn't gotten rid of all his friends, maybe Ethan wouldn't have been wandering around Ivy Street without a ride. The voice stayed smooth. Yeah, I talked to the guy. I just wanted him to chill out, you know, so I was chatting like we were buddies. But it's not like I know him. Sonia was being crazy, not giving up her ring. I just wanted to make sure nobody got shot. Quinta said, the way you tell it, you're quite the hero. I did what had to be done. The voice almost sounded modest. King smiled. What's funny is she didn't seem crazy when she talked to us. 
She seemed like a very composed and articulate young woman. Fuentes nodded like his partner had just revealed a universal truth. Yeah, she kept her head pretty good for someone in the middle of an armed robbery. Detective Fuentes pulled out a phone with a sparkly case and pink headphones. A smile finally cracked his face. <laughs> you want to watch a video? Chapter 13 Scam Ethan felt the blood drain from his face. That was the problem, one of the problems, with the voice. It couldn't control his expressions except when he was talking. Both the detectives were smiling at him now. Fuentes held the phone out so Ethan could see the screen. You got a clear view of this, Terrence? Oh, yeah, Ethan muttered. A video began to play on the little screen. It was a shaky point of view from close to the marble floor of the bank. Feet scrambling, blurs of motion, a tiny flash of Sonia's face all over the distorted sound of shouting through the tiny speakers of the phone. The view swung around, and there Ethan was, hugging the floor, his expression more spacey than terrified. He remembered the weird, disjointed calm he'd felt after the first shot had been fired into the ceiling, that feeling like he'd swallowed too many painkillers. He really wished the Ethan in the video looked more scared, or that he had some of that miracle calm right now. He watched the video in silence while the detectives watched him. There was Jerry Big Gun looming, his hockey mask filling the frame as Sonia argued with him. Ethan fought a surge of admiration. Not only had Sonia defied an automatic rifle-wielding criminal over her worthless ring, but she'd been videoing the whole thing. Mental note. Check out this Patty Lowe sometime. Fuentes pressed the screen with a thumb, halting the video on a frame of Ethan's too calm face. It sounds like you just said Jerry. Did you catch that? Ethan nodded slowly, like he was thinking, and let the voice loose. Jerry, yeah, one of the other guys said it when they came in. Jeez, I hadn't even remembered that, Detective Fuentes. Guess I was running on instinct. Fuentes rolled his eyes. Play the next bit. King said. Fuentes obliged, and Ethan heard his own voice clearly. You just want what's best for Kelsey, after all. Fuentes froze the video again. So who's Kelsey? I have no idea. Ethan tried to match a shrug with the voice's innocent tone. Funny thing, Fuentes said. After you mentioned Kelsey, that guy turned around and the shooting started, which... Makes you about the most interesting person in this whole station right now. To Ethan, it seemed like the actual gunman would be way more interesting. But this didn't seem like the right moment to argue the point. I have no idea why he started shooting. Maybe you should ask him. We did, Fuentes grunted. He's not talking. Ethan sighed, almost wishing he was back in the car with the Craig. At least then, he'd had a chance to grab the keys and drive away. But here, in the middle of this crowded police station, there was no escape. I didn't even know what was coming out of my mouth. Ethan said this in his own voice, utterly honest for once. King shook her head sadly, like she was hearing bad news. Best you tell us everything you do know, Terrence. Tell us how you made that guy turn on his friends in the middle of a hostage situation. With a skill like that, maybe we could use you on the force. Fuentes laughed, which surprised Ethan because he hadn't thought the big man could. King gave Ethan a conspiratorial smile halfway between amusement and pity. Ethan opened his mouth and prayed the voice had something. Right, I... Remember the robber said something about stealing Sonia's ring because he wanted to give it to someone called Kelsey. I mean, the audio's pretty muffled right there, but it kind of jolted my memory. Ethan had to stop himself from letting out a sigh of relief. The voice was right about the audio. Jerry could have said something the detectives had missed. But Fuentes's gaze only sharpened. Funny thing, you said you were in that bank to open an account. Yeah? Ethan was wary. How are you going to do that without any ID? 
didn't know I'd forgotten it. Thing was, Ethan almost never carried ID. It was totally unhelpful to carry ID if you were going to lie about yourself all the time. So was there anything else, detectives? King shrugged. For a second, Ethan thought maybe he'd gotten away with it. All of it. But then Fuentes said, So what's in the duffel bag, kid? Ethan's brain sputtered almost to a halt. He could think of nothing except how wrong it had all gone, starting with his date with Indira. He slumped, letting the voice say whatever it would take to distract them from the bag. I just realized something, detectives. Fuentes smirked. Then it's time to come clean. That you can't question a minor without the permission of a legal guardian. Both detectives were still, so Ethan figured it must be true. Score one to the voice. Then King smiled, that friendly smile again. But you aren't a suspect, Terrence. You're a witness, and we're just having a friendly chat. What do you need a guardian for? Yeah, Fuentes chimed in. I'm sure you want to help us out, don't you? I'm a minor, the voice said with absolute certainty. So an adult of some kind must be present during questioning. <laughs> and although my father is unreachable, I just remembered the number of our lawyer here in Cambria. King nodded slowly. You did, huh? His name is Camellia, the voice said, then rattled off a phone number. The moment the first few digits were out of Ethan's mouth, he tried to stop himself, but he was too tired, too beaten down by fear, and the voice had been in control of his tongue too much lately. It was the number of an old pal of his, an ex-pal, really the head of the Zeros, who had an ability that was a hundred times more insidious than Ethan's voice. A kid so condescending and imperious that even his best friends called him Glorious Leader. And thanks to what the voice had said last summer, Ethan was no longer his friend at all. Detective King scribbled the number down on a pad. Finally, we're getting somewhere. Can't wait to see what this Scamelia guy has to say about you. How do you spell his name? S-C-A-M something? Four letters is all you'll need, Ethan said in his own exhausted voice. Just call him. He'll send someone right away. Chapter 14. Flicker when was the first time you remember your sister reading to you? Flicker kept her expression neutral. This sounded a lot like Dr. Bridges' favorite topic, hidden inside a new question. She answered warily. I don't know how old we were, maybe six, but I remember the book. It was about slugs. She heard the squeak of leather, Dr. Bridges shifting in his chair. Slugs? They wore clothes and lived in houses. Lily described all the pictures to me. Flicker let herself smile. It had been a very silly book, full of squishy sound effects. She could hear Dr. Bridges scribbling on his legal pad and was tempted to peek, but didn't. She was trying to be good. And your sister reading to you, that was important. Sure. More important than she could say, at least to her shrink. It was while Lily was reading to her that Flicker's power had revealed itself for the first time. She hadn't understood back then, of course. The spindly insects of letters had simply appeared in her head, skittering back and forth with the motion of Lily's eyes. Flicker sometimes missed those long-ago days when her power hadn't worked with anyone but Lily. Back then, they'd thought it was some kind of twin magic, like the private language they'd shared in the crib. It had almost felt like a betrayal when Flicker started seeing through the rest of humanity's eyes. It makes you feel like part of the family. Flicker sighed. It was the same old issue, the thing that brought her into this office every Friday, along with the neuroses of her overachieving parents. So she didn't feel bad about peeking. Dr. Bridges' handwriting was a disaster, but he was staring straight at his pad. He'd written, Family narrative, in big letters, and his pen was drawing circles around the words now, as lazy and patient as a shark. 
What the hell did family narrative mean? That she and her sister loved to share stories, or that Dr. Bridges thought Flicker was making something up? His gaze lifted from the legal pad, and she saw herself. The bright orange summer dress for visibility in crowds, her brown hair spilling across the dimpled leather of the patient couch. She smiled, just to see it. Is something funny? Dr. Bridges asked. Lily's a part of me, whether she reads to me or not. Ah. He took the bait, and his eyes went down to the pad again, where his pen was already scrawling the words, twin bonding. Dr. Bridges was so predictable. He had a serious shrink boner for the fact that she and Lily had shared a womb. But what have you learned to read for yourself? How would it change things between you and your sister? It's not that I can't... Flicker bit off the rest of her answer. This was the never-ending issue, the reason her parents sent her to a shrink. Why had she stopped reading Braille? Why did she stay so dependent on her sister? How could her parents, with three doctorates between them, have raised an illiterate 16-year-old? Of course, all those questions were based on bullshit assumptions. Maybe one in ten blind kids bothered learning Braille these days. Her parents didn't understand that Braille meant big clunky books that marked you as different, while audiobooks lived invisibly on your phone and text-to-speech gave you the whole damn internet. Besides, Flickr could read perfectly well, just not with her own eyes. And there was something important that happened when her sister read to her. The stories became more real, more magical, the way stories had been when Flickr was little, before she could see it all. Can't what? Dr. Bridges prompted. Flickr strained into the corners of his vision until she glimpsed the timer on his desk. Good. Her 50 minutes were almost up. It'd take more than 30 seconds to tell you, she said. His eyes went to the timer, then widened a little. I still don't know how you do that, she heard his smile. Blind people powers. He wrote those words down, and then his left hand waved around like he was trying to think of what to say. I can hear it in your voice, she said, when this session's almost over. You don't have to worry about me, Riley. This is your time. Flicker sighed again, more at her real name than anything else. Real names were stupid, especially when you had one that your friends had given you. One that made perfect sense. She stayed silent until the timer softly chimed. Dr. Bridges straightened in his squeaky chair. Next time, I want to talk about independence. Independence? She'd come here, downtown, all on her own, just like every week. No parents waiting for her in the parking lot, no service dog. But her power needed other people to work, and that was fine with her. Flicker swung her legs off the couch and stood. In a few swift steps, she was at the door, her hand finding the knob without any help from Dr. Bridges' eyes. You'll think about it this week, Riley? His voice followed her. About things you can do to be more independent? Flicker turned to face him and threw her vision into his to admire her own expression. Enough of a smile not to be rude but one mocking eyebrow arching behind dark glasses. Sure thing, Doc. Out on the front step, she turned her phone on, and it chirped with annoyance. Her shrink's office was a black hole of no phones allowed, not even in the waiting room, to allow patients to center themselves before their sessions. It was a law of nature that the week's most interesting messages always arrived during those 50 minutes. Flicker started walking one hand sliding along the iron rail in front of the medical building, her other thumb moving across the haptic keys of her phone. A moment later, Nate's voice was in her ear. Crazy news, Flick. There was a bank robbery this morning and scams at the police station downtown in custody. Flicker came to a halt, despite the downtown crowd flowing around her. That name still set off stink bombs in her stomach. I'll call the others, Nate was saying, but it's scam. Maybe no one shows up, you know? Flicker did know. With a snap of her wrist, she unfolded her cane. Here in the crowded streets of downtown, she didn't need it, but the red and white made people get out of her way. Call me when you get this, Nate finished. And head for downtown.
She was moving already, the cane sweeping the pavement in front of her. For the moment, she kept herself blind. It was easier to think, and her shrink's office was only a few blocks from the CCPD. No need to rush. Not for scam, anyway. What bank robbery? And why would he need to rob a bank? The guy had been born to weasel people out of their cash. She held down her phone's voice dial key and said, Glorious leader. Flicker still called him that, out loud when he was being annoying and in her head always. It was only half ironic, because no other pair of words suited him better. Flick, he answered. It's shrink day, right? Tell me you're already downtown. Just like every Friday. Why the hell did Scam rob a bank? Him, <laughs> please, Nate said with a laugh. The detective said he was a material witness. His mouth must have gotten him in trouble. Something was approaching from behind her on the sidewalk, the metal clicks of a coasting bicycle. Flicker cast her vision into the rider's eyes just as the guy spotted her cane. The view swerved away, bumping down the curb and back onto the street. She let herself go blind again. And he called you? Because he's got so many other friends? He told him I was his lawyer, but the detective wouldn't let me talk to him. Whatever's going on, they don't think he's an innocent bystander. Weird, his voice must be slipping. Scam's power has always been shaky. Tell me you're coming, Flick. She sighed. Wouldn't miss it. Where should I meet you? I'm staying away. The cops have my number. I don't want to be anywhere close, just in case Crash decides to help. No telling what she'll do to a police station. Wait, she might actually show up? A pause. No answer. She probably hasn't checked her phone yet. Flicker sighed. After Scam's outburst at Crash almost a year ago, even the charms of Glorious Leader might not convince her to help. Of course, what Scam had said to Nate and Flicker had been almost as cruel. There was a pause on the other end, like Nate was thinking the same thing. But then he said, Stay outside the station in case it gets messy. I'll conference you in when I have everyone. Everyone? She almost asked, meaning her and Crash. But then a trickle of memory reminded her that there was someone else. That other zero. The tip of her cane caught on a sidewalk crack, jolting the thought away. I'll have eyes inside the cop shop in ten minutes. She'd slipped into the way they'd talked back in the old days. All those training missions, shepherding crowds around a shopping center while listening to glorious leaders' orders in their earbuds, always pretending there was a fire or a terrorist attack when it was really just Crash letting loose. Flicker had always thought the missions were silly. Glorious leader trying to forge a super-powered posse for his own mysterious purposes. But after Scam's little outburst had broken the group, she dumped her real name and become Flicker all the time. Maybe that was a sign that she missed that energy, that focus. Tell me when you hear from Crash. Roger that. Be careful, Flick. And Nate was gone. As always, there was that abandoned feeling of his glorious attention moving away from her. His power didn't work through the phone, of course, but the reaction was hardwired in her now. Separation anxiety. That's what Dr. Bridges would call it. She took a deep breath and flung aside the feeling, sending her vision flicking through the crowd. A hundred different perspectives went through her head, from a passing cab, a gliding skateboarder, an upstairs window, each for a fraction of a second. Her orange dress tugged at them, a single point of reference for all those jittering, moving eyeballs. She oriented herself, then flung her gaze out farther, casting it down the street toward the center of downtown. A moment later, she had it, a view through the eyes of someone gawking up at the stone facade of the Cambria City Police Department. It gave Flicker a moment of pleasure to think that Scam was trapped in there, stewing in his own lies, and probably wondering if any of his former friends would bother to dig him out. Chapter 15. Crash. Chizara plugged the boombox into the wall and switched it on. The power ran straight in and did what it was supposed to, grabbed the radio waves and pumped the music out into the shop. 
It had been tuned to a trance station. Woohoo, said Bob mildly from the other workbench. It's alive. Chizara smiled. It was a good feeling, bringing an appliance back to life. It was slow and clunky, arranging the metal and plastic pieces by hand, soldering things together, testing individual connections. But it was restful, because ancient devices like the boombox weren't smart enough to turn around and bite her. That was why she was here. That was why she begged Bob for a job. I'm always fixing stuff, she flat out lied. People say I have a knack. People said no such thing, but she'd been prepared to develop a knack with pure willpower and asking a truckload of questions. Her mother's favorite proverb was, she who asks questions cannot go astray. It was worth lying to be allowed to work at Bob's fix-it shop full of vacuum cleaners and toasters. Here in the Heights, the nearest network thing was two shops away, no more painful than a mild ice cream headache. Chizara clicked through the radio presets and let the owner's selection of bass beats and street chants thunder out for a few seconds. Bits of the casing rattled in time with it. She pulled the plug and stood up. Oh, and I was enjoying that so much, Bob said with a roll of his eyes. He only liked old school jazz. He was working on a disassembled laptop, the best kind as far as Chizara was concerned. Computers were rare visitors to the shop. Most people in the Heights didn't own one. You gonna sew her up, Doc? Stretch break first, my head hurts. Bob understood the need to walk away from close-in work every now and again, but he pretended to be disappointed in her. I don't know, Chizara, job's not done till it's done. Yeah, but I'm young and flighty. You have to make allowances. Bob gave a little grin, his pale fingers scrabbled after a tiny Phillips head screw that had rolled away across the bench top. Go on then, take your break. You can close it up when you get back. Chizara went on into the alleyway behind the workshop. They got along, she and Bob, and they were getting along better the more names for things she learned. He was teaching her the words that maker geeks used. Resistors instead of hiccups, fuses instead of blurt catchers. She was learning the ancient history of the things that hurt her, seeing them for how they worked and what they did, piece by piece, before they'd all been shrunk down and melded into microchips. And she was also picking up how to seem normal, how to fake her testing as if she couldn't simply see the pulsing veins inside the machines. Hiding her ability was an old habit, but if Chizara ever wanted to use her power in a real job, she needed to develop a full set of geek-compatible camouflage. Bob's shop was a slow start, but it was a start, and he paid her to learn, which was more than school ever did. She tipped her head back to soak up the sunshine for a few seconds, then crossed the alley into the shade. She pulled out her phone, steeled herself, and switched it on, checking her messages as per the agreement with her mom. I don't care if it niggles you, Mom always said. I need to know where you are. How had mothers managed before everyone carried these machines that chattered in Chizara's head, sang in her bones, itched under her skin? How had they not gone crazy with worry? Chizara leaned against the cool of the brick wall and rubbed her face, which was all a tickle from the phone or maybe from the repeater tower nearby. She could see it above the roofline of the shops, throbbing out its signals at her. Her thumb was poised to power the phone off when it buzzed and beeped and zapped her hand again. The screen said, Glorious Leader. Chizara held the phone at arm's length for a few seconds, rubbing her scalp with her other hand. What did Nate want? Another mopey nostalgia session about the zeros with her and Flicker? She tapped the message open. Our old buddy Scams, a guest down at CCPD. Any chance you can help us get him out? Chizara laid the phone on a ledge of brickwork and walked a few steps away from it, crossing from sun shadow into signal shadow to give herself room to think. Our old buddy? That was Nate trying to be chummy and ironic, which worked great when he was right there in front of you, his power focused and amplified. But now? Why should she care one way or another what mess that little turd scam had gotten himself into? Why should any of them care? And this was a work day. Nate wouldn't understand that. He didn't have to get a job over the summer, did he? And Bob had so much for her to fix right now. That nice antique toaster that lady had brought in and the little transistor radio that Chizara wanted to see the insides of. 
And yet, the Central Cambria Police Department, her mouth was watering. An engraved, personalized invitation to check out some serious tech up close and maybe bring some of it down to do exactly what she spent her whole life holding back from. Not too much, of course. No one would get hurt or anything if she was careful. And she was always careful, right? The phone buzzed again, and she darted back across the alley to grab it. Another text from Nate. Flicker was on her way into town, and so was Anon. Right, Anon. She knew that guy. She couldn't quite dredge up his face, but he came along on zero mission sometimes, didn't he? Chizar shook the thought of him out of her head. Damn, they were really going in. Riley would be doing her flicker thing with her vision spilling through the building and the CCPD. Chizara scratched her scalp all over, baring her teeth from all the itches and indecisions. She ambled back toward the shop. How could she spend this to Bob? Well, she'd already said she had a headache. It had gotten her out of school plenty of times. Why not work, too? Well, she didn't want to lie. Of course, it wasn't exactly lying. Lots of things gave Chizara a headache. Whatever she was going to do, she had to hurry to get downtown before the others fixes without her. The thought of that, of missing out completely on an inside look at CCPD, made Chizara's mind up. She replied, okay, and sucked the phone back in her pocket without turning it off. It pulsed there, a literal pain in the ass, but she was going to need it soon. At the shop's dented metal door, she pulled her face into a squint and hunched one shoulder. She went in, making herself walk a bit unsteadily up the little passageway past the bathroom, even dragging her shoulder against the wall. Hey, Bob? He grunted. He was powering up the laptop. Any second now, it would start feeling around for Wi-Fi. I'm getting warning signals in my eyes, she said. Just check my phone, and I guess that set me off in the sunlight out there. Bob looked up at her. The laptop squealed and scratched at Chizara's skull, looking for connections. It was fixed, all right. Plus, her own phone vibrated right then. That would be Riley, opening up a conference call. Nate's training protocols were suddenly back in Chizara's head. Thought you had meds for those migraines. I do. I can see them right there on top of the refrigerator at home. Some detail always made a lie more convincing. You ain't gonna make it, are you? Bob knew she lived too far away to outrun an oncoming migraine. You wanna hide out in the supply closet for the afternoon, nice and dark in there? If I catch a bus, I'll be fine. She picked her bag up from the bench, pawed in it for her sunglasses case. Call me if you get stuck, okay? And it'd be good to have you back in tomorrow, the way stuff's piling up. They both eyed the end shelf crowded with broken appliances. I know, I'm sorry to leave you in a hole, Bob. I'll be back tomorrow for sure. Move it, girl, catch that bus. He really was a nicer boss than she deserved. Chizara scuttled out through the shop past the pinpoint of irritation that was Bob's little wireless security camera. She stepped out into the sunny street and hobbled along for as long as the camera could see her through the glass. Then she dropped the hunch and the squint and sprinted toward downtown. Chapter 16, Crash As she ran clear of the strip mall, Chizara tried not to remember, but it ran through her mind anyway. Scam, the cornered rat in Nate's home theater, the debriefing room, taking the zeros down. He'd moved from one to the next, each of them crumpling from what came out of his mouth. Yeah, but what can he say to me? Chizara had wondered. What awful secrets do I have? She ran faster, trying to leave the memory behind. CCPD, she reminded herself. She'd always wanted to crack that place, even just to get in close and check it out. And now Scam was handing her an excuse not only to see what made it tick, but to see what happened when it unticked. It was going to hurt, a punch. But it'd be worth it to get a look at what was inside. The only real drawback was rescuing Scam, Rat Scam, a.k.a. Ethan. You should see your face when you crash things. Shut up! Chizara ran faster still. It was good to be outside, away from Bob's screeching laptop. 
Sure, there were networks in the apartment buildings on either side of the street, but they were behind walls and mostly up high. There were also phones and GPS systems in the vehicles cruising past, but there wasn't too much traffic yet. It would all get worse the closer she got to downtown. She could feel them foaming against her face, even now. All those connections. You think you're so in control, Scam had said. She was in control. There was no way he could undo her. But you love to break shit, she's our melting a million phones, zapping a room full of computers. You get off on it. Shut up, I told you! She slowed to a walk, dug earbuds out of her bag, pulled out her phone, and plugged herself into the conference call. And there was Flicker's voice. Right on the front steps with everyone walking past, staring at me. This is Crash. Chizara used the stupid code name automatically. Crash. That was Nate. She had to remember to call him Bellwether, even if Glorious Leader was what they called him behind his back. Excellent. Are you downtown yet? Passing Ivy Street now. What have you got, Flicker? The code names fell into place, and the attitude, calm, sharp, a bit smart-ass, maybe. What's up with our old friend? He's sitting across the desk from two detectives, said Flicker. The way they're looking at him, they're dying to lock him up. Then why don't we just let them? Chizara had a vision of Ethan, vicious and triumphant. You're a demon. You're a walking massacre waiting to happen. Well, that's a good question, said Flicker in her ear. And yet, here I find myself on the steps in front of the CCPD, and you're running to help. What had that little rat said to Flicker? Something about Nate and her hooking up. Chizara hardly remembered the words, walking massacre. It wiped out all Scam's other insults. She was in control, and none of them knew how hard that was. Among the buildings of downtown with a million microprocessors and networks all around her, she felt the irritations cluster on her skin burrowing into her bones. Alongside her in the traffic rolling along Clark Street, another swarm hummed and stung. Each shop had its clutch of appliances and alarms, and each office's land overlapped and tangled with the others, then fed into the rumbling stream of buried fiber optic cables. All this gnawed slowly but determinedly at Chizara's brain. Underneath that were everyone's phones. The crowd here was wider and wealthier than in the heights, and everyone seemed to have a networked phone. Some carried an extra one, or a tablet, or a sleeping laptop. The itches built and built, and she tried not to cringe under the attack. She gritted her jangling teeth and squashed down the temptation to slap people. Why do they need so much painful stuff? I'm turning on the North Bride, she said. I can see the place. The CCPD building sat there like a big wedding cake, every tear full of sweet, forbidden, maddening mysteries. Ha, and I can see you. Cross over now, and you see next to Ted's Donuts, the cop shop side entrance is in that alleyway, because you're a cleaner from Ultra Clean Office Services. You worked all that out already? Chizara stood at the crosswalk, waiting for the light to change. For a moment, she wondered if this mission were a setup, some elaborate ruse of glorious leaders to get the Zeros back together, with Flicker, as always, tagging along. I was at my shrinks down the street, Flicker said. I've got eyes everywhere. Hey, Bellwether, is what's his name inside? You know, that guy? Anonymous. Nate sounded long-suffering. Yes, he's there. Speak up, Tebow, if you can. Sure I can, said a deep voice, one she didn't recognize. It's pretty busy. There's no chance of anyone noticing me. Chizara frowned. Tebow, right? But the guy's real name wasn't spelled that way. It had a whole lot of silent letters, like some Nigerian names, but he was French. Pedestrians built up around Chizara at the crosswalk, half of them fiddling with their phones, unable to endure five undistracted seconds. All that wireless fizzed in her muscles. Her own phone in her back pocket was making her butt bones ache. The donut fat smell from Ted's hit her from half a block away. 
What am I doing once I get inside? Chaos production, Nate said. Distraction, knocking things out carefully. A demon with porn face, like you're having the biggest orgasm in the... Do I get to knock Scam out? Let's stay focused on hauling him out of there, Nate said. We don't want his voice deciding to tell the cops about the rest of us. Chizara's step faltered. Right, it would be just like Scam to blurt out everyone else's secrets to take the heat off himself. She turned into the alleyway, trying to look as if she wasn't under siege, wasn't as excited as all hell. She tried to breathe normally and not shake under the electronic onslaught. A few uniformed police officers and a dozen or so ordinary people were cutting through from Usher Street, but mostly she was aware of the big, messy, complex fact of the CCPD right there beside her with all its pulsing temptations. This was going to hurt so much. It was already hurting. Her whole skeleton was beginning to ache. All of Nate's training exercises were coming back to her. They had taught her to not panic, to put off the satisfaction of bringing systems down, to endure the pain and to wrap herself in barefaced confidence and calm as she walked in places where she wasn't meant to be. She knew how to control this excitement, to go beyond the joy of crashing to the brainier thrill of being in among the systems and the flow. She could shut off the yowling with pain part of her while she traced the paths and discovered the nodes, worked out the interrelations and the triggers, calculated how much buzz she was allowed, how much fun, how much relief. As Nate said, there was an ultimate goal to every mission, and each person on the team was putting their talents to serving that. You couldn't just indulge yourself. The other trick was knowing how the people would react when their toys started to fail. The human brain was where the real crashes happened. That door coming up on your left crash? I see it. It had creeped her out the first few times Flicker had looked through her eyes, but now it felt natural. She walked past the door and leaned against the wall, one foot casually propped on the brick. The blurred signals of the building throbbed and tantalized her through bricks and mortar. What's inside exactly? On your left, there'll be an ultra-clean cart. You can stop there and get ready. There's an apron on the handle. Maybe look for some rubber gloves and garbage bags. Don't take the whole cart. It'll only slow you down. Apron, gloves, bags, and then... Chizara closed her eyes and screwed up her face to hear flicker through the grinding of the CCPD systems. Go up the first stairs you find. Nothing but card key locks in your way. They've got scam on the second floor right in the middle of a bunch of cops. That sounds tricky. Just standing here was tricky enough. Don't worry, it's crowded and noisy and there are lots of overflowing trash bins that need to be emptied. Riley sounded so calm and certain. Of course, the whole building wasn't sinking ice picks into her head. Okay. Chizara took a breath, watched a white cop come out through the door. And once I find him? Whatever it takes, Nate cut in. Lights, computers, fire alarms. Give them something bigger to worry about than scam. Then you can both just walk out. He's not under arrest, as far as we know. Anonymous will help you. Not that I'll notice, right? You only ever found out later that Anon had done something vital. Tell me the escape route, Flicker. I need the whole plan from A to Z. Crash had fried her own phone in the middle of a mission more than once, and she didn't want to be left hanging. The main stairs are in the middle of the building. They'll take you down to reception and out the front door. Got it. For show, Chizara took out her old school ID and swiped it across the card reader. At the same time, she reached with a magnetic sensor in and in and farther in in a microsecond's flash to the vigilant source waiting for a signal to read. With her mental fingertips, she knocked it out like flicking away a stick beneath a spinning plate. The fall and the crash sent a small, clean, hot, good feeling in through all her tangling pains. Porn face, that little shit had called it. A massacre waiting to happen. 
The door clicked. Chizara pushed, and it opened. She stepped out of being Chizara and into being Crash, and strolled straight into the CCPD as if she had a perfect right to be there. Chapter 17 Crash it felt just like the Zero's training missions, all those exercises where Nate had tested the limits of their powers. But on this mission, for the first time, there was a real goal. Crash stood by the cart, tying her cleaner's apron, trying to look like someone gearing up for another dreary workday. At her very center, the mission calm formed a solid core. But outside of that, she was more awake than she'd ever been, concentrating hard through the excitement. She was here, in the CCPD. And her outermost layer was all scalded flesh and howling bones, wanting to bend and groan, wanting to curl up on the floor under the pressure. The tech was part of her. It was extra nerves pushing out beyond her skin's limits. It was enormous, heavy, intricate antlers coming out of her head. The CCPD was way more wired up than any of the malls or shopping centers Nate had set their training exercises in. A thousand network connections were dotted through the place, lamps hanging, burning from the antlers, planes and holding patterns shouting, Crash me! Crash me! All the phones in the building formed a swirling galaxy of glowing coals in her mind. They waved around in people's hands, darted about in pockets, lay ignored on desks and in drawers and purses. Each one was a tiny claw clamped on her brain, each sending out a signal painfully high-pitched. All of it itched in her skin and jerked in her muscles. As she pulled on the disposable gloves, her hands shook from the effort of holding back, of not tearing down the wall between herself and silence painlessness, the perfect peace of a big crash. She accessed her mission comm center again, tried to keep control. The cameras had to go, along with what they'd already captured of her and of Scam. She focused on the little eye staring down at her from one corner of the hallway, felt around behind it for the strands that led to the pulse of other cameras like it, to the chips that held the gathered images. In the middle of a noise storm, the itch storm, she allowed herself the tiny relief of letting just that mini system drop, getting that mini itch scratched. There, neatly done. Now the cops would only have the memories in their own heads, or have they taken Scam's photo? She muttered. A mugshot? Came Flicker's voice. He's not handcuffed, so I doubt it, but don't take too long. Those two detectives don't look happy with him. On your right, Crash. There, straight up that hallway. Crash didn't move and didn't reply. Flicker would see why in a second. There was a fizzle of phones and radios outside the alley door, which meant cops coming in. At the moment, they were probably waving their cards at the blank reader, and a second they'd realize that the lock wasn't working and push on through. She waited by the cart, stealing these moments to acclimatize a little more. It was a gorgeous, painful mess in here. When the cops came through the door, one of them nodded to crash, and she nodded back, world wearily. I see you, giggled Flicker. You totally look like a cleaner. Maybe to you, white girl, thought Crash dryly. The cops continued on up the hallway while she pretended to check things on the cart, trembling from the close encounter. She was a little out of practice. So Glorious Leader wanted chaos. It was already chaos in here. Everything she dreaded and dreamed of. New buildings like Cambria Town Hall. She could figure those out at a glance. All the cabling had been done in one hit, and everything was brand spanking new and rationally organized. The CCPD was different. Its nervous system stuffed into a heavy, last-century skeleton where no one wanted to drill through the masonry. Everything had been forced to make way for everything else over years of departmental reorganizations and technological shifts. 
The IT was thrillingly massive, but it was a jumble. New systems were spliced and piggybacked onto old. The server array stashed near the holding cells downstairs was like a museum of computing. Legacy machines lined up there, pumping stuff back and forth so slowly. If only she had time and quiet and no pain, no maddening muscle itch, she could browse through everything and work out some really subtle strategy. But she didn't have time, and she needed to keep the lights working for now. The air conditioning could go, though. That would take a little load off, give her a bit more clarity, which would contribute to the ultimate goal, wouldn't it? And a little warmth wouldn't hurt anyone. Crash marked off the parameters and released it. The bliss of dropping that cumbersome chunk of temperature sensors and fan motors lifted her onto her toes. The system groaned through all its ducts, and its white noise died to silence. Yeah, that would make the cops jumpy, or sweaty anyway. Smoke detection. Alarms were always handy for instant chaos, so she'd save them until she needed noise. Crash sniffed around the radio dispatch center. Yes, she could isolate it so the cops still got their emergency calls. Like a hospital, this was a place to do no harm, or at least not too much harm. For example, those doors to the holding cells downstairs, <laughs> lucky they'd turned out to be on a separate circuit from the lock she just knocked out. That would have been bad. <laughs> All those PCs and servers. She looked at their swarming ant nests of data and mentally rubbed her hands. She could choose her moment with them, too, time the chaos. Blow all the lights at the same time, maybe. Crash swept a trash bag out of the box on the cart and walked up the hallway, reaching through the stinging bee swarms of systems for more things to sacrifice. Here were the stairs. She headed up them to the second floor. To your left, through that half-glass door, Flicker said. Loads of people up here. In case anyone was watching, she did a pretend swipe with her school ID before pushing the door open. Some cops were clustered around a desk, yelling about the air conditioning, arguing about who they were supposed to contact for a fix. No one spared the cleaner more than a glance. On your left, said Flicker. I see him. The sight of Ethan, of scam, since this was a mission sent a new trickle of annoyance down Crash's spine. Not like all the little itches of tech, just the ever-present need to punch him in the face. Two cops were with Scam, one sitting and one standing. He sat all fake casual on an office chair, his expression alternating between his own scared teenage self and that smart ass who did the talking for him. Crash checked out the rest of the room for obstacles and pathways, sure, but the wiring was the thing, the signals pouring through it and being split and transformed and channeled. Lots of people around her meant better focus, wider reach. She tried to keep her eyes open as she felt along her extending antlers, her lengthening mind fingers. Flicker interrupted, her voice a little nervous. Everyone still looks pretty calm, Crash. Pretty business as usual. Not for long. Crash reached into the smoke detector in the ceiling above her, careful not to knock out the whole system. There was no point if it just died quietly. She had to hold back so much of herself and just make the tiniest adjustment to cut the connection between those two plates there. She jumped at the shriek of the alarm, loud even through her earbuds. Everyone around her ducked and covered their ears as if they'd just been dive-bombed, then stared up in shock. Hooey! <laughs> what a noise! The problem was she could barely think now. How was she supposed to keep the rest of this place working? Crash steered toward the desk where Scam sat. Flicker was a tiny, tinny voice cheering and shouting in her earbuds. Whatever, I can't hear you. 
Crash murmured, stepping back as a uniformed woman rushed past, swearing a streak. Lots of men were striding around now, but Crash slipped through them, invisible because she had brown skin and was a girl and wore the cleaning company apron. Nearly everyone in the office had their hands over their ears. Some were up out of their chairs, shouting suggestions. Others kept working away at screens, hunched under the pressure of the noise. One of Scam's detectives, the big guy, had turned away and thrown up his hands. The other, a woman, sat there waiting calmly, fingers in her ears. From between them, Scam's eyes lit on Crash. His flash of recognition turned to hope, then nerves, and flat-out fear as she scowled back at him. He looked away again, self-consciously casual, even with his hands over his ears. Crash stood back to let some cops scurry for the door, then slipped between two desks where she wouldn't be disturbed and started sorting out the different layers of tech. She put out her feelers through the shifting galaxy cloud of phones, to the more stable, tethered thrumming of the computers, to the sweet simplicity of the lighting system. She crashed it. Such a tiny treat, such a little shiver up her spine when this giant chocolate box was open in front of her. But it was good, that whole swarm of stingers finally switching off. Her skin purred for a moment with gratitude. Shouts went up as if the people in the office were cheering her on. But then an emergency lighting system kicked to life. No, no, Crash wanted none of that. She dug deeper to its source and allowed that to fail too, and the room dimmed again. Only a couple of frosted windows in the far wall let in sunlight. More cops sat back from their computers and looked around, bewildered. Scam stared at her. Then he glanced at the two detectives standing there like gatekeepers in front of him. Semi-darkness and a bit of noise weren't going to shift them. Right then, stay calm. Crash's head was beginning to spin from what she'd done and what she might still do. She knelt to reach for a small trash can, an excuse to hold on to something. On her knees and stable, she let her mind go, and like a small but potent tornado, it swept through the building, crashing this and that, all the minor things, all the unlucky subsystems, on its way in toward the roots of the server array. She kept her face down so Scam wouldn't see how good this felt. Holy shit. Flicker's voice was tiny in her ears, then suddenly altogether gone. Broken cell phone connections fluttered around Crash like streamers from a departing cruise liner. Something big and important flailed and died in the basement. She meant not to crash that, she thought vaguely, but it was too late now. The storm she'd called into being had its own logic now, its own demands. Was it her or the storm itself whispering through her lips into the chaos? She couldn't hear the words, but she felt them like fire in her bones. It's time to do some damage. Chapter 18 Flicker Lost her. Flicker said from half a block away, the nearest to the CCPD that her phone would work at all. She'll be fine, Glorious Leader said. Just tell me what you see. Flicker took a moment before responding. Chaos was the simple answer. The lights had failed completely, leaving the inner offices lit only with a bobbing flurry of tiny screens. Flashlights were all the phones were good for, now that Crash had shredded the local repeater tower. Everything was a blur of motion in Flicker's head. It was dizzying, being in people's viewpoints when they were running around in darkness, eyes twitching and jerking. Some of them were evacuating, filling the stairwells. Flicker could hear the shriek of smoke alarms from the front steps. Finally, she found a stable pair of eyeballs, the detective seated across from Scam. That gaze went from Scam to her partner, a big guy who was striding away, shouting into his useless phone. Scam's still being watched, but things are pretty messy in there. It's under control, 
glorious leader said. He said this a lot during missions. Before the phones went out, Anonymous told me he had them in sight. Right, Anonymous. Flicker always remembered the code name, even when the rest of it slipped her grasp. But this isn't good. I'm seeing a bunch of cops with drawn guns. Why would they lock and load for a fire alarm? Maybe they think it's an attack. Um, it kind of is. Flicker cast her vision into the group with the brandished weapons. They were headed downstairs, past the ground floor and deeper. What's in the basement, Bellwether? Of a police station? The clatter of computer keys. The generator? The parking lot? Mierda. The holding cells. Wait. She went deeper, flicking herself from head to head. She was well past her usual range, but it was crowded in the CCPD, and her power used human beings like repeater towers, leapfrogging from one pair of eyes to the next. She found more people down there, a huddled group of them, their eyes full of darkness as hard as stone. Her view prickled with little stars of misfiring rods and cones, the fritz and glitter that sighted people saw when completely deprived of light. Then, for a moment, the blackness was cut in two by a single flashlight. It searched among the looming shadows of a dozen men, found a door, then switched off again. Uh-oh, she said. There's a bunch of people sneaking around down there, not cops. Electronic cell doors, Nate said, his fingers still clicking on a keyboard. They're designed to stay locked in a power outage, but you can't design for crash. Okay, but where'd a bunch of prisoners get a flashlight? From a cop, Nate said softly. And probably not gently. Don't tell Crash, she'll lose it. Flicker swore. Chizara was all about discipline. She lived by the credo of do no harm, always keeping away from hospitals and airports. She'd never been on a plane or a train in her life, afraid she'd let her guard down for one catastrophic moment. Focus on the mission, Flick. At that tone and glorious leader's voice, her zero discipline clicked back in. She pulled vision from the sparkling darkness of the basement and flitted back up to the window-lit office space on the second floor. It was even more chaotic now. The glimmer of drawn guns, the lancing beams of big fat police flashlights. Some of the detectives were struggling into dark blue bulletproof vests. They know what's happening down in the basement. Good. That's a perfect distraction. Can you see Crash yet? Flicker was searching for Scam's eyeballs among the havoc, and finally she recognized his thin fingered, freckled hands in the gloom. He was tearing up a notepad. They've left him alone, she said. I think he's destroying evidence. So he's keeping his head. At least we didn't do this for nothing. I guess, Flicker said, unfolding her cane. I'm going back, you might lose me. Stay outside, be- His voice crackled and spat as she walked toward the police station, and then her earbuds went silent. Flicker snapped her vision closer, finding her orange dress among the milling curious crowds watching the evacuation of the CCPD. The civilians who worked in the station were streaming down the front steps, blinking as they emerged from darkness into sunlight. A local news van was pulling up. The reporters inside no doubt thrilled about this banner day of bank robbery and police station chaos. Flicker slipped among the crush, using her cane, her ears, and flickers of stolen vision to navigate, heading toward the front steps, which nobody had thought to block off yet. She hoped that saving Ratface was worth causing all this mayhem. Chapter 19 Mob Mikey hadn't called back about giving her a ride. He was probably at work already. That was Mikey's deal, dance all night, work all day, and maybe dance the next night, too. He said it kept him young. It also kept him busy. So Kelsey didn't wait long. According to her phone, the police station was a 53 minutes walk. 
As she checked the route, a thought went through her head. What kind of idiot robs a bank three miles from a police station? Of all the crazy stuff her dad had ever done, this made the least sense. The day was heating up. She had to keep pushing the hair off her damp face. She was glad for the loose harem pants and crop tops she'd worn clubbing, even if they were earning her more glances than she really needed right then. Her muscles weren't good sore anymore. They just hurt. But maybe it was better that Mikey hadn't picked her up. She didn't like lying to him. He'd never been anything but a friend to her. Trouble was, she had no idea where to start with the truth. The walk gave her time to think. When she was growing up, Dad had always said he could make anything better. He meant little things, like scrapes on her knee. And some big things, like the time in fifth grade when she'd freaked out at a playground fight. All those kids chanting, kill him, kill him, in unison. And she'd almost wanted to join in. Or how every exam at school was like drowning in a room full of other people's fear, no matter how hard she studied. Those were things Dad could deal with. But this was way bigger. Her dad had robbed a bank. And now he was going to prison. As she drew closer to the police station, a sickly fear started crawling around in Kelsey's gut. How many years did you get for a bank robbery that got somebody killed? What if her father had pulled the trigger? What if he never came out? The squawk of a police car echoed down the street, and her heart skidded two inches sideways in her chest. The station was just ahead. A crowd was bubbling around it, onlookers and police officers. There were people streaming out of the station doors. Kelsey stopped. Something was wrong. She'd been feeling it for blocks now. The energy of the crowd making panicked zigzags low in her stomach. She thought it was her own anxiety. She hadn't realized it was out there. She sped up, taking the city blocks at a jog, heading toward the noise and panic. Lights flashed in the police station windows, and alarms inside screamed and wailed. But the worst of it was the rush and wash of energies, broken connections, wild emotions. She felt like she was going down a waterfall. Crowds were only good when they shared something, when they were united by a purpose or a beat. Then she could slip inside, be part of that something more. But this was even more tangled than the bank robbery. Police, journalists, passers-by, they were all pulling in different directions. A dozen crowds all braided and knotted up, refusing to be one thing. As if they were tributaries cascading into a river. The spray thrown up by their collision blinded her, nearly wiped her off her feet. For a moment, the world was awash with white. She came to a halt a block away from the station, leaning against a wall to take deep breaths. Just like her dad had taught her, in, count to three, then out. Usually this helps when she had to tune out a crowd, when she had to be just a solitary girl in the middle of it all, to be Kelsey. In. Two, three, out. But then a jolt came down the street, a fresh shock, and Kelsey lost herself again. She was everywhere at once, stretched thin across the top of the bubbling energies. Fear flooded her eyes and blocked her ears. She had to pull herself out of the echoing tide, then drag everyone else with her, because with this kind of panic, people might do something stupid. And her dad was still in there. She had to make sure her dad was okay. Are you all right? Someone shouted in her ear. She shook her head mutely. Whatever was going on in the police station, it was getting worse. Someone was helping her, leading her by the elbow to a bench nearby. She leaned forward over her knees. She felt like she was made of drops of rain on a window, all the rivulets of herself blurring into something bigger. She gulped mouthfuls of air and tried not to pass out. In, two, three, out. When the nausea cleared, she realized the ringing wasn't in her ears. It was her phone. She ignored it, probably Mikey asking if she still needed a ride. Whoever had helped her to the bench was gone. Kelsey looked up at the station. Maybe the police were evacuating people from the holding cells. They'd do that if there was a fire in the station, right? 
Her phone kept ringing. Finally, she pulled it from her pocket. Yeah? Kells, came a ragged voice. It's Dad. She pressed a finger to her other ear. Dad, are you okay? What's going on? I did something. You robbed a bank is what you did. There was a pause. You saw the news already? I was across the street. That's what happens when you rob banks in broad daylight. Witnesses. She stared at the station. Police were everywhere, scrambling and frantic. They're letting you use a phone? I got out. It didn't make sense. None of this made sense. What? How? The security system must have failed somehow. The doors just opened up. Two police ran past her in bulletproof vests. They were carrying rifles. Her dad was still talking. The lights went out all at once, Kells, and a bunch of alarms went off. We all just walked out. Dad, are you crazy? It's like a war zone out here. The cops all have guns. You'll get shot. I'm half a mile away already. Kelsey, you have to meet me. She hunched over her phone, not believing any of this. It felt like some new force was moving through her life, as powerful and strange as the ability she'd been born with. But at least she could see her father again. Okay, Dad. Where? Chapter 20. Crash. Crash clung to the desk, her bones shaking, throwing off the crushing pressure system by system, swimming up toward the surface through a glowing tangle of tentacles alive with stingers. Someone put a hand on her shoulder. Muzzily, she looked up at Scam. He was shouting and shoving something at her that glittered in the dimness. A pink phone covered with fake diamonds, definitely not his. Crash hauled herself up. Where were Scam's detectives? There, scrambling along the hallway toward the back, their guns pointed at the ceiling. They must be thinking this was a terrorist attack. Messy. Let's get out of here, Scam cried. Stairs this way. She would have run, but her legs had gone rubbery. Something big was building inside her. She could tell something epic and out of control. Uh-oh. Crash grabbed for the desk again and missed, but Scam caught her. He was practically hitting her with the glittery phone, and he pulled out one of her earbuds, shouting over the smoke alarms. Kill this phone, would you? She tried to push him away. What was gathering inside her was too big, too dangerous. Crashing something now would be like pouring kerosene on a burning fuse. She had to get out of this place. Scam funneled his voice into her ear with a hand. There's video on it. She was videoing me at the bank. She's got me saying, yeah, yeah. Crash fended him off. He'd been incriminating himself, of course, opening his big mouth and letting the bullshit fall out. She pushed him toward the central stairway. But there's video, he mewled. She snatched the phone and smacked it into the metal corner of a desk. The screen blistered. She hit it again, harder. Glass fragments skittered across the desk and flew to the floor. She shoved it back at him. There, it's crashed. He stared at the dead, shattered screen. His stunned expression started a laugh burbling up from inside her. <laughs> no, that wasn't a laugh, not at all. It was something big and scary. A walking massacre, if ever there was one. Stairs, she pointed with a shaking hand. Scam hoisted a green duffel bag up onto one shoulder, put the other under Crash's arm, and heaved her forward. Then they were at the stairway, a bigger space where the alarms didn't hammer quite as hard. Cops were running past, guns drawn. Crash wanted a laugh. They looked so earnest and alert, as if this were an alien invasion and not just a systems meltdown. At the foot of the stairs, a guy was waving everyone through to the front of the building. Get out! Move it! They pushed on after the people crowding out into the lobby. 
She'd let something bad happen down in the basement. What was it again? She hadn't meant to go that far. Now all she could see were the phones, every single one in the CCPD. The local tower was down, but the phones were still struggling to connect. A flock of burning lights and fizzing panes, and the phones out on the street, too, and some in neighboring buildings. She could feel the call of the next tower on, and still farther away bulked the switching center with its unbearable complications and power. The smoke alarm still shrieked, the fire control system pressed in on her. Everything was building into a wave, one she couldn't hold back much longer. She was slipping, losing control, her will no longer separate from the shattering networks around her. She was not going to be able to stick to the rules. To no harm, she didn't have a choice anymore. She should never have come here. Crash stumbled along, head down, only Scam and his duffel bag holding her upright. Shiny cop shoes scuffed and clumped on the tiled floor around her own. With her last ounce of willpower, she turned away from Scam. She did not want him to see her face. Because it was about to fall over, all of it, there was nothing she could do. The pain, the strain of keeping those masses of tech functioning, surged out of Crash's body in a hot, sweet, glorious rush. If Scam hadn't been holding her weight, she would have slumped on the floor with the blissed-out shock of letting go. The entire building sighed to a halt around her, an airy, painless refuge in the middle of the downtown madness. This was good. This was what she was meant to do. She was Crash. Some dim-faced cop was shouting in her face. You okay, miss? She smiled at him, tried to nod, tried to speak, failed. Scam pulled her forward. She felt light in his arms, a creature made of fire and cotton candy. Now they were in the reception area. The doorway to the street was bright with sunlight. They'd made it. But someone stepped in and blocked the light, a big cop with a square head and shoulders like football armor. Hey, he said to Scam. Fuentes had you in for something, didn't he? Somehow, even in her rapture, Crash realized that this had all been a waste of time. They were going to haul Scam back inside and probably arrest her, too. It was all over, but worth it just to taste this. But then a kid, a tall, skinny boy, nicely dressed, came at the big cop from out of nowhere. He kicked the back of the cop's left knee, then pulled him backward by his shoulders. The cop's mouth opened, and he flailed and went down, and Scam was dragging her out the door. She looked back. There'd been something about that boy, but he was gone. Maybe there hadn't been a boy at all. It was so bright out here on the front steps. The summer sun amped up all the color in the world and polished the palm tree leaves to shining. Crash stared at the sky. It was deep blue and empty and perfect. Suddenly, Flicker was on the other side of her helping scam supporter. Even in her blissed out state, Crash's train kicked in, her eyes going into seeing-eye human mode, scanning the sidewalk in front of them, registering every seam and bump. You guys, she said. That was fun. Are you okay? Flick's voice sounded so real out here in the street air instead of through earbuds. Totally. It's so good to see you. And somehow Crash meant both of them, even if Scam was twitching and gawking back over his shoulder and sweating all over her. Flicker shook her head. That was insane, Chazara. I didn't know you could do that much. Crash laughed. It was not doing that much. That was always so hard. And Chizara? For this wonderful moment, there was nobody called Chizara, only crazy reckless crash who could paint her name in darkness across the city who could bring down the whole world if she wanted they've got that bank security footage of me scam muttered 
Relax, Flicker said. We'll take care of it. Scam hoisted his duffel bag a little higher. Where are we going? To see our glorious leader, said Flicker in a bad Russian accent. Crash burst out laughing. Scam groaned. Come on, said Flicker. This mess is going to take some debriefing. They ran through the crowd of curious onlookers, Flicker fast and sure-footed thanks to Crash's eyes, the way the training missions had taught them, back when they'd all been friends and worked together before Scam's voice had blown the zeros to pieces. Chapter 21, Bellwether. I need the room, Nate said. His little sisters giggled, but they streamed obediently out, dragging their stuffed animals, wrestling masks, and capes made from bath towels behind them. Gabriella, he called to the youngest before she disappeared. Would you please mention to Mama that my friends haven't had lunch? Gabby rolled her beautiful brown eyes at him and curtsied, then ran off behind the others laughing. But the message would be delivered. Nate stood there a moment, kicking a few toys his sisters had left. A plastic wombat, a cheetah made of felt, behind the riser under the movie screen. Why his sisters always wanted to play here in the home theater was beyond him. They ignored the playroom and backyard for days at a time, preferring these eight fat leather chairs and the purple carpeted floor. But it was time for Nate to reclaim his sanctum. He pulled a four-inch Blue Demon doll from a cup holder. It was new, beautifully hand-painted, and already chipped from too many combats. His sister's lucha libre craze had lasted months now, which was all very well except for the occasional masked ambush when Nate emerged from his bedroom. His phone buzzed, anon. Might be late, following something up. Nate put the doll down and keyed in, okay. At least all four of them were coming. It was annoying, having no agenda prepared for the first meeting of the Zeros in almost a year. But this was like starting over, he supposed. If they left here feeling bonded into a group again, maybe Scam's little disaster had been worth it. Nate needed to remind himself what Anonymous looked like. He reached into the riser's secret compartment beneath the hidden wires and cables and pulled out his stack of Zero files. He never kept anything about the zeros on his computer. The anonymous folder was mostly photos, low-angled and badly lit, most snapped and secret. The images were never clear enough to stick in his mind. The guy was a snappy dresser, though. Which was funny, come to think of it. Why would a guy bother with fancy clothes when he was practically invisible? Well, more like forgettable, but still. Nate pulled out his notepad, ready to add that to his list of questions. He reviewed the others. Can Anon also see connections? Does his power follow the curve? Invisibility as a function of memory. Does his own family recognize him? And there it was, written in Nate's own handwriting and dated a year ago. Why does he bother dressing so well? Nate sighed. It had been a while since he'd reviewed this file. Daily memorization was the only way to make the knowledge stick, and even then it only halfway did. It took all of Nate's focus to just sit here and read his own notes to keep his thoughts from drifting, to remember that Thibault was real. It was like trying to make friends with a puff of smoke. It seemed only a few moments had passed when Gabby was back announcing, your friends are here, and fluttering away again. Nate hid the files beneath his seat as the three of them came in. Crash looked wide-eyed and spacey like she'd been pulled away from a nightclub at the peak of some expensive high. Flicker was using her cane, her power probably worn down from skipping across so many eyes. Scam's buzz cut was new, but otherwise he was his usual twitchy self. He was dragging a duffel bag behind him and looked like a guy who'd lost a fight with a bear. Take a seat, everyone, Nate said. They fell into the recliners as he took the stage. 
Almost a year. That's how long it had been since the four of them had been in this room together. All that time, they could have been training, building up their powers, learning to work together. Almost a year wasted. And the whole blow-up had been, in a way, Nate's fault. He'd struck the match. But now, the zeros were his again. He could see it in the lines of attention that lit up the air like sparklers, all gathering on him like they always did. The others were skittish about being together again, still scarred from what had happened last summer, but they were too exhausted from the mission to fight his influence. They needed reassurance. They needed to be led. You guys did great. Nate let his smile settle over them, flexing his power to tighten the connections. Without any planning or prep work, we accomplished our mission. We rescued one of our own. By the way, Scam, welcome back. He turned his gaze to Ethan, giving him the floor for a moment. The little guy just cringed at first. He probably hadn't been called Scam in a while, and he didn't know what to say. But Nate gave him just the right look, guiding him toward gratitude. Um, right. Thanks, guys. It was Ethan's real voice, as clumsy and squeaky as always. You, uh, really saved my ass. There was an uncomfortable little pause here, because no one was going to say you're welcome, not to scam. Speaking the words himself would only cost Nate respect, so he didn't bother. Instead, he drew the focus back to himself. We'll always protect each other, especially when our powers, when what we are, gets us into trouble. That worked. The connections in the room grew a little brighter. The three of them were still full of adrenaline, still bonded by success. That had always been the point of the training missions. They had gotten the idea from watching his cousins play baseball. They could spend a whole morning fighting but then drop all their rivalries in an instant once victory was at stake. Now, to find out what the hell had happened in the bank. So, Ethan, your voice got you into trouble? Yeah, I guess. Nate stepped off the stage and sat down, setting the sparkling strands of awareness wavering, looking for a new object. He swiveled his chair toward Ethan. The guy didn't want to talk, but Nate's attention drew the others along with it, focusing the pressure until it was too much to resist. Ethan stumbled into an explanation of what had happened in the bank, something about a girl who hadn't wanted to hand over her ring. To keep her from getting shot, the boys had spilled the robber's secrets, setting them against each other, and the heist had ended in gunfire. But the girl had taken video of Ethan using his voice, and she'd given it to the cops. It all sounded very heroic and self-sacrificing, which meant he was leaving something out. Nate couldn't quite tell what yet. Here in front of his former friends, Ethan didn't dare use his voice. But without it helping, his wobbly storytelling was hard to piece together, even when he was trying to tell the truth. They're going to find me, he whined. The cops, they know my face. Chizara giggled in a very uncrash like way. Any video your girlfriend took is gone, Scam. Even if the cops made a copy, it's confetti in a hurricane, like the rest of their data. She laughed again, slouching in her chair, her usual regal posture turned casual. Nate glanced down at his notepad and wrote, What's up with Chizara? But a bunch of cops saw me. Ethan said. It's not like you erase their memories, too. And there's security footage. You're going to crash the bank's computers? Chizara raised an eyebrow, like this sounded tempting. Blurry bank cameras don't matter, Nate said, giving them both a calming look. You never told them your real name, right? Of course not, but my mom works down there. Of course, his mother, the deputy district attorney, the bank footage would be part of the robbery investigation and then the trial. Sooner or later, Scam was busted. But what had he actually done? You haven't broken any laws, Ethan, Nate said in his most soothing voice. The fact that you talked to the robbers might make the cops suspicious. 
but it's not a crime. That was what really mattered, that Scam never had to explain himself to the law, because once he started talking about his own power, it wouldn't be long before his inner voice traded everyone else's secrets as well. Nathaniel Saldana had big plans for himself, goals that would be a lot trickier if the public had any idea what he could do. Ethan was nodding along, wanting to believe that everything would be okay. That was the key to getting people on your side, showing them a path to what they already desired. Once you'd done that, it hardly mattered that it was also your path. Human nature was so easy to figure out when you could see it shimmering in the air. Most of the time, Nate didn't even have to use his power to get what he wanted. When you asked the detective to call me, he said carefully to Ethan, did he write my phone number down on a piece of paper? Yeah, but I ripped it up. And his phone's memory is gone, right, Crash? Chizara was still smiling. Like I said, it's all confetti down there, but if the cops want to find you, they can pull the phone company's logs. Ethan shrank a little in his chair, and Nate had to control himself. It doesn't matter. If they come around, I'll deal with it. Nate gave them all a cool, serene expression, like he was the only one in danger but wasn't worried at all. For a moment, the room settled around him, the glitter of their adrenaline finally starting to soften in the air. Then Flicker said, So, Ethan, why do you keep looking at your duffel bag? Ethan stared at her in terror for a moment, then tried to shrug it off. It's just my bag, clothes and stuff. Nate wrote on his notepad, Clever girl. Then he stood and crossed the little theater, knelt, and unzipped the duffel bag. Money. Countless rolls of it, wrapped tight with rubber bands. He heard Flicker whistle. Nate looked up at Ethan. Are you serious? You skimmed money from a bank robbery? No, I was in the bank to put it someplace safe. It's mine. Chizara flat out laughed at this. Okay, but whose was it before that? Ethan swallowed like his skinny little throat was gulping down a golf ball, but his next words came out too smoothly. Me and a friend drove down to Los Alamitos on Tuesday, went to the track, put our paychecks on Amarillo Rose in the fifth race. Forty-six to one. You can look it up. No doubt we could, Nate said mildly. Scams in her voice never got details wrong. Where it failed was the big picture. Since when did you get friends? Flicker said. And why does that money smell like stale beer? Ethan glared at her a moment, then deflated, like a pufferfish giving up. From this guy, Craig something. He works at some club. It was the night's take from whatever extra they sell there. You mean this is drug money? Nate took a step back from the duffel bag. And you brought it into my house? I didn't want to bring it here, Scam cried. I wasn't even trying to steal it. I just wanted to ride home. Nate swore. He wiped the metal zipper pull with his shirt tail to erase any fingerprints. A criminal record did not go with his long-term plans. The focus had gone out of the room now, the sense of connection, of team. Scam was an expert at disconnecting people, even when he wasn't trying to be an ass. Maybe because his power was so different from the others. It was focused on individuals, not groups. It was narrow and selfish, a broken version of what the rest of them had. People are going to be looking for this bag, Nate said, sinking back into his chair. Bad people. Maybe, came an unfamiliar voice. But the money's not our biggest problem. Nate looked up. Sitting in the back row was a dark-haired boy. It took a long moment to recognize him, and then real effort for Nate to keep his gaze from sliding away. He wondered how long the boy had been sitting up there. Then he remembered the trick. Nate had to keep everyone else looking at the boy so he could use the glittering strands of attention in the room to keep himself focused. Ah, you made it, he said. Everyone. Perhaps you remember Anonymous? Chapter 22 Flicker 
Now that Anonymous was sitting in front of them, Flicker did remember. She remembered his eyes, blue and intense, the dark hair and bangs that almost covered them, the long, pale fingers steepling together as he leaned back in the leather chair, his lean face with that expression of intelligence and reserve, like someone content with watching everything from a corner of the room. It was always startling how handsome Anonymous was, even pretty if that was the right word for someone who looked so haunted. Or maybe he was just shy, not used to anyone staring at him the way Glorious Leader was now, intent and purposeful, as if trying to catalog everything about... Thibault, she said. That was his name. It was French, as tricky to spell as the boy himself was to remember. His blue eyes shied away from Nate, looking at the others. Was he looking at her? Flicker tried to cast her vision into his, then remembered the other thing that she always forgot. She couldn't put herself in his eyes. She'd never been able to. He was a blank spot in the room. Now that was really weird. She went to Chizara's vision, trying to triangulate. Yes, the pretty boy was definitely looking at Flicker. Suddenly self-conscious, she ran her fingers through her frazzled hair. She'd been running around downtown all morning and probably looked like she'd ridden a bike here. What do you mean, Thibault? Nate asked. What problem? There was a breakout, the boy said. His voice sounded a little husky, like he was getting a cold, or maybe he didn't get much practice talking to people. During the crash, some of the prisoners in the CCPD managed to get away. Flicker was still in Chizara's eyes as they swung to Nate, widening a little. Of course, Nate had forgotten to warn Anon not to mention the escape to Chizara. Oh my god. Chizara's hands grasped at each other. I saw those cell locks. I was trying to keep them online. Nate looked straight at her. We don't know what happened. Not really. We know exactly what happened, Nate. I broke the whole damn building! Everyone's eyes were on Chizara, and Flicker wanted to say something reassuring. But she could also feel her awareness of Anonymous slipping away now that she couldn't see him. An unwelcome but familiar wish overtook her, and she had her own eyes to control to focus where she wanted. Thibault, she said, his name coming back to her just in time. Did anyone get hurt? It worked. They all looked at him again. He cleared his throat. He was shy. Not sure what happened in the station, but I tracked a gang of them for a minute or two. They weren't on a rampage or anything, just trying to get away. They split up after a few blocks, melted into the crowd. It doesn't sound too bad, Nate said. So what's the problem? One of them had a limp, Anon said. He was the bank robber, the one they showed on the news. He's free. Jerry, Ethan said softly, and all eyes went to him. The voice talked to him in the bank, made his robbery go sideways, so now I got the Craig and his drug buddies and the cops and a crazy-ass bank robber after me. Flicker put herself in Nate's eyes. He was scanning the room. Chizara's post-crash euphoria had vanished, now that she knew she'd let loose a bunch of prisoners. She was sitting up straight, staring at her own fidgeting hands. Scam looked even more like a cornered rat than usual, and for some reason he was clutching a blue-headed wrestler doll. Thibault pushed a hand nervously through his dark hair, and the pale half-moon of an ear peeked out. He'd realized that he shouldn't have mentioned the breakout in front of Chizara, but too late. We'll all deal with this together, Nate said, his voice taking on its most sonorous, glorious leader tones. We zeros can protect our own. Easy for you to say, Ethan muttered. You don't have the whole damn city looking for you. I should just skip town, take that money, and go. For a moment, Flicker let herself think how much easier that would make all their lives. No more scam creating mayhem every time he opened his mouth. But then Nate said, We can help. And Flicker knew those words were true, because the zeros stuck together.
always and forever. Yes, this was glorious leader wielding his power, making them all feel connected because he'd never let any of them leave Cambria. But it was still wonderful, this feeling that she belonged here with the other zeros, that she had allies who shared her deepest secrets. Nate's power really was glorious if you just let it work on you. Of course, having Scam here made sinking into it a little weird. We'll use that bag of money to fix this, Nate was saying. Get it back where it belongs and smooth this over. Ethan was fighting him, squirming in his chair. Yeah, but money won't fix things with the cops or with my mom. And I totally earned this money. I'm not going to just give it to you. Nate was scribbling on his notepad. Say something, Flick. He trusts you. That money will just get you into trouble again, she said. I'll keep it safe, so it's there when you need it. Ethan was staring at her, the hopeful look on his face almost heartbreaking. Then Nate's eyes dropped to his pad again. Thibault can hide him? The name looked strange for a moment, until Nate glanced up into the back row. Of course, that beautiful boy. Had she forgotten him already? Anon, she said. You can take care of Ethan, right? Hide him somewhere until all this blows over? Good thinking, Nate chimed in, as if it hadn't been his idea. Just until we can fix things, he'll be safe with you. Nate's gaze stayed on Anonymous, who let out a slow sigh. I guess I've got a place to park him, but it's not like I can keep him under control. Most of the time, he won't even remember I'm there. Flicker went into Scam's eyes, wondering how he felt about all this. He wasn't looking up at Anon. He was studying the wrestler doll with the blue head, its eyes and mouth outlined in silver. As long as Ethan's safe, Nate said, while we figure out how to fix things. Yeah, because we're so awesome at fixing things, Chizara murmured. She was staring at her own hands, her fingers rubbing at the lines on her palms, as if to wipe them away. Nathaniel! Came a clear, bell-like voice from the doorway. The others looked up to see Nate's little sister Gabby standing there, a blue bath towel draped over her shoulders like a cape. Mama says lunch is ready, she said, then pirouetted once completely around and scampered off. Everyone's eyes went to Nate who smiled benevolently and said, I'm sure you're all starving. This has been a challenging morning. No one argued with that. Now that the dregs of her adrenaline had faded, Flicker realized how hungry it had left her, looking through a thousand eyeballs. Sometimes it was these little gestures that made Nate glorious, even if his mother had made the food. The others started to file out of the room, but Nate stayed. Flicker went into his vision again. He was writing notes to himself, things Thibault had said, the details of his clothes, even the way he sat. And now that she looked closer, she saw that Nate's notepad was balanced on a sheaf of papers. She saw more handwritten notes sticking out from the edges and printed photographs. Of course, this was how Nate always managed to remember Thibault better than the rest of them did. He might forget the person, but he remembered his own notes, the stories he told himself about Anonymous, which gave Flicker an idea. She let the others leave, watching as Nate finished up. Finally, he slid the file beneath his chair and stood. Shall we? She nodded and took his arm, let him guide her halfway down the hall. But then she said, Wait a second, the money's back there. Nate shrugged. It's fine. Of course, Glorious Leader was the golden child of the house. No one touched his stuff without permission. But I want Ethan to see that I'm taking care of it. Right. Clever girl, Nate said. I'll go get it. Flicker drew him to a halt. Don't get all helper monkey on me, Nate. Go say grace before the rest of them scandalize your mother by eating unblessed food. She unfolded her cane, staying in his eyes until he nodded. Okay, he said. Sorry to make you hold the money, Flick. 
but the cops have my phone number. They might visit. Of course, she smiled at him. Wouldn't want your political career ending before it starts. Yeah, but sorry it has to be you. It's just that Chizara's too fragile right now, and Ethan is Ethan. And Thibault, we don't even know where he lives. Flicker smiled. That was the point in being anonymous, she supposed. She gave Nate a quick hug, though without the little kiss she'd used to place on his cheek. She couldn't do that anymore without imagining what Scam had said last year, even though she and Nate had never kissed in any other way. Nate turned and headed down the hall, and Flicker made her way back into the theater. The duffel bag was easy to find. It smelled like beer and Ethan's nervous sweat. She felt her way across the room, listening for any footsteps from the hall. Was this the chair that Nate had been sitting in? She reached beneath it and found the sheaf of papers. She slipped the folder into the duffel bag, zipped it closed again, and hoisted it onto her shoulder. She wondered if Nate would be annoyed when he realized his notes were missing, or if he'd forget them completely. In any case, she was only borrowing them for a little while. Long enough for her sister to read them aloud to her, to describe the photos, to make Anonymous real in the way that Lily made every story real. Maybe her voice could finally stick that beautiful boy in Flicker's memory for good. Chapter 23 Mob Dad told her to meet him at the stadium. He liked ball games, and Kelsey always went with him because she liked crowds. But there was no game today, no one around except a guy on a riding mower making slow arcs in the stadium grass. She spotted a lonely figure in the nosebleed section, two rows from the back. He wore a cap and sat hunched among the colorful plastic seats, invisible if you weren't looking for him. Kelsey climbed the concrete stairs, so hot and dazzling in the afternoon sun. She really needed some sleep, and the emptiness dragged her down. Even the crowded streets outside, full of cops and anxious people, were better than the vast nothing of the stadium. When she got to the top, her father looked the way she felt, thousand years older than yesterday. His stubble was gray on his sagging cheeks, and there were sweat stains on his shirt, which was black and long-sleeved, too heavy for the heat. Kelsey's first words were, Seriously, Dad? He got to his feet and wrapped his arms around her. What were you thinking? She said into his shoulder. I'm sorry, Kels. She pulled away, her anger trying to spark, but exhaustion and relief won out. That's not an answer, she managed. Her father shrugged, not meeting her gaze. I needed the money. So you robbed a bank? What did you need that much money for? Dad shuffled along the row and sat down. He waited until she was sitting beside him. I owe somebody. What? Her mind was rolling, trying to take it all in. Dad, you just broke out of a police station. We didn't break out. I told you. The doors just opened, right? She shook her head. That's nuts. Her father spread his hands. You think I should have stayed, with everybody running around in the dark? There was a cop near the cells, in an office full of TV screens. He got beat down. I couldn't stick around. Whoever came looking for us was going to be pissed. You think they'll be less pissed if they find you now? Dad gave her the look he used whenever she brought home her school grades, kind of hurt and disappointed all at once. It was my only chance. You think I'm better off in prison, only seeing my little girl through a plastic screen? That froze her. Dad had never really understood how crowds affected her. He just thought she was sensitive, but imagining a whole building full of desperate, violent men crammed between high walls of stone and razor wire, their rage held in check by clubs and guns and pepper spray, that was terrifying. She could never set foot inside a place like that. She'd never see her dad again. Whose idea was this robbery, Dad? Yours? It was this guy I owe. 
Nick Gagarin. Kelsey frowned. She knew most of Dad's friends, at least by name, but no one called Nick. Came to Cambria early this year, Dad said, with his uncle, a guy called Alexei Bagrov. They were looking to set up a base. They gave me a job. Then how come you owe them money? It was that kind of job. They fronted me a few grand to start my own business. Doing what? He was quiet. Dad, she waited. You're selling drugs again. Don't even try to deny it. He dealt before, coke at the clubs, recreational amounts, but he'd always been scared of the people who sold in quantity. Her father was wired for day-to-day -day survival, not grand ambitions. How much money do you owe? She asked. Thirteen grand. Oh, my God. Her gaze fell down to the playing field where the guy with the lawnmower was kneeling on the grass, tinkering with the engine. The stuff didn't sell. I was stuck owing the money. Kelsey shook her head. This wasn't about money. They carried a body bag out of the bank, Dad. What the hell happened in there? Her father didn't reply for a long time. He kept his gaze straight ahead on the skyline beyond the home run fence. Hank got killed. Kelsey felt exhaustion wash through her like a sudden summer downpour. She remembered Hank, a good guy. Did you kill him? Of course not. There were tears in Dad's eyes. But it was my fault. He had my back. Kelsey tried to keep her breathing steady. What went wrong? Nick told us the safe would be open, but we got locked out. We went to the backup plan, emptied the tills, and robbed the customers. But, but, there was this kid. His voice trailed off. A kid? She asked softly. About your age, he started saying stuff. Weird stuff. Her father looked scared, not just old and defeated, but genuinely terrified. She wished she could take his fear away, the way she could ease the worry out of a crowd. But she was never good with anything one-on-one. -on -one. Like what, Dad? He knew our names and about Nick's arrest. He knew everything. Kelsey sat there, her hands gripped in her lap, waiting for it all to make sense. Then something clicked. Did he have short hair? Like an army cut? Her dad's eyes widened. Yeah. I saw him in the diner across the street, and after it was all over, two cops brought him out of the bank like he was someone special. So you know him? What? She stared at her father. How would I know him? Because he knew you, Kelsey. He said your name. Chapter 24 Mob No way! Kelsey fell back into the smooth plastic of the stadium seat. What does this have to do with me? Her father nodded slowly, like he was trying to work it out himself. Only me, Hank, and Nick knew about the job. And we were wearing masks, but... This kid lays there on the floor with my gun in his face, talking like he knows everything. Have you told any of your friends about me? Nothing they hadn't figured out for themselves. And I didn't know anything about a bank job. Right. He rubbed at his face. And you'd never rat on your old man. For a moment, he seemed to be drifting off. Dad, Kelsey said with the sharp tone she used when he was high. What else did this kid say? He said you still miss your mom. She just stared at him. The words seemed to echo in the emptiness of the stadium. The two of them didn't talk about her mother. Ever. And right now, right after, seemed like a bad time to start. What else? Kelsey managed after a while. He was talking like Nick had set us up to get out of this drug charge a few months back. The cops let him go and nobody could figure why. And Nick only came to town this year. Nobody trusts him or his crew yet. And yet you were robbing a bank with him? I owed them money. 
Her father sounded hollowed out, defeated. But while the kid was talking, it all clicked into place. How I didn't really trust Nick, and how everything had gone wrong with the job. And then there were flashlights outside, and I knew we'd been set up. Kelsey shook her head. This wasn't her father talking. He was so easygoing. He wasn't paranoid, even when there were people out to get him. So you shot him? No, but I was yelling at Nick and I used his name in front of all those people. That's when he pointed his gun at me, but Hank had my back. It took Kelsey a moment to understand, but then a grim shiver of relief traveled down her spine. They shot each other. Her dad turned to stare at her. Of course, you didn't think I'd hurt someone, did you? Jeez, Kels. She felt a faint smile on her lips. I also never thought you'd rob a damn bank. Me neither, he sighed. And it doesn't make sense anymore, what the kids said. I mean, cops setting up a bank robbery just to get me? Kelsey nodded. If the Cambria police were aware of her father at all, he was probably in last place on their most wanted list. So Nick was the guy you owed money to? His uncle, Alexei Bagrov. Her father's gaze traveled the empty stadium. He's going to kill me. He's going to find me and kill me. Not if we get you out of town, Kelsey said. But it came out flat. Her father barely kept it together here in Cambria, where he knew everyone and most people liked him. He'd never survive in a strange city, pursued by both cops and gangsters. She glanced around the stadium. It was completely empty now, apart from the two of them. The lawnmower sat alone in the middle of the field, its engine open to the elements. She wondered if this was the last time she'd be with her dad like this. She pushed her hand into his, linking fingers and squeezing. Dad squeezed back. You gotta do me a favor, Kells. Go see Fig. He owes me a couple grand. Of course. That's enough to leave town, right? He looked away. Just find Fig. She nodded mutely, looking at her hands. Love and anger fought inside her with no outlet, no crowd to soak up what she felt. Okay, she said. How do I get in touch with you? I'll call. He put his arm around her shoulders, trying to smile. You should stay with friends for a while. The police will be looking for me at home, and so will Bagrov. Kelsey went cold, despite the summer heat swelling up from the concrete stands. Of course, if gangsters were after her dad, then they'd be after her too. She felt sick and dizzy just thinking about it. But where will you stay, Dad? I've got a few holes I can disappear into. He gave her that smile again. It was less convincing every time. Promise me you won't go home until I got a way to fix this, okay? Hope twisted in her stomach. Maybe for once he had a plan. Okay, I promise. But be careful. I'll be fine. Dad gave her a light punch to her shoulder, the way he always did when he had to leave home, like he was heading out to some poker game. When he got to his feet, Kelsey realized that she didn't want him to leave yet. She wanted to sit in the empty stadium and pretend a baseball game was going on below. That kid, he said, gazing into the middle distance. Someone must have told him exactly what to say. Someone was out to get me, Kells. She didn't disagree. Even Dad's friends spent most of the time angry at him. Which meant there was even more to worry about than the cops and the gangsters Dad owed money to. Somebody else was after them, some kid playing games with their lives. I'll talk to Fig tonight, she said. See if anyone knows anything. Her father smiled, his hand heavy on her shoulder. Thanks, Kells. Sorry, your old man's such a screw-up. She managed to smile. She didn't have the strength to argue. Chapter 25. Scam. Ethan had the distinct impression his life was getting worse. 
Not only did he have pissed-off drug dealers after him for stealing their bag of cash and their car, come to think of it, he also had a homicidal bank robber, who was on the loose now thanks to Chizara, hating him for messing up a heist. And then there were the cops wanting to grill Ethan about being buddies with said bank robber, on top of which he hadn't slept for 30-something hours. But worst of all, he had glorious leader giving him orders again and taking his bag full of cash. Hey, Scam, welcome back to the Zeros. Say, have you heard about our new fee structure? What gave Nate the right to take the money anyhow? He hadn't been driven to a creepy cottage by a guy with no neck or forced to listen to weird ramblings about doof, doof music. Glory's dickhead hadn't liberated the duffel bag from Taylor and the Craig and from bank robbers and from a police station, had he? But here was Ethan, lying across the back seat of Nate's Beamer, knees up, feet against the door, with no bag of cash to make up for the horror show of the last 12 hours. He wasn't even allowed to sit up like a normal person. Nate hadn't let them leave until Ethan was lying on the back seat, staring up at the car's ceiling and cursing the voice, forever calling his former friends for help. Nate had acted like he was doing Ethan a favor, shipping him off to a hiding place. But he only cared about their power staying secret. So why hadn't he come up with a rescue plan that didn't involve mass destruction of police property? Chizara was overkill on two legs. Ethan's mother had a saying for the petty criminals she prosecuted. All they had were hammers, so everything looked like a nail. Chizara's problem was worse. She was a chainsaw who thought she was a scalpel. No doubt the police would love to hear how Crash had nuked the CCPD and how it was all Glorious Leader's idea. The voice would give that story a righteous telling, if Ethan ever let it. He rubbed at his face, which hurt from his jaw all the way up to his ears. Too much talking and too little sleep. Too much letting the voice yank his throat and his tongue. What he needed was a week in his bedroom with a stack of movies and a ton of easy-to-chew junk food. All Ethan had wanted last night was to get home. If only he'd chosen some raver to bum a ride from, he would have been in his own bed before dawn. He'd probably still be asleep now, instead of hiding in the back of a car from a truly epic assortment of pursuers. A really comfortable car, sure, but not when you were lying across the back seat heading for... Wait, where was he heading? Wait, who was driving? Ethan lurched up, scrambling for a grip on the front passenger seat. He hauled himself into a sitting position. Who the hell was that in the driver's seat? Ethan's exhausted brain refused to click. Uh, he started. The guy turned and gave him an annoyed look. Keep your head down, will you? There's cops everywhere. Ethan flopped back onto the car seat. Of course, the guy had given him the same I hate you scam look that Nate's crew all practiced daily. So it had to be him, the guy who was hard to remember. Ethan lay there trying to keep that fact in his mind. Anonymous was driving the car. There was something freaky about it, like being taken to another dimension. Ethan had no idea where they were going or how long they'd been driving. Were they even still in Cambria? What if the guy just dumped him by the side of the road a thousand miles away? Would Nate and the others even realize Ethan was gone? Or would he drop down the same memory hole as what's-his-name? He had to focus to get this guy on his side and find out where they were going, even if his jaw already hurt like crazy. Come on, tell this guy something he wants to hear. Sorry, Tebow, the voice said. I must have dozed off. At the sound of his own name, the guy jerked around to look at Ethan. The car swerved a little, shoving Ethan headfirst into the door. His head made a thwack against the handle, the impact reverberating all the way through to his sore teeth. Whoa, said the guy, turning back to the road. Sorry, I don't drive a lot. The car straightened out. Ethan reached up to rub the top of his bruised head. Yeah, I can tell. T Ethan began, but he couldn't work out how to say the guy's name. It had sounded French or something when the voice had said it. He tried to visualize it in his head as letters. Nope. 
couldn't do it. The guy chuckled. What, can't talk without help? I can talk fine. Do you always swerve off the road when someone says your name? A shrug. I was surprised you remembered us all, but that wasn't you, was it? I'm just trying to be polite. It was hard talking to the guy, especially without eye contact. Ethan's brain kept drifting away to the building, slipping past the car windows. If you want to be polite, don't do that thing with me. No voice, okay? Happy not to. As Ethan reached up to rub his jaw again, he realized there was blue ink smudged into his palm. Right. Nate had made him write something there before they'd left. It was the guy's name. Tebow. He tried to remember his one semester of French. The boys had been great at the oral exams. The written test, not so much. Tebow. Tebow grunted. Close enough. The car slowed, rounding a corner, and then accelerated again. Ethan squirmed around behind the passenger seat, where he could keep his gaze on Tebow's profile. Even so, his eyes kept trying to slide away, like the guy was visual oil. Ethan had to keep talking, or he'd forget who the guy was again, and have another jolt of realizing he didn't know who was driving. Maybe he'd already had a whole series of mini freakouts on this ride and had forgotten them all as if the beamer's back seat was his own private hell. He racked his brain for what the voice would say in this situation. Something charming. I like your shirt, he said. The guy, Tebow, damn it, just glanced back at Ethan and rolled his eyes. Crap. How did normal people keep up this conversation thing? Listening to the voice, it always seemed to Ethan like small talk was a bunch of horseshit. Why did everyone waste so much time on it? He needed to say something real. Listen, Ethan said, then paused to check his hand. Tebow, about last summer. Are you using your voice? No. Seriously, this was like a conversation with his mother. Can't you tell by now? I can tell, Scam, but... Tebow shrugged. I just figured your voice could sound like you if it wanted. Ethan thought about this for a moment. It's not that smart. It just knows what I want and what people need to hear from me to get it. Well, what I want is for you to not use it, Tebow said. See the problem? It could try to trick me. Yeah, maybe. Ethan pressed a fist to his jaw, trying to push out some of the ache. He'd never thought about the voice pretending to be him, the real him. The thought was pretty scary, actually. I won't let it do that, okay? I promise I won't use it on you. Are you sure? You seem to lose control sometimes. Well, kind of, Ethan frowned. Wait, how do you know so much about it anyway? Tebow glanced back, smiling. I know a lot about you guys, especially you, Scam. Holy crap, do you, like, spy on us? Tebow paused a moment, then said, So what about last summer? Ethan's brain sputtered for a moment, wanting to hold on to what the guy had said just a second ago. It seemed important to remember. But the change of subject had knocked it out of his head, and he had to keep talking or completely forget what was going on. Yeah, last summer when I dissed everyone. I'm sorry about that. I don't even know what I said, but Nate was being a pain, and I got really angry. You were a jerk is what you were. Yeah, the voice. Ethan shook his head. I was a jerk, and I'm sorry. The car eased to a stop at a traffic light. Tebow turned again to look at him. Ethan tried to give him a smile. Say that again, Tebow said. I'm sorry about what I said last summer, whatever it was. Tebow was quiet a moment, still watching. You're not using your voice, he said at last, like it was a fact. Nope, this is me talking. 
and you really don't remember what you said to me? I don't remember half the stuff I say. It's like listening to the conversation at the next table, right? You can hear what they're saying, but most of it doesn't make enough sense to stick in your mind. After a moment of silence, the traffic around them began to move again, and Thibaut turned away. Sucks to be you, he said. He was right about that. Chapter 26 Anonymous In the elevator up from the parking lot, Thibaut felt Ethan's attention finally settle on him sharp and focused. Elevators were good that way, only a few square yards, nothing to look at but each other. The lobby would be the tricky part. This place is pretty fancy, Thibaut said. And you look like a hobo. Ethan glanced down at his shirt, a decent shirt, which was unusual for him, but sweaty and crumpled. I've never been inside a nice hotel. Just walk straight across the lobby. Thibaut said. Anyone looks at you funny, just remember, you belong here. Remember? Ethan asked. But isn't your superpower making people forget? Thibaut sighed. It is more complicated than that. The door slid open onto the Hotel Magnifique's spacious lobby its marble floor a shiny lake with a thick scroll-patterned carpet on the far bank. They stepped out. The uniformed staff stood in the soft glow of their screens behind reception. Thibault knew them all by name, and he was glad to see that Janessa wasn't on this shift. She was a stickler about trespassers. A couple of guests were getting checked in, and a few people lounged in the armchairs. A small group waited by the main door while the bellman Tom Creasy called for a cab out on the turnaround. No cops or anybody who looked like a drug dealer, so Ethan was safe from arrest or a beatdown, <laughs> which meant that he was really coming up to Thibault's room, invading his home. Where was a revenge-crazed drug dealer when you needed one? A few yards from the elevator, Thibault felt himself fading from Ethan's awareness. Shimmers of attention crisscrossed the open space like spiderweb threads, linking the crowd. Each group felt the flash of the other's conversations, reveled in the spark of shared laughter, but all of those simple human connections, none touched Thibaut at all. It was a seriously dick move on the part of the universe. Of everyone in this room, only he could see all those glimmers of awareness feel them in his gut and as electricity on his skin. But the glimmers never found him in return, not in any group bigger than a half dozen people. That was what made him anonymous. Ethan, on the other hand, was lit up like a disco ball. He'd become the center of his own little web, throwing out a thousand strands of nervous awareness. Feeling out of place was a great way to get noticed. The desk staff were looking now, the tendrils of their attention reaching across the lobby. They spared Thibault a glimmer of notice, which he chopped away with a flat hand. He learned as a little kid how hard it was to keep people's attention, but disappearing was always easy. He grabbed a notepad and pen from the concierge's desk, scrawled his room number, PH2, and the words, Bellwether says go here. Ethan had drifted to a halt and was staring at the lobby's giant flower and twig arrangement. Five seconds separation in the crowd, on top of all this unfamiliar luxury to gawk at, had erased any memory of Thibaut. Scam! Ethan jerked back at the sound of his code name, then managed a puzzled look. Oh, you're that guy, right? Read this, said Thibaut. Ethan took the note, saw Nate's code name. Wait, this is a training exercise? He had the sense to keep his voice low. You got it. Thibaut pushed Ethan toward the main elevator bank. The guy was still walking too slowly, staring at everything with his mouth open, radiating a strong signal of not belonging. Useless. 
To be fair, Thibault had lived in the Magnifique for three years now. He barely saw the place anymore, but back in the early days, everything had screamed money and privilege and what are you doing here, young man? Even the cool, soft light felt expensive, falling through the draped windows onto the fat leather armchairs. The giant mirrors made it hard to tell exactly how big the lobby was. It was if the luxury went cascading out into infinity around you. It was pretty cool strolling into a place like this, living here, knowing how to navigate it all, but he could see how it could be intimidating, especially if you look like you'd slept in your clothes. Just like Glorious Leader to think of every detail except lending Ethan a clean shirt. It was almost a relief when Gerard left the concierge desk and glided across the marble toward them. Thibault's first reflex was to appear out of nowhere and stage a collision. It had worked in the police station, but here it would only draw more attention, and Ethan had the voice, after all. Thibault took a step backward into anonymity. Can I help you with anything, sir? Gerard's tone was carefully neutral, but there was no mistaking it. He was ready to quietly muscle Ethan out of the place. It wasn't Ethan who answered. All at once, the nervousness slid off his face. He stood straighter, and his connection with Gerard thickened and brightened like a plasma lamp sparking toward a fingertip. My mother is here with the CADCOM conference, the voice said, confident and crack-free. I'm supposed to meet her outside the Lafayette room. The Lafayette room? Thibault had heard the voice a hundred times, but there was something extra creepy about it knowing the details of this hotel. A place he'd kept secret from the other Zeros. The place where he lived. Gerard's expression relaxed into a smile, and his arms moved in practiced gestures. Certainly. The Lafayette's on level four. Turn right off the elevator. Thank you, sir, said Ethan. A curious flicker of Gerard's attention snagged on Thibault, who chopped it away and crossed the lobby after Ethan. The guy was tensing up again, turning back into, what did Flicker call him that time? That little rat weasel. <laughs> what a pain to be visible all the time, especially when you look like Ethan, small and twitchy and crafty. Thibault had once strolled through this lobby stark naked just to see if he could. <laughs> it had been way too easy. Turned out people didn't want to see the unexpected. Escaping anonymity wasn't as simple as stripping off his clothes. Which was why keeping Ethan from wandering off was going to be tricky. Even getting him to pay attention was exhausting. As the two neared the elevators, laughter sprayed from the gilt and velvet couches in the hotel bar, a group having a few drinks before going out to hit Ivy Street. It was Friday afternoon, only a block from the nightclubs the very place where Scam had stolen that money. Thibault was going to have to keep him on a very short leash. Why had he agreed to this nightmare? Probably because at lunch, an hour ago, Glorious Leader had locked on him with that anchor rope of charm, a hundred times stronger than the wavering strands Thibault managed with anyone else. Nate could see the shimmers of human interaction in the air, but his power was the reverse of Tebos. He could amp those connections stronger, especially at a crowded table. He took the joy of a big group eating good food after a successful mission and focused it until it felt like he was the only other person in the world shining his glorious light on you. And Tebow had fallen for the attention, like he always did. That was the problem with wanting to be seen, the problem with wanting at all. Someone always used your desires to control you. He said to look at Ethan. The voice's true power was that it knew what Ethan wanted. So long as he kept wanting, he was its slave. Thibault took a deep breath. It was all a reminder of the middle way, to face the world without desires. No good came from needing Nate's attention or from fighting anonymity. Wisdom says I am nothing. He repeated the Zen proverb under his breath. The elevator came and the two stepped in together. Ethan stared at the handwritten note and then pressed the button for the penthouse floor. 
The light flickered on, off. He pressed it again. What the hell? Allow me. Tebow waved his key card. Ethan backed off, startled. He watched Tebow slot the card and press the button. It stayed lit. Hey, thanks, Ethan said, as if to a helpful stranger. But as the doors closed, his flicker of eye contact settled into something real. Oh, right, it's you. Um, he checked the name scrawled on his hand. Tebow! Thibault took a slow breath, pushing his hair behind his ears. He was really taking another person into his hideaway, his fortress, his home. And out of everyone in the entire world, it had to be this person. Oh, it was going to be a long weekend. Chapter 27 Flicker the hero of our tale has dark hair, falling just above his collar. His eyes are sharp and blue, as if he's watching something carefully, or perhaps someone. Flicker smiled, not peeking, letting her sister's voice flow over her. When Lily read from graphic novels or picture books, she always began by describing the characters. Of course, this tale had only one character and hardly any story at all. His parents are still together, it is believed, and he has two younger brothers, names unknown, but he seems to have left home three years ago, our Thibault, about the time his grandmother came to stay. They were in the attic, surrounded by the musty smell of old boxes and dust. The air was hot with late afternoon. Muffled sounds of cooking came from below. He probably lives downtown, um, judging from response times, in a hotel, some say. What is this, Riley? The threads of story fluttered away. It told you it's a file on someone. Is Nate stalking this guy? I mean, your boyfriend is kind of weird sometimes. Flicker ignored this accusation. Lily had always been jealous of Glorious Leader. Who wouldn't be? And steadfastly refused to believe that Flicker had never even really kissed him. Anon's the sky we know, Flicker said, like a friend. Nate keeps a file because we can't remember him. A friend you can't remember? Why the hell not? Same reason I know you borrowed my striped socks today, because superpowers. Now keep reading. I thought you were done with those guys after last summer. We're working it out, Flicker said. Lily was jealous of the others as well. She didn't like sharing the secret of Flicker's power. As her sister grumbled, Flicker let herself go blind again. Paper slid and shuffled on the wooden floor. Okay, Lily said. No one knows where the hero of our tale lives, but he likes to take artsy photos of brick walls and has good taste in clothes. I'm going to agree with Nate on that last one, but I wish he'd tuck his shirts in. What kind of shirts? Why don't you just look, lazy bones? I'm staring right at the photos. Flicker shook her head. Your voice will stick in my head better. If he's a character in a story, I won't forget. That's how his superpower works, I think. Does that mean I'm going to forget seeing these photos? Of course not, but if you run into Tebow tomorrow, your brain won't make any connection between him and the pictures, or something like that. If you're interested, there's a section called Theories near the end. Lily shuffled the papers again. Flicker hoped she wasn't getting the file out of order, but still didn't look. From being in the other's vision, she figured that part of Tebow's power had to do with how their eyeballs slid off him. It was as much about attention as memory. Maybe if she didn't get caught up in seeing Tebow, his invisibility wouldn't matter so much. She would get to know him instead. Her sister started reading again. The theory section was mostly random questions and strategies for recording details. That was the key, Nate believed. If you made a habit of writing down things about Thibault, 
your brain would develop the reflex of coughing up whatever scraps it had stored. But even Glorious Leader was always wondering how much he'd forgotten. Flicker sighed. All these theories were telling her more about Nate than... Damn, the name was gone again, and all she had was anonymous. Wait, she interrupted. This isn't sticking. Tell me a story, any story, as long as it has elements of him. Details from the photos or his family, whatever might jog my brain the next time he's around. Um, okay. The sound of Lily's fingers drumming on the floor came through heavy air. Does it have to be realistic? Flicker smiled. Of course not. You telling me fairy tales is pretty much the first thing I can remember. All memories are stories, kind of. A soft, huh, came from Lily, as if this was a theory she could get behind. She'd had more fictional boyfriends than most. Can I make it a love story? Lily said. Like, make him hot so he sticks in your brain? I guess. Flicker managed to keep her voice even. Don't worry, Riley. I'll keep it PG. For now. A hush fell over the attic, the sounds of cooking from downstairs fading, the tree branches settling around them. Once there was a girl named Riley, the story began. Her heart was a secret garden, its stone walls cracked and weathered, and it was hungry. Lily went on, telling a story borrowed from a dozen books and TV shows and movies. And slowly, her voice began to change. Her lips began to form the words in that old, familiar way, with the soft burr of their shared native tongue. When the twins had been little, even before Riley's power had revealed itself, it spoke in a language no one else could understand. It had been lost along the way, but sometimes the old patterns came back their R's softening in their mouths. At times, it was strong enough that people would ask if they'd overcome a speech impediment. But what they had was an accent, long buried and shared by only two people in the world. And one day, she met a boy called Nothing, who lived in a secret castle, and she began to learn his ways. Chapter 28 Anonymous Dude, this room kills. Thibaut watched from the doorway, smiling at the wide-eyed look on Ethan's face as he took in the padded leather club chairs, the wall sconces fanning light up onto the textured wallpaper, and the picture window full of ocean and late afternoon sun. I know, Thibaut said, a little ashamed. It's kind of too much. Too much? It's insane! I didn't know people this rich ever came to Cambria. They don't, usually. These penthouse rooms mostly stay empty. That's why I live up here, so the hotel doesn't lose any money. Ethan nodded slowly at the view out the picture window. For a moment, his attention seemed gone for good, but then he turned, one eyebrow lifted. Doesn't lose money. You mean you're not paying for this place? You're scamming it? Thibault blinked. Ethan had the gall to throw that word at someone else. No one else is using it, Thibault said carefully. I'm not stealing anything, just borrowing. Ethan laughed. Nice work, dude. It's so huge. The only hotel I ever stayed in. The beds took up the whole room. Where are the beds, anyway? <laughs> oh, I guess in here, right? As Ethan walked into one of the suite's bedrooms, Thibault felt himself disappear, snipped from existence by the wall between them. Ethan's voice faded into muttering as if he'd only been talking to himself all along. Thibault sighed. His ego always felt the burn, even if it was just scam for getting him. Maybe they should switch to a smaller room, but the hotel was filling up as the big 4th of July celebrations got closer, and anywhere bigger than an elevator would make him just as hard to see. You hungry? Thibaut called. That got the guy's attention. He stuck his head out, looking puzzled for a moment, but then a big grin crossed his face. 
his memory of Tebow flickering back to life. Dude. He glanced at his palm. Tebow, I mean, I could totally slay a hamburger. It had been a long time since Tebow had ordered room service. There was no way to call it borrowing. It was out-and-out -out theft. He usually lifted unsold sandwiches and salads from the deli down the street or overages from the farmer's market, but Tebow couldn't leave this room until Glorious Leader figured out the next step. Looking after Ethan was a full-time job, like having a kid. A kid with attention deficit disorder and half the city's gangsters and cops hunting him. So they'd have to make do with what was on hand. Luckily, that was a fully staffed kitchen, anxious to satisfy the guests' every whim. As they waited for the food to arrive, Ethan played with the bank of light switches by the door, the TV remote, and the electric window blinds. Then he found the mini bar. Tebow, what the hell? Why didn't you tell me about this? Um, it's kind of tricky replacing stuff from... But Ethan was already tearing open a Toblerone bar. Tebow closed his eyes and took a slow breath, practicing stillness for a moment. You didn't forget about that burger on its way, did you? He'd made Ethan watch as he logged into the hotel's network to place the order, so the fact that food was coming would stick in his mind. You said it would take half an hour, man, Ethan said with his mouth full. He strolled to the window. The ocean was glittering with the afternoon sun just visible beyond the skyline of Cambria. You must feel like you're the boss of everything, sitting up here. Not exactly, Tebow said. Was there any point explaining the middle way to this guy? If anyone needed some zen in his life, it was Ethan. But whatever Tebow told him would slip out of his head. Maybe if it was simple enough. This room isn't mine, Ethan. Neither is that view. No one owns the sunset. Ethan eyed the view, then laughed. Dude, anyone rich enough to shell out for this room totally owns the sunset. So how does your scam work? Do you just, like, turn invisible when real guests show up? Tebow stifled a laugh. No luck with Zen. Maybe superpowers would stay in Ethan's head. I'm not invisible. People just have trouble focusing on me, and they forget me when they look away, like a person walking behind you on a crowded street. You know someone's there, but you don't think about it. No kidding, hanging out with you is like having a ninja around. You're always sneaking up on me. That wouldn't happen if you focused. The last word came out sharply enough that Ethan's attention sizzled in the air, but shouting wasn't the answer. I have a system here. I keep track of the hotel bookings and move out if anyone reserves this room. So you hack their computers like when you ordered the food? I just watch and learn. When it's busy enough at the front desk, people don't notice me, even if I'm looking over their shoulders. Pretty cool. Ethan took another bite of chocolate. So you really got this place worked out, huh? Tebow shrugged and turned away, letting their connection waver. He hadn't brought Ethan up here to show off his power. The point of teaching wasn't to feed your own ego. But it was pretty cool, all his quiet observation of the staff, the protocols, the schedules. And at least his explanations were keeping Ethan focused, which made the guy less likely to wander out into the arms of hotel security. Getting a room is easy, Tebow said. The tricky part is making sure I don't cost the hotel too much or add any work for the staff. You mean you clean your own room? Ethan pulled back the chocolate bar wrapper, laughing. Chop the wood, carry the water, Tebow said, a little more zen for Ethan to forget. Seriously? You scrub the toilet just so you can pretend you aren't stealing anything. Was that the voice winding up for an attack? Tebow felt a trickle of panic, but their connection was only the scratchy grabbing of an argument, not the talon grip of the beast. This was Ethan talking. He was keeping the promise he'd made in the car. But he was still being a dick. Tebow said evenly, I don't pretend.
All you guys pretend. You call me scam, but glorious leader controls people's minds and flicker hijacks people's eyes. Even the government doesn't do that. And look at this. He flung out an arm at the magnificent sunset. You live rent-free in the sky. Crash might be a walking disaster zone, but at least she admits it when she's breaking the law. I know this is illegal. Tebow still kept his voice steady. But it's not like I can get a job, and I control the effect I have on the people who work here. Well, aren't you lucky? Ethan's sarcastic look was spoiled a little by the smear of chocolate at one corner of his mouth. All in control of your power? Me? I've had this thing talking through me my whole life, and I never know what's going to happen next. Crash, too. We've got these frickin' fire hoses, and we're just hanging on to the handles. You and Flicker and Nate have got it easy. White-hot anger flashed through Tebow. This little rat weasel thought being anonymous was easy? After what his voice had said last summer in front of the whole group? Of course, Ethan didn't remember that. If he listened to his voice, then he'd have to take some responsibility for what it said. Tebow managed to stay calm, but his throat felt tight. I don't control my power. I can't turn it off. Sure you can. We're sitting here talking, aren't we? That's because we're alone. If there were a few more people in this room, there'd be too many competing signals, too many other people to focus on. The sneer was dying out on Ethan's face. Remember down in the lobby? I could barely get you to listen to me. Ethan was listening now. All the scratchiness had gone out of their connection. So you're like Nate and Chizara, stronger in a crowd. Flicker, too. With more eyes around, she sees more. Yours is the only power that works best one-on-one. -on -one. Tebow bit back the words, you freak. Compassion was the way. Even up here, when you wander into another room, you forget me. So you can't control it at all? If I need to disappear, I can snip whatever connection there is. He made the chopping gesture across his face, holding eye contact so Ethan would feel the break but not lose him altogether. But I can't turn my power off. People always forget me in the end. Do you have any idea what that means? Ethan looked blank. He really didn't remember what he'd said last summer. Fine, let him sit there and think about what anonymity meant. It had taken Tebow 13 years to figure out. 13 years to realize that he had to leave home because trying to get his family to remember him only made it all hurt worse. Of course, even if Ethan did understand, half an hour from now, he'd lose it again. Tebow could explain ten times over how completely alone he was, but it wouldn't stick. The only other creature in the world that would ever know Tebow was the voice, that beast inside Ethan. And it didn't really know anything except as a means to further Ethan's desires. Tebow flashed back to last summer at Nate's. It's the same room they met in this afternoon. Nate had said something to piss Ethan off, and then Ethan had started venting on the others. There in the back row, Tebow had foolishly thought he was safe. There were five people in the room, usually enough to make him anonymous. But then Ethan's angry gaze crawled up and caught on him like two hooks through Tebow's face into the person behind, the one that nobody ever truly saw. Without missing a beat, the voice tore straight into that kid inside him like a hyena wrenching out chunks of flesh. It hurt, but at the same time, something inside Tebow, his younger self, always hungry for a solid connection, took a weird delight in the attack. Another person was looking into his eyes, knowing him, speaking his most private memories. It was Everything Tebow had ever wanted, to be seen, to have his inside seen, to be understood. But then the hyena's teeth had gone too deep, opening a vein of secrets Tebow didn't want to think about. Those days in the hospital when he was 13 years old, feverish, alone, thirsty, forgotten by nurses. 
by his own mother. That terrified trapped kid had hated humanity for shutting him out. That kid was still inside this other older Tebow who had found his own anonymous way within the way. And it could happen again if Ethan lost his temper and lashed out. Sharing this penthouse with him was like living with an unexploded bomb. A knock came on the door and Tebow flinched, imagining police on the other side, or angry drug dealers, or Nate with a finally found you smile on his face. Ethan had jumped as well, but now he laughed. Dude, it's just the burgers. I know. Tebow pointed at the extra bedroom. But you should hide. Why? Nobody in this hotel knows the cops are looking for me. Yeah, but if anyone sees you, they'll remember someone was in the penthouse. Me, they'll forget once I close the door. You got any cash? Ethan frowned. Doesn't it go in the room? Not really. Once I get back on the hotel network, this meal never happened. We have to tip cash or the staff gets nothing. Oh, right, Mr. Morality. Ethan laughed, handing over a 20. Whatever, lucky I kept a big wad of the Craig's money. Bellwether isn't as smart as he thinks. He disappeared into the bedroom, a swagger in his walk. It was Chuck at the door, a big guy with a smile as broad as his shoulders. Just leave it here inside the door, Tebow said, handing over the 20. Today, he didn't have time to hear for the 15th time how Chuck had played college football blowing out his knee senior year. Tebow pocketed the check, got Chuck outside, and snipped the connection just in time. As the door swung shut, Ethan came wandering out of the bedroom, looking dazed and uncertain. Who the hell are you? he said. Tebow took a slow breath. No one and everyone, buddy, just like you. My name's written on your hand, he said. Hope you're still hungry. Chapter 29, Mob You look funny, Ling yelled over the music. Never seen you jumpy in a club before. Kelsey tried to smile. She didn't know how to explain that her dad had robbed a bank and she was hiding from mobsters. And Ling didn't watch the news. Just tired, didn't make it home today, so I had to sleep at Remy's. Ling laughed. If you can call that sleeping. Hey, Remy yelled from across the table. My dorm room is five star. Kelsey had to smile at that. When she'd showed up at Remy's that afternoon saying she needed to crash, he hadn't asked any questions. He just said, Stay as long as you want. There's no food and the TV's busted. Then he'd headed out to a math study group. His bed was comfortable enough, but sleep wasn't easy. Her dad was facing life in prison, and she'd been made homeless by the threat of mobsters. At least final exams were over, and the dorm's mellow summer term buzz had watered down Kelsey's anxiety. That was why she dragged Remy and Ling to the boom room tonight. Even with her life turned upside down, Kelsey always found safety in numbers. The boom was an old-fashioned place with live music and a young crowd. It played roots, blues, soul and funk, and maybe some Tejano rock or bluegrass. It had a canopied doorway and a wide, guitar-shaped sign on the roof. No self-respecting gangster would be caught dead here in a million years. Kelsey didn't always like the music at the boom, but she trusted the crowd. Maybe it was the live music, full of feedback loops between band and audience, or maybe the folks here just knew how to have a good time. It was where Kelsey went when she needed to feel safe. It was also a good place to find Fig, who owed her dad $3,000. The boom was the first place Fig had taken Kelsey when he found out she loved dancing in a crowd. Fig was about halfway between Dad's age and hers and had somehow managed the trick of being friends with both of them. Fig was always good at steering Dad away from anything too dangerous or stupid. Kelsey was pretty sure her father hadn't asked for Fig's thoughts on the whole bank robbery idea. Fig wasn't at the boom, but at 11, he'd be bartending at Fuse next door. Until then, there was nothing to do but dance. 
Come on, fess up, Ling said a few songs later. You got a stalker or something? Kelsey shook her head, but she kept scanning the crowd, looking for that guy from the diner, the guy with the duffel bag who'd gotten inside her dad's head and made the robbery go wrong. How had he known her name? It had to be from the clubs. A stalker? Remy yelled over the music and turned to Kelsey. There's somebody you need beaten up? He flexed a bicep and Kelsey just laughed and shoved him toward the mosh pit at the front of the throwback hardcore band on stage. Three chords and three minutes per song, about a billion beats a second. She couldn't drag anyone else into this business of her dad's. They were all her friends, Remy and Mikey and Ling and a dozen others, but she'd never opened up to any of them, not one-on-one. She wasn't wired that way. Her dad had always warned her against too much trust. Trust was tricky when your life was one con after another, and she'd started helping him when she was ten years old. He'd never realized what his little girl was doing. She wasn't sure herself at first. But she knew it was real. She could nudge a poker table into a cheerful carelessness that made them bet high. She could diffuse a group's anger when they realized they'd been scammed. Dad called her his lucky charm. But that same power also tanked her school grades, because every exam was like drowning in a room full of other people's fear, no matter how hard she studied. And her power was the reason she'd never had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, not even a best friend, because crowds were always better. This close to the stage, Kelsey was bumped and jostled, knocked and pushed. But it felt good. Every time she spun around, people were smiling, mouthing the words, sorry, or my bad. She was only sorry there weren't more people banging into her. That guy in the diner had known her name, and he'd mentioned her mom. That wasn't just stalking. That was reading her mind, getting inside her head, where no one was allowed. What if he was in this room, watching her? Kelsey took the energy of the crowd and ramped it up. She unleashed all her anger and fear and channeled it out of herself. She bounced it off the people in the room, turned it into pure heat and power. The energy on the dance floor ballooned, pulling her away from everything Dad had told her, everything he'd done to ruin their lives. The music pulsed faster than any heartbeat, as fast as nervous twitches or neurons firing. Kelsey slipped into the center, becoming one with it and all the bodies around her. She shut her eyes and danced it out, teased and bumped and shook to the beat and the power of the mob. She hadn't felt safe all day, ever since she'd seen Dad in that blue car by the bank. But she was safe here, in the heart of this storm. A roar went up and she opened her eyes. A reedy guy in jeans and no shirt teetered at the edge of the stage. A hundred hands reached up, and he jumped, then drifted across the room on a surface of sweaty palms. There was a sudden focus in the crowd, all their energy surging up through that one body held aloft like a sacrifice. Kelsey sent her anxiety into that buoyant hub of sweat and muscle and pushed. The guy soared now, carried by the crowd and Kelsey's will. She shut her eyes, sensing his passage through the fingertips of the crowd. She pulled him in a circle, a rock and a sling, faster and faster as the music built toward the climax of another three-minute song. Jesus, she heard Ling say and opened her eyes. The guy slid frictionlessly, as if those sweaty palms beneath him were ice. His face was pale, his mouth open, and the scream lost in the music. Oh, God, Kelsey said, and her grip on the crowd sputtered. The guy slipped among the outstretched arms, crashing to the floor at speed. The song came to a sudden end, one of those hardcore stops like someone had stabbed the mute button. The guy stumbled out of the crowd, bleeding and astonished. Kelsey ran after him. Detached from the surrounding buzz, she felt all her anxiety tumbling back down on her. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, she kept saying. By the time they reached him, he was throwing up in the corner. The people around him were in retreat, laughing or horrified, no longer united by the strange power of Kelsey's magic. 
Ling was right beside him, her hand on his gleaming back. Dude, you okay? The guy wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. As he turned to look up at Ling, Kelsey spotted the exact moment when he saw how beautiful she was. I'm good, he managed. How's it going? That was boys for you, whenever they saw Ling. It looked like all he had was a nosebleed. Kelsey felt her relief echo in the crowd around her. A barback had already started mopping up the vomit. Ling said, I'll get him some water. Want a drink? Kelsey shook her head. Drinking only made her sleepy, and she didn't need to sleep. She needed to be up. Just maybe not as up as she'd been a minute ago. Sorry about that, she said to the guy. Glad you're okay. He looked at her blankly. That was the thing about not trusting anyone. Nobody knew this was all her fault. And that moment of focus while he'd surfed the crowd? That had been amazing. She'd forgotten everything that scared her. Kelsey needed strength tonight, and this was definitely the place to get it. She just had to be more careful. The guy was climbing back to his feet, already twitching to get on the dance floor again. So as the first note of the next song struck, Kelsey took a deep breath and threw herself back into the crowd. She took its energy and pushed higher, keeping the dancers banging. Her anger and fear was slowly turning into something clear and hard, like ashes crushed into a diamond. Sometimes the effort gave Kelsey head spins and she stumbled and fell. But somebody caught her. Somebody always caught her. Maybe she could get through this. She just needed to find her crowd. Chapter 30. Scam. Prepare to die, Ethan cried, leaning forward on the couch, his thumbs flying across the controller. He was back in the gold palace at last, one boss fight away from the transmog apple. The Grand Vizier began his endless entrance speech. Ethan skipped past it, then launched a fusillade of missiles and spells. The battle was fast and furious. The Vizier's lightning versus Ethan's fire. Blue magic versus red. But Ethan was supreme at this game. Not the greatest boss fight ever, pure thumb twitch, but satisfying. Ethan still couldn't believe his luck that this hotel room had Red Scepter 3. But then something weird happened. That little elf, the annoying one from a few scenes back, showed up in the throne room and started pinging away with his bow. Before Ethan could react, two vampire arrows were sunk in his back, each of them leeching a life point every second. What? Wait. He tried to spin and return fire, but the vizier was still spitting out lightning. And suddenly, Ethan was dead. The next arrow whistled through his fading form and struck the weakened Grand Vizier who crapped it on the spot. And the little elf went dancing past their corpses to grab the transmog apple. No way! What was wrong with this hotel game system? Non-player characters weren't supposed to win. And it reset itself to expert mode again. Ethan went to the startup menu, but it wasn't set to expert. It was in two-player mode. What the? Owned again, came a voice from beside him. Exact same spot. Ethan jumped halfway off the couch, astonished to find someone sitting right next to him. Adrenaline shot through his system, all his game world anxiety exploding into reality. It was that guy. Again. There was something Ethan was supposed to do now. A joystick fighting move baked into his reflexes. He glanced at his hand. A name was written there. Tebow! It came rushing back. You cheated, man! Not hardly, Tebow laughed. He was pale with dark hair and intense blue eyes. He looked more familiar every second. But I thought you were some random elf! As he said the words, Ethan realized that this had all happened before. Every time he sank too far into the game, his awareness of the world around him faded, along with his awareness of his opponent. 
Them's the rules. Tebow held out a piece of hotel stationery. Written on it was an agreement in Ethan's own handwriting. Tebow scored a point every time his wussy elf got the transmogrification apple, even if Ethan forgot what was going on. At the bottom was the score. Seven to zero. This game sucks, Ethan said. Then he remembered the rest of it. He was being pursued by the cops, the Craig, and a deranged bank robber, on top of which he was staying in this luxury hotel room illegally. He looked nervously at the door. Crap. Was I too loud? No one's staying on this floor but us. Thibaut shrugged, put down his controller. But, yeah, maybe we should hit the sack. It's almost eleven. Eleven? Ethan looked up at the clock on the kitchenette wall. At night? The last thing he remembered was eating a burger that afternoon. What if living with Tebow is giving him brain damage? All those slices of time being snipped out? And then it hit him. Damn, it's been over 24 hours since I talked to my mom. She's going to kill me if I don't call her. Let me your phone. She Zara nuked mine. Mine too. Tebow said tiredly, like they'd already had this conversation. I was there, remember? Right, then I'll use the... Ethan turned to the table next to the couch. The big plastic handset of the hotel phone was there, covered with buttons for room service and laundry, and also with a note. Don't use the phone. Bellwether. What? Ethan asked. Why the hell not? Tebow sighed again. Have you forgotten that bad people are looking for you? No, but my mom must be too. It's been a whole day. She's going to panic and call the cops. She is the cops, Ethan. She can get a call traced, and you're wanted as a material witness, so no calls from here. Okay, okay. Ethan stood up and headed for the door. I'll go down to the street and borrow someone's. On the door was another note. Stay in this room until further notice. Bellwether. Ethan rubbed at his scalp. Why are there notes from Nate everywhere? Because you keep forgetting that I exist. Tebow came around in front of him, staying in his view, keeping between him and the door. You have to stay out of sight. The cops want you, and so does that dealer you stole the money from. We're only a block from Ivy Street, where this all started. Yeah, but I'm wearing different clothes. Ethan wondered if this was true and looked down. Yep, some part of him had remembered Tebow lending him a shirt. A really nice one. I may not be as invisible as you, but my face doesn't exactly stick in people's minds, you know? Still not a good idea, Ethan. If you want, I can go down and borrow a phone to call her, but you stay here. Right. My mom's gonna love that, some stranger phoning her saying, I've got your kid, lady. Trust me, he's okay, but he can't talk to you. Tebow frowned. Maybe not my best plan, but you can't leave this room. The last time the cops picked you up, we had to vaporize every computer in the CCPD to get you out. Ethan swore. The whole insane rescue plan hadn't been his idea. Just let me leave a message for her. With everything that happened at the police station today, she won't even be home. Tomorrow morning, Tebow said, when angry drug dealers are all in bed. Ethan groaned. Tomorrow was too late. It was too late already. If his sister Jess found out he disappeared for a whole day, she'd kick his ass all the way from Afghanistan. There was an itch in his throat, the voice ready with some devastating insult to paralyze Tebow where he stood. The guy might think he was Mr. Zen, but the voice always knew how to crumple anyone with even a sliver of self-doubt. Don't you dare. Tebow said. Ethan swallowed hard, forcing the voice all the way back down his throat. Relax, I promised you I wouldn't. I can call her tomorrow. Tebow didn't move. 
Are you sure? Yeah, I just need some sleep. Tebow nodded. I guess we both do. Ethan managed a tired smile. His throat felt like he'd swallowed a paperweight, but at least he'd kept his promise to Tebow. The voice had done enough damage today. Plus, Ethan had a better idea. He said goodnight and headed toward the door to the suite's smaller bedroom, repeating his plan to himself again and again. He broke it down to a series of actions, nothing to do with that guy or anyone, really. It was just a list of things he had to do. Ethan went into his bathroom and drank one glass of water after another until he was certain that his bladder would wake him up in a couple of hours. And before crawling into bed, he took a pen from his bedside table and wrote on the notepad, Go down to the street and call mom. Be as quiet as you can. Ignore the fucking notes. Chapter 31 Mob Fig was always easy to spot. He was barely five feet tall and wore a white t-shirt that glowed blue and fused as lights. He ate only protein and worked out two hours every day. Kelsey gave him a brief wave as she approached the bar. She still sizzled from the boom like she could fly across the crowd herself. The music here was sharper, a fierce stab of electronica with a thudding undertow of drum. Kelsey felt it in the soles of her feet and in the hollow cavity of her chest. But the sight of Fig's expression brought her back to reality. Her dad was in trouble, and so was she. Kelsey. Fig shook his head, lips pursed. How you doing, kid? She climbed onto an empty bar stool and pushed up from the bottom rung. Not so good. Fig picked up a glass and started polishing. His deep voice cut through the music. What a train wreck. Cops everywhere looking for the guy who escaped. Your dad okay? Kelsey settled back onto the bar stool and nodded, not wanting to shout. I saw him, she mouthed. Fig's expression stilled. Years of working in Fuse had made him an expert lip reader. He scanned the room, then he put the glass down and gestured her toward a door at the end of the bar. Kelsey followed him into a cramped, badly lit hallway. The flimsy walls shivered with the music. Saw the news in the gym, Fig said. Your dad's photo came up. I almost face-planted on the treadmill. You know he was planning this? Of course not. Ain't that some crazy shit? Fig shook her shoulder. I would have broke his arm to stop him. Kelsey nodded, unable to talk. Here in this empty hallway, away from the safety of the crowd, her dread was an icicle in her chest. And that computer thing at the police station, Fig said. So much weird today. Yeah. Kelsey glanced at the closed doors in the hallway, hoping no one was listening. His bar jobs might have made Fig good at lip reading, but his hearing was terrible. His voice boomed even when he was whispering. Is there somewhere? Fig led her into a crowded storeroom packed with beer kegs and shelves of stacked glasses, piles of ledgers, and receipts. At the far end of the room was a desk. A big guy sat there with his back to them, counting money into a bag. Don't mind him, Fig whispered loudly. There's nothing he hasn't heard before. Okay, Kelsey let out a breath. My dad needs that money you owe him. I'll bet. I was sort of holding it for him. Until he got out from under with the bag robs. The guy at the desk stiffened, still with his back to them. Those shitheads! Fig didn't seem to notice. Your dad hasn't told you any of this, I guess. Kelsey shook her head. Not till today. New in town, into drugs, gambling, the whole deal really ticked off the local establishment. He glanced toward the guy at the desk, who Kelsey figured was part of the local establishment. She'd always known that side of the dance scene. She could tell when a new drug came to town. It changed the flavor of the crowd, made it light and airy or hard and mean. Chemicals had never been her thing. It must have shown on her face because Fig gave her a half smile and said, Not all of us are naturals like you. Some of us need that extra oomph. 
I'm not judging. She held up both hands. Can we stay on topic? Sorry, your dad always talked about moving up. Fig looked disgusted. But the stuff the Bagrovs got him selling, worst drugs on the street. Kelsey felt the last strand connecting her to the feel-good dance crowd snapping. Heroin? I wish stuff's called crocodile dissolves your body. Wait, what? Kelsey glanced at the guy at the desk. He was still counting cash as if they weren't there, totally focused. It's made from acid, Fig said. Like literally. Your skin rots away where you inject it. You're walking around and people can see your bones. Then your liver gives up. That sounds crazy, Fig. Like something they'd make up to scare kids. I seen it happen. Kelsey felt herself breathing harder. My dad would never sell anything that bad. Fig shrugged. Probably didn't know what he was getting into. The Bagrovs aren't exactly known for long-term relationships, you know? Can't settle too long with a product that kills people. That's why they came to Cambria. They needed new customers. And new employees like her dad, Kelsey realized. Disposable people to do their dirty work. I can't believe he'd do something that stupid, she said. Yeah, Fig said sadly. But didn't he rob a bank today? Kelsey stared at the floor. Sure, her dad had been running cons as long as she could remember. But she could have sworn blind that he would never rob a bank or kill anyone. With a shotgun or a needle. Listen, Kelsey, I can get you that three grand tomorrow. If you need a place to stay, you're welcome at mine. I'm staying with friends, she said, and Fig frowned protectively. She gave him a grateful smile. But maybe. Depends how long before I can go home, I guess. Things will get back to normal. In the meantime, if you need anything. There's one other weird thing, Kelsey said, that maybe you know about. My dad said there was a kid in the bank my age. He knew all their names like he was waiting for them there. No way, Fig shook his head. That job was tight. Everybody was shocked when the news hit. But the guy at the desk, the other guy in the room, had frozen. A $50 bill was in his hand, clutched so tight his fingers had turned white. Slowly, he swiveled in his chair and fixed Kelsey with a piercing blue stare. Did you say kid? The man asked. At the bank? Yeah. The guy became perfectly still. It was uncanny because she could have sworn he hadn't been moving anyhow. But then he must have stopped moving some more. Maybe he'd stopped breathing. Then he rose to his feet slowly, like it took a huge effort to lift his body. He squeezed through the storeroom toward them, turning sideways so he could fit his shoulders between the shelves and the kegs. Kelsey backed as far as the narrow space would allow her. It was like watching a truck coming right at her on the emptiest street in the world. Even with Fig next to her, Kelsey felt her fear building, flowing out and into the crowd down the hallway. She felt it swirling into the people listening to the synthesized rattle and hum that shook the shelves to either side of the advancing wall of flesh. Craig, Fig said. This is my good friend Kelsey. Craig ignored him. You know that kid? The one from the video? The video? Kelsey turned blankly toward Fig and then back to Craig. No one spoke. It had been a really confusing day already, so she took it slow. She made sure to speak very carefully because she didn't want to miss any details about this guy who'd screwed up her dad's life. Um, Craig? That's me, he replied. And I'm asking. Do you know the kid in the bank video? Kelsey took a breath. What video? Chapter 32, Anonymous. Tebow was going to die in this hospital. He'd known it as soon as they'd put him in this crowded children's ward. His connection with mom was fading fast. Don't leave me. He wept from his bed. Don't go away. 
I've got your brothers to get off to school tomorrow, she said, already looking at the door. It's their first day back. There are too many people here. He knew he'd disappear. He'd explained it to her so many times, but she never remembered. The nurses will take care of you, honey. His mother bent and kissed him and tried to pull away. He grabbed her arm and hung on for dear life. You'll forget me. That's just the fever talking. You'll be home again in a day or two, Thibaut. We'll visit you tomorrow. You won't. A passing nurse paused, stared at them both. You're a big boy to be acting like this, aren't you? Embarrassed, Thibaut had let go of his mother's arm. She'd left the ward without looking back. And of course, she hadn't come back. The fever got worse. Three days later, his mouth felt like it was made of parched flannel. Mid-morning had been the last time he'd had a drink. when The doctor had made his rounds and kicked up a fuss about how dehydrated Thibaut was. Three patients had just been discharged, so for a while the ward had been empty enough for Thibaut to be noticed. But then, after that wonderful blue plastic cup of water, after that sad little hospital meal, which he could have eaten three of, after that nurse patting him and telling him not to cry and going to find him a treat and never coming back, those beds had filled up, and he'd been forgotten again. He was going to die here. He had a little alarm button, but every time he called the nurse with it, she'd walk straight past him. Or hear him beg for water and walk away nodding, but never bring it. Five minutes later, he'd be calling out, You forgot me! As she whisked past, carrying someone else's bag of saline or pain pills for that whiny kid near the window. His voice was fading as thirst cracked his lips. Soon, no one would hear him at all. Thirteen years old, and he was going to die. Maybe then his power would fade, and the staff would notice his corpse at last. Now, four years later, he stared at the ceiling of the penthouse suite of the Hotel Magnifique, recalling the moment when he'd realized, through the muddle of fever, that he was on his own, not just there in that children's ward fighting to crawl to the bathroom for a long drink from the tap, but everywhere and forever. He knew then that he had to have a plan. A plan for getting well without help from the nurses and doctors. A plan for getting home. And a plan, eventually, for leaving home to cope with what he was. He needed control over his own space and his own mind. And when he got it, Thibaut told himself, his teeth chattering in a chill between flushes of fever, he would always see what was going on around him. He would never be blind like those nurses and doctors walking past. A small sound shook him from his thoughts, a rustle from the next room. Tebow sat up, groggy and dry-throated, grabbing for the bedside table. He still couldn't sleep without a glass of water within reach. Another sound, a familiar click, the penthouse door closing. Thibaut bolted out of bed and into the main room. The note on the door had been unstuck and dropped onto the floor. He wasted precious seconds checking the other bedroom. By the time he looked into the hall, the elevator doors were closing. Rat weasel, he said softly, his voice still dry. Five minutes later, Thibaut was out on the street in a Hotel Magnifique bathrobe. He would have lost too much time putting on pants or even shoes. It was Friday night, only a few blocks from Ivy, and even this late, the street was full of people, electric with their wanting. They wanted to get drunk, to get laid, to be seen. They wanted to be wanted. Needles of curiosity flicked across him. People's eyes caught for a moment by the barefoot guy in the plush white bathrobe. But Thibault kept his mantra going in a steady murmur. Form is void and void is form. Nothing to see here, folks. Cutting away people's notice as quickly as it formed. Down the street at the intersection with Ivy, a pair of cops scanned the crowd. Awareness crackled out of them. The police were still on alert, of course, looking for the prisoners who'd escaped. 
Thibault quickened his pace. It took an endless, awful minute to find Ethan. He was in among the Ivy Street crowds, walking up to a group of women in sparkly dresses and five-inch heels. Thibault didn't intervene. He might as well let Ethan get this done. The guy had the voice, so it wouldn't take long to wangle a phone and reassure his mom. As soon as he did, Thibault would yank him back to the Magnifique. Um, you guys? Ethan was sputtering. I mean, girls, could I, like... The girls just laughed, gliding around him in that practiced way women avoided drunk and obnoxious men. Seriously, Thibault muttered. Why hadn't Ethan used the voice? Had he decided to grow a conscience now, of all times? But then one of the girls turned back. She snapped a picture of Ethan with her phone and whispered something to her friends. Thibault sidled a little closer to them. Was that him? One said, which was weird, but Thibault couldn't leave Ethan to follow it up. The guy was already approaching a straight couple walking arm in arm. Use the voice, you idiot, Thibault thought as hard as he could. Ethan did. His whole posture changed. Hey, if you let me borrow your phone for two seconds, you can take a selfie with me. The couple stopped, stared at him. He gave them a cool, radiant smile. Yeah, it's me, all right, the guy in the bank video. Seriously, give me one minute with your phone and we can do a selfie. Oh, man, it is you. Sure, I guess, the guy said with a laugh and handed over his phone. What the hell was going on? A couple whispered to each other as Ethan turned back into Ethan, dialing and sputtering into the phone. Hey, I'm staying with a friend, this guy T. Lives real close to the center of town, so I'm, you know, I'm gonna crash here, but I busted my phone, so you won't be able to reach me. Spit it out. Thibault scanned the street. Was that skinny guy staring at Ethan? Did he look like a vengeful drug dealer? Okay, let's do this. Ethan had turned back to the couple, full of the voice again, beaming like a celebrity greeting his fans. He stood between the two while they snapped half a dozen photos from arm's length. The moment they lowered the phone, Thibault stepped up and grabbed Ethan. Come on, man, you know you shouldn't be out here. What the hell? said the woman, all three of them staring at the madman in a bathrobe who'd come out of nowhere. But a gleam of guilty recognition soon dawned in Ethan's eyes. Oh, yeah, sorry, er, Thibaut, I forgot. Thibaut didn't answer, just dragged Ethan back toward the Magnifique. Whatever had happened, whatever this video was about, he was pretty sure the whole situation had just gotten much, much worse. Chapter 33, Crash When she woke up the next morning, it took a moment for Chizara to remember. At first, all she knew was bliss. She'd slept hard and deep, untroubled by her parents' feeble Wi-Fi network. The yards were big out here in suburban Cambria, and the nettlesome fingertips of the neighbor's devices hardly reached her room at all. For once, all those itches were well and truly scratched. She stretched like a cat, feeling lazy strength in every limb. And then, mid-stretch, she remembered that humongous power that had reared up and taken hold of her yesterday. It had opened the cell doors. Those criminals were back on the streets because of her. And what other systems had it messed up? Calls to 911, officers needing backup. She could only imagine. All that data gone to confetti. Who knew how many investigations she'd ruined, how many more criminals would go free because of her? Sure, the systems at CCPD had been garbage, cludged together from a dozen different generations of tech. That mess had deserved to be torn down, but it should have been backed up first. And Chizara had destroyed it all without warning. 
she had released the thing inside her instead of keeping it caged. Lying there, she wondered if this was how Scam felt every morning. The thought made her need a shower. She jumped out of bed, snatched up her robe, and swept along the hall to the bathroom. One of her brothers was in there, humming and dressing. She knocked. People gotta work. People gotta play ball, too. Ekam's voice came through the door. Ekamafuna. Zara. She rattled the handle it gave, and she opened the door a slit. Go away, or I might tell Mom what you got up to yesterday. Another jolt of guilt went through her. Working all morning, lunch with my friends. Ecam laughed. Oh, yeah, all that badness at the police station sure looked like it had your superpower stink all over it. Nothing to do with me. This was what she would say if the police came here asking. Not that they'd have any reason to think a 16-year-old schoolgirl had erased an entire building's worth of data. But even if they did, how could anyone prove it? You couldn't go to jail for witchcraft here in America. They didn't even believe in Juju. Ekam was smiling. Can you say that to Mom's face when she's giving you the look? Sure can. Now shoo! Chizara sang, bustling inside, reaching into the shower stall and turning on the tap. I have my robe off. Nightgown's next. No! Ecam darted out, slamming the door behind him. It burns! It burns! He cried as he ran away down the hall. Chizara stood with the hot water streaming down her back, her head kinked forward to keep her hair dry, trying to recapture that enormous peace she'd felt yesterday at the station, that glorious quiet while everyone panicked and shouted around her. It had been even better than out in the wilderness, where the emptiness was so huge and complete it was scary. One murmurless mountain, one silent tract of forest after another, empty of technology. Buildings full of babbling tech pained her, but complete silence in her mind also freaked her out a little. She got out of the shower and wiped the mist off the mirror. She looked untroubled, almost smiling. The shower had washed away all her guilty thoughts, and her bones were purring. She hid her blissed-out expression in a towel, scrubbing her face dry. She had to make amends, but her only income was from repairing toasters. How could she fix everything she'd broken yesterday? Morning, Mom. Good morning, Chizara. Mom's glance above the Cambria Herald was distinctly suspicious. Her other brother, Obina, straightened from closing the dishwasher. Chizara quickly hugged him in passing just to annoy him, and he cried out as if her arms were branding irons, dodged around her, and fled upstairs. Ecam threw Chizara a smug look and followed. All this craziness down at the police station yesterday, Mom said. What happened exactly? Not daring to glance at the headlines and photos, Chizara focused on getting her cereal down off the shelf. She and her brothers liked a normal American breakfast, not pap and fried plantain like her parents ate. Escaped prisoners, terrorists, everything breaking down, all those computer systems? Chizara turned from the fridge and met her mom's unwavering gaze. What are you saying, Mom? What do you think I'm saying, Chizara Adaora Okeke? Where were you yesterday when this complete network failure happened? At the shop, putting CD players back together. She turned away to sprinkle cereal into her bowl. And then I was at Nate's for lunch with Fli um Riley and everyone. So you're all friends again? What a coincidence. Why would we want to mess with the police station? What good would that do anyone? Though it sure felt like it had done Chizara some good. Enough talk, girl. Show me that phone of yours. My phone? Chizara felt sick. The phone was in her back pocket to take to Bob and ask if he could help her fix it. What for? 
I'm not a fool. Every time you misbehave, you buy a new phone. She reached across the table, snapping her fingers. Chizara stalled, making a show of pouring milk into her bowl. She could feel the insides of the dead, cold device where the tidal wave of power had melted silicon, warped metal, and scrambled memory. It was like a bomb site in there, all that intricate electronic filigree torn and tangled. Now, Chizara. Reaching into her back pocket, Chizara wondered if dropping the phone would convincingly shatter it. But then the happy purring in her bones heightened to a sharp thrill. In the second it took her mother to find the power button, a little zot went through Chizara's guts. Quite unlike the letting go feeling of crashing something, it was more like puzzle pieces snapping together. The phone gave itself a shake and came to its senses. She could feel everything inside it smoothed and straightened as good as new, all the connections knitted together the way they should be. As the screen lit up, the skin on her arms, face, and chest started to itch. The phone sang its startup song and reached out its eager Wi-Fi for a signal, like it was sharing a joke with her, stepping in to save her. But she'd done this herself. She'd uncrashed it. Mom's face relaxed with surprise, and she handed the phone back. The factory settings boot-up screen appeared. Chizara's wallpaper had been erased along with the rest of her data, but Mom wouldn't notice that. Chizara held her expression steady as the phone squealed and throbbed against her consciousness. If it wasn't you, maybe your friends. Mom was giving her the look, shaking the newspaper at her. She hardly trusted Chizara to restrain her power. A gaggle of spoiled white American teenagers had no chance of self-control. Obina had once described Mom's look. She just like injects some kind of truth drug in through your eyes. But Chizara held strong. They had nothing to do with this, she said, not too fast, but without any guilty delay either, and with a solemn, honest face born of awe at this jolt of new power. Are you sure this wasn't Nate's doing, or that girl Riley? If you know anything, we should go straight to the authorities. The thought of her mother talking to the police forced Chizara to sit down. Would someone in the station remember an unfamiliar cleaner wandering the halls that day? They have different powers, Chizara mumbled and started to crunch on her cereal. Nothing to do with computers. After an endless pause, her mother went from looking straight into Chizara's soul to frowning back at the newspaper. You have to fix it. Since Chizara was five years old, Mom had been saying that. Once she'd admitted to herself what her daughter could do. You've got to be responsible about what's inside you. If you hurt anyone, whether you mean to or not, Chizara, you've got to find some way to make it right. Settle with your conscience. Little Chizara had nodded sulkily. Square things with the people whose stuff you break. Every time, girl, do you hear me? Now maybe she could square things. Could she uncrash everything she'd broken yesterday? It was worth a try. She got up and rinsed her bowl and spoon, put them in the dishwasher. She kissed her mom on the top of her head as she passed. Her bones were humming again, wanting to fix something. You're my good girl, mom called out as she left the kitchen. I'm your good girl. Chizara was better than ever this morning. She couldn't wait to see how damn good she was. Chapter 34 Crash Chizara plugged her phone into her laptop to restore her blasted data. Over the text squeal, she listened as Obina and Ekam's friends arrived and her brother shouted goodbye to mom. Then she stole into their room. In the bottom of their wardrobe were boxes full of outgrown toys, out-of-season sports equipment. Chizara rummaged right to the bottom of one box, then another. Finally, from the third, she dug out the old handheld gaming console. She found the right kind of batteries in the charger on top of Obina's dresser, took everything back to her room, and closed her door. Staring at the lifeless console, 
Chizara flashed back to the endless blooping, bleeping, rat-tat-tat that had spilled from its speakers. But worse had been the chatter of its antenna, the pulsing search and grab of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as it interacted with other consoles. Day and night it had sandpapered the ends of Chizara's nerves. She'd struck while Ecam wasn't actually playing it so no one would suspect her. It was her subtlest bit of work up to that point, just frazzling that one chip. And oh, the relief. Guy at the shop says is toast, Ecam had said the next day. By that time, she started to feel guilty watching him drag the little plastic corpse out of his backpack, actual tears creeping down his cheeks. That time she'd fail the confrontation with Mom's look. Guess you'd better find someone to fix it, Mom had said. And that's when she'd walked into Bob's restful, low-tech shop for the first time. He'd opened up the console and explained its workings to her, pointing out why it couldn't be rescued. And she'd seen the way forward. She could learn a bunch of stuff she needed to know from this guy and, at the same time, make it up to Ecam. Once Bob saw that she was serious and started paying her, her first two paychecks bought Ecam that bike he'd had his eye on. So much healthier than a new game, Mom, she'd said. Mom had given her the side eye, but had to admit she was right. Now, here in her room, Chizara sat down and took a deep breath. Had the phone thing at breakfast been a fluke? She turned on the game console. For an instant, its insides flashed but the light died as soon as the juice hit that tangled mess of circuitry. Wow, Chizara had thought she'd only hit the processor chip, but that was a year ago. She'd been a lot clumsier then. The strange feeling came again, that pulse in her guts, just like with fixing the phone. Her mind smoothed and combed everything straight. It worked at a microscopic level, calculating which particles to move and where. How did it know that? A month ago, she'd needed Bob to remind her whether a positive terminal was red or black. But she could see it now, the circuits, the way they should be. The map was there in her head already, as if all those pinpricks and itches and pains from E-things and I-things had been teaching her something all along. A moment after she saw it, the circuit was whole again, the startup fanfare playing. That tinny music had once made her cringe and weep, but now she glowed along with the microchip. The screen flickered and the silver logo popped up and started to spin. She'd really uncrashed it. The game's home screen arrived with its awful little zombies. Ecam had been crazy about those zombies. He would imitate their chilling screams as they attacked. Dazedly, Chizara watched the tutorial unfold sitting back and covering one eye as the itching Wi-Fi fingers clawed the air. But she was crash. It was her job to break things. The only fixing she ever did was the manual kind that anyone could do, the rewiring, soldering, replacing, screwing back together kind. She turned the game off, took it back to the boys' room, and left it on Ecam's desk. She got her backpack together for work, went down to the kitchen, and put some plantain and some leftover jollof rice into a microwave container for lunch. Enough for Bob, too, to make up for abandoning him yesterday. Mom was upstairs getting ready for her work up at the Igbo Community Center. Dad was in the laundry, humming as he clanked through his toolbox. Chizara still felt wonderful, even if the newspapers were calling her a terrorist. Her mind kept throwing accusations at her about the criminals at large, about all the other damage she'd done yesterday. But her body felt light and agile and strong, rested and ready for anything. This uncrashing business seemed right somehow. It balanced out yesterday's big destructive storm. She hoped Bob would have something complicated for her to repair today. But how would she explain it to him if she willed a laptop back to life? Luck? The weather? The general flakiness of modern technology? Maybe she could just say it out loud. It's my superpower, Bob. And then she'd shrug, and he'd laugh, not believing her for a second. Goodbye, Mom. Goodbye, Dad. Chizara called, and her parents' farewells floated out the front door after her.
into the fresh summer morning. Chapter 35 Anonymous Ethan sat hunched over his room service breakfast watching the video again. Had the poor guy slept at all, Tebow wondered, or just sat there all night clicking play again and again. One viewing had been enough for Tebow. When they'd gotten back to the penthouse last night, a search on Guy in the Bank video had gone straight to a pink jewel-encrusted blog called Sonia Sonic. Ethan's face was right at the top, blurry, cheek to the floor, eyes rolling up into a blink, mouth open. He looked like a zombie, a really easy-to-recognize zombie. And when you clicked play, it got much worse. But the cops took her phone, Ethan said for about the hundredth time, and Chizara crashed it. She sent herself the video or it backed up to the cloud, Tebow said also for the hundredth time. Was Ethan forgetting everything again or was the guy in shock? A quarter million hits now, Ethan said in a pinched voice like he was having trouble breathing. Every time he refreshed the screen, the video's view count jumped. It wasn't every day the internet got to see an amateur video of a bank robbery in progress especially one showing a random customer messing with the robber's heads. Listen, Jerry, I like you. Ethan's voice came from the laptop speakers, as cocky as the three-card Monty artist turning over a wrong choice. You just want what's best for Kelsey, after all. No wonder a bullet started flying. Tebow carved out a spoonful of honeydew melon but didn't eat it. His stomach was too jumpy. Must have freaked poor Jerry out hearing his daughter's name. Poor Jerry, Ethan cried. What about poor me, the guy with the gun in his face? If you were so scared, why start talking at all? Ethan tore his eyes from the screen. To save that girl Sonia, she had some stupid ring and she wasn't going to give it to the robbers. He was going to shoot her, T. Tebow stared at him. That's what you're going with. You were saving a damsel in distress? Well, there was also... Ethan mumbled the rest into a forkful of home fries. Sorry, missed that. Jerry asked about my duffel bag. Tebow sighed. It figured. For something as meaningless as money, Ethan had managed to get his face in front of a quarter million people, all of whom could help track him down. By now, every cop in Cambria must have seen that video, not to mention Ethan's drug-dealing buddies. And what about Jerry and his gang? They'd be busting heads to find out how some kid knew their names. Guess your mom is now officially the least of your worries. Don't remind me, that message I left last night isn't going to keep her calm, not after she sees this. Ethan stood up and started pacing, feet crunching over spilled corn chips. It occurred to Tebow that they should clean the room soon, maybe even vacate. Someone had booked the penthouse for the 4th of July, less than a week away. The Magnifique had a great view of the fireworks and of the doomed Parker Hamilton Hotel down the street. He and Ethan might have to move to another hotel. And by the time they hit the street, another million people would know what Ethan looked like. Tebow was tempted to use the manager's password and lose that reservation. But that would not only screw the hotel, but also some poor, well, rich, traveler. He'd also gotten an email while he was online from Flickr, which was a first. No text, just the subject line. How's it going with the weasel wrangling? Tebow grinned to himself as he tidied up, wondering exactly how to reply. Something short and witty, or should he tell her about all the crazy on the street the night before, or ask if she'd seen the bank video? Of course, she'd probably already forgotten she'd written him. It was weird with Flicker. Her awareness wasn't like anyone else's. The visual connection didn't come from her. It bounced through other people's eyes and Tebow could always feel the tickle of her listening to his footsteps or her questing awareness of his scent. He could never quite bring himself to snip off her attention. 
about to deposit the biggest bag of money I've ever seen, and I start talking to some girl, Ethan muttered, kicking at chip fragments on the floor. Just because she had that cute haircut, like I care about Patty Lowe. I should get my mouth sewn shut. Tebow piled the plates on the room service tray. Too late for that. A bright spike of attention hit him from Ethan's narrowed eyes. One way to heat up a connection was to bug the hell out of someone. Tebow had always teased his little brothers to keep them focused. Thanks for your positive feedback, T. I'm serious. Tebow wiped his fingers on a napkin and added it to the pile. Well, not about needle and thread, but sooner or later you'll have to control your voice. Ethan stopped pacing. Easy for you to say. You and Nate and Flicker all have powers you can... Tebow held his hand up. We already had this conversation, said Ethan. Tebow pointed to the hand, the agreed signal. For some reason, gestures stuck with Ethan better than words. None of our powers is easy to deal with, Tebow said. Especially growing up. I mean, how young were you when the voice hit? Ethan shrugged. It started talking before I did. Before you did? Yeah, if I wanted something, I just opened my mouth and noises came out. I thought everyone did that. I thought that's what talking was. Ethan's gaze drifted to the window. Tebow waited for their connection to fade, but it held a bright, thin beam between them, almost too intense. It took a long time to understand words, even the ones coming out of my own mouth. Maybe I'm kind of stupid, but hey, why did I need to understand them? The voice took care of everything. I just watched. Tebow stopped cleaning up and sat down. He'd known that the hooks of the voice went deep into Ethan, but not this deep, deeper than language. So how did you learn how to talk for yourself? Took a while to figure out I even had my own voice. Ethan wore a wry smile on his lips as if learning to speak was a scam he'd pulled. But the voice doesn't work when I'm alone, and you know how little kids babble to themselves? I had to figure out why it felt different when the voice wasn't handing words to me. Ethan looked up, and the connection between them was so strong and bright and steady, Tebow knew Ethan had never told this to anyone. So the voice taught you to talk, but it got in the way, too. Yeah, it made it too easy. Still does. At school, they think I'm dyslexic or whatever. I'm great at oral exams, but I bomb all the written tests. Ethan laughed like this was a big joke on the teachers. For a while, I thought I could make myself as smart as the voice was. I'd listen real hard when it talked, and then look up words in this big dictionary they had in the library on a wooden stand, but then... Ethan squirmed and the connection sputtered. Then what? said Tebow. There was this teacher. He was always picking on me. And one day he told me I was lazy one too many times, so I let the voice loose on him. It said he was only mean and bitter because his mom was schizophrenic. The whole room went quiet. Everyone shit scared. But he went on with the class, real serious, and he never bugged me again, so I thought the word schizophrenic must be awesome. I looked it up once I worked out how to spell it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it turned out schizophrenics were people like me, with voices in their heads. If that's not me, nothing is. Ethan stared out the window again. So I stopped looking up words, and a week later they got rid of that big dictionary because the internet was better. But I was like, great, that stupid book's gone that told me I'm crazy. Maybe no one else has to know. Man, that sucks. Tebow's fateful book had been a tattered paperback, Zen for Beginners, picked up at random from a secondhand bookstore. In it, he'd found the way all laid out for him. Fifteen hundred years of wisdom that stared straight into the void, that made nothingness okay. Which made Tebow okay, because he was definitely nothing. The Buddhist Sunyata, emptiness personified. But when Ethan had found himself in a book, it hadn't been among the koans of the way. Instead, he'd stumbled on schizophrenic and mistaken it for Satori, 
and he'd been scared of himself ever since. Ethan, I don't think you're schizophrenic. Really? Ethan turned to face Tebow, hopeful, scared. Really, these things we have, they aren't mental issues. They're powers like superheroes have. Tebow almost laughed. He never said the word out loud before. You think? Sure, we just suck at them right now. Zeros, not heroes, Ethan muttered, his attention scattering. People lost focus like this when they were in pain, as if they were trying to melt out of sight, like everyone had a little slice of Tebow's power in them. And hell, maybe the kindest thing would be to make that happen. All Tebow had to do was swipe his hand across his face and leave the room, and Ethan's memory of this conversation would fade. But this was the first time they'd said anything really meaningful to each other. Tebow couldn't just throw it away. I should email Nate about that video. Ethan nodded. Yeah, you should, because you might have a nice place to stay, but I gotta live with my mom, and she's going to tear me a new one if I don't get home soon. Tebow met his gaze. Their connection was still there, but it was built of fear and exhaustion. First thing in the morning, and he already felt tired. He reached for his laptop. Sure thing. Maybe if we get Glorious Leader's ass in gear, he'll come up with a plan to get you out of here. Chapter 36 Crash Chizara tried not to seem too cheerful at work that morning. She was supposed to be recovering from a migraine, not reveling in newfound powers. But she worked hard, all focus and attention, and it almost surprised her when her new talents didn't flare up and fix these blenders and radios when she could see so clearly what had to be done. But no, she had to go hunting for tiny replacement light bulbs in Bob's collection out back or clean out a toaster's workings with an old toothbrush. Maybe these burned-out filaments and breadcrumbs were too big for her power to wrestle into shape, too gargantuan compared to microscopic circuits. There was no stress working with clunky machines like this, but yesterday's glories had raised a possibility. Maybe toaster repair wasn't why she'd been put on this earth. Maybe her true work was waiting for her someplace else, someplace not so safe and pleasant, which offered the challenges of dealing with Nate and the others. It was a thrilling but scary thought, and Chizara was glad to have this job, this shop, these simple responsibilities to shelter in. After their lunch of Mom's leftovers, Bob asked her to replace the power cord of an old TV. The customer's terrier, left alone in her apartment one day, had chewed through the cord. Tell me the dog didn't electrocute itself. Oh, he was smart, Bob said. He pulled it out of the wall first. It was a long cord, so it was easy to cut around the bite marks, strip the wires, screw them into the plug, then screw the plug back together. At the first flicker of light on the screen, Chizara braced herself for the trickle of Wi-Fi. So many televisions were networked as if everyone was dying to read their email on a TV screen. But this one was charmingly old and dumb. It emitted nothing but a brashy flourish of breaking news from Cambria Local and the earnest face of Molly Roswell. Has been placed into an induced coma after being assaulted in yesterday's prisoner escape at the North Bride Street headquarters. Police are still unsure what caused the computer malfunction and security breach. Molly kept talking, but for a moment, Chizara couldn't parse the words. That was some weird stuff, said Bob, looking up from the circuit board. You hear about it? Chizara nodded slowly. The purring had gone from her bones. Some. Her voice came out flat. I saw the newspaper this morning. A picture hovered over Molly Roswell's right shoulder, a policeman in full-dress uniform. He was smiling, and his name was Reggie Bright. Chizara tried to listen, but the words kept not making sense. Medically induced coma, family man, beaten while trying to prevent prisoners. And then, with cruel suddenness, Molly Roswell moved on to a story about homeowner's insurance. 
Bob kept looking up from his soldering iron, as if statistics about grease fires were just as dramatic, just as meaningful. Chizara was scared to open her mouth in case a huge, anguished howl came out. A man, a family man, someone's father, was in a coma because she'd lost control. Because of that glitch with the holding cells they'd all shrugged off at Nate's yesterday, unaware that a man had been beaten half to death. Or had the rest of them known? She pulled the television's plug from the wall and the screen winked into darkness. Stretch break, she managed and walked to where her bag rested on the bench. Her phone was in there, the one she'd been so pleased about fixing. Well, fix this girl. What good was repairing phones and game consoles if you screwed up so bad that someone wound up in a coma? A walking massacre. Chizara made it down the hall and out the back, shut the rusty door behind her, and crouched against the outside wall. She switched her phone on and waited with a hand over her eyes while it woke itself up and made its connections, stabbing at her brain. All that porn face stuff of scams, that meant nothing next to this new horror. She called Nate. Chizara, are you okay? He sounded dead serious. So, you knew. There was silence on the other end. He was thinking about his answer, considering how best to say it. Disgust and plantain welled up in Chizara's gut, and she thumbed end call. She was almost sick right there in the alley. The Zeros had ruined a man's life just to save scam from his own big mouth. Her mom's voice rang in her head. Any kind of gift, you can use it wisely or stupidly. Whether it's strength or a good brain or some strange thing like you've got, Chizara, just ask yourself every time you use it, is this going to hurt anyone? Is this going to do any harm? And Chizara had asked herself those questions. She really had. But then the thing had gotten so big, with the police station so crowded, and all those networks tangling in her mind? How was she supposed to stop her power when it got that big? Of course, there'd been a moment when she'd had a choice to hold back or let it roll through her, kneeling by the detective's desk, realizing that smoke alarms and card readers wouldn't be enough, thinking, with a whiff of exhilaration, time to do some damage. It was moments like those that killed people, removed husbands, fathers from the world, permanently, unforgivably, doing some damage, having some fun. The Zeros protecting their own. Nate had made it sound so noble. Well, it wasn't noble. It was just playing with too much power, like child soldiers with AK-47s in their hands. It wasn't glorious or beautiful or any of those things she felt when her power had hold of her. She was a demon, just like Scam had said. The phone went off, blaring pain into her hand. Glorious leader. She almost threw it at the wall, but her need to yell at him was as strong as her anger. What? She spat, holding the phone as close to her ear as she could bear. I'm coming to see you. We're going to talk this through. Talk it through? You can't talk something like this through. A man's in a coma and we're responsible. How much less conversational can something get? I'll be on my way in five minutes, Chizara. Where are you? I'm at work, Nate. I've got another hour to go and I'm going to work that hour, not lie to my boss and sneak out for some stupid mission that puts someone in a coma. This is the end of missions for me, Nate. The end of your training. The Zeros just got evil. We didn't know this would happen. But you knew yesterday, right? And you didn't tell me. I knew he was in a coma, but it's medically induced to help him stabilize. He's so bad off, it's better to be unconscious. And instead of mentioning it, you fed me lunch? Why? In case you needed me to crash something else before I heard? I was hoping for a better outcome. 
The coldness of that. Her breath, snatched away, came back with a little laugh of disbelief. Who was the demon here? Oh, Nate, you're going to make a great politician. Can we just talk? Can I come and meet you after work? Do what you want. Just make sure you walk or ride a bicycle or something. Get some beat-up cab. You show up in this neighborhood in one of your fancy cars, people will think you're a dealer moving in, and I won't tell them otherwise. She slapped the phone off, biting her lip hard to keep herself mad. Righteous anger was so much better than that about-to-cry feeling. She got up and paced the alley, sucking in deep breaths, huffing them out, preparing to go back inside and be normal, get her job done, learn something new about old tech, something mechanical made out of dumb materials that did what they were told. This was what she was going to stick to from now on, unless she could read all the consequences right to the end and see that nobody got hurt in any way. She dragged open the door and went back inside. Chapter 37 Bellwether The call ended with a loud click, as if Chizara had thrown her phone against a wall. Or maybe her anger had crashed it. Nate frowned. Hadn't she destroyed her phone yesterday? Maybe she'd bought a new one already, which was too bad. He'd planned to buy her a replacement on his way over, a little reminder that being part of the team had its benefits, that the Zeros took care of their own. Not that any gift would repair the damage done yesterday. Nate texted his father's secretary, canceling lunch. Puppy would be annoyed, but not as annoyed as if Chizara had a crisis of conscience and confessed to the police. On the radio, they were calling yesterday's events terrorism, which was ridiculous but it made all the relevant jail terms about ten times longer. The irony of this disaster was that the training exercises had helped Chizara most of all. Nate had watched her ability sharpen, evolving from a blunt object into an instrument of specificity and finesse. And her confidence had grown, her sense that she was entitled to wield such power. Until now. So what if she'd slipped a little? Nate doubted that the Cambria Police Department had any earth-shaking investigations underway. As he'd always told Chizara, every crash she conjured was simply a reminder to back up that data. Anyone who didn't deserved what they got. If only Chizara hadn't opened those cell doors. Or if the escapees had managed not to put anyone in a coma on the way out. Was that so much to ask? Now Chizara was in danger of losing all the focus she'd gained yesterday of throwing it all away to wallow in guilt and shame. And after all that, Ethan's video had still made it out into the world. Sonia Stoller, a.k.a. Sonia Sonic, must have sent it to herself before handing her phone to the cops. Maybe next time Chizara should just crash the whole internet. Nate filed that thought away. He found his sisters in the front room, playing with his old set of Formula One cars. They had made a track with strips of cloth from a ma's sewing scraps and built a grandstand from shoeboxes, full of dolls. Gabby, always the instigator, was lofting a bright green Lotus Renault through the air. I've lost control, run! She took it spinning into the grandstand, neatly decapitating a Mysterioso Junior doll. The other sisters managed the fleeing dolls from the stand. I'm on fire! Me too! We're all doomed! He cleared his throat, and they looked up guiltily from the carnage. I'm going out. Nate took the keys to the Audi from the bowl beside the door. It was one of their best cars and had just been washed. If anyone in the Heights took offense at shiny chrome, Nate knew how to deal with that. Tell Mama I'll be back for dinner. Okay, Gabby said, then made a rumbling explosion sound as the Renault crashed against a couch leg. When Nate opened the front door, he found himself face to face with three adults. The man wore a cheap suit and fedora, and the two women were both in gray business wear. Cops. And much sooner than he'd expected. Nate wasn't ready for this. They looked a little surprised themselves at the door having opened without a knock. Nate gathered himself. May I help you? I'm Detective King, one of the women said. This is Detective Fuentes and Deputy District Attorney Cooper. 
Cooper. Ethan's last name. This had to be the dreaded mother. Detective King smiled warmly. Apparently, it wasn't too suspicious being a bit nonplussed when a pair of detectives and a DDA showed up at your door. We're looking for Mr. Nathaniel Saldana. She said his name with a decent accent. Nate managed to smile back, trying not to think of terrorism charges erasing his future. That's me. Please come in. After I see your badges, of course. He kept the visitors in the front room. Mama was working in the back garden this afternoon and wouldn't be inside any time soon. A citizen for 20 years, she still got nervous in the presence of authorities, which was the last thing Nate needed. More important, his sisters were here. He pulled them from their game and arranged them along the couch, forcing the two detectives to stand. He and DDA Cooper had the two chairs, so the real conversation would be between them. More important, the presence of his sisters gave him an audience to work with. Nate's training missions had shown that it took six people to form the beginnings of the curve. It was in crowds of six or more where Crash could really wreck things, where Flicker could throw her vision half a mile, and where Anonymous truly vanished. But of all their powers, Nate's was most affected by the curve. Being a leader was pointless without a crowd to follow you. Nate had seven in this room. The cops didn't stand a chance. This is about a phone call you received yesterday? About 11 in the morning? King had a printout in her hand. Phone company records, not a memorized number. There was no point in pretending the call hadn't happened. Besides, King would have recognized his voice by now. Nate gave her a momentary puzzled look, then nodded. Right. That crank call. You thought it was a joke? She raised an eyebrow. Of course. They said it was for someone called Scam. Scamelia. King read from her notepad. She took a step closer. And it was me you were talking to. I'm so sorry, Detective. All I heard was scam. Nate shrugged. I thought it was an old friend of mine. This guy was always playing jokes, always lying about everything, you know. At those words, Ethan's mother sat a little straighter. Detective King was looming over him now, so Nate let his perfect smile drop into a frown. The room cooled a little. His sisters felt it too, the promise of conflict, the play of dominance and focus that lit up the air like sparklers. This was a game for them, one that Nate had raised them to play. Their attention settled over him like a mantle, his to use, and cold little glare stabbed up from their dark and beautiful eyes. Detective King took a step back. What was this friend's name? DDA Cooper said. Ethan, but everyone called him Scam. The muscles of her jaw tightened just a little. Yes, definitely his mother. Using Ethan's code name was a risk, but the name made the lies of yesterday his fault and, by extension, his mother's. Scam, Nate said again, respecting the power of repetition, because he was always lying. Following his lead, his sisters turned their baleful glares on the deputy district attorney. Detective Fuentes asked something, but Nate ignored him, shut him out of the conversation entirely. He sharpened his connection with Ethan's mother, but softened his disapproval into an invitation for her to speak again. Got any idea where he is? She asked. Done. Nate liked to think he was an excellent liar, but his words always tasted a little bit crisper when they were true. Ethan had gone off somewhere to hide, but where or with whom wouldn't come to mind. We hung out a lot last year, but it's been a while. So you haven't seen his video, Fuentes asked. Nate stared at him, as if the question made no sense, then turned back to DDA Cooper. Is Ethan okay? He drew his sisters along, and their little faces opened with concern. She didn't answer at first, and the detectives looked uncomfortable. It was probably tricky having a DDA along when she was the mother of a suspect or a material witness or whatever scam was. Fuentes cleared his throat. Why did you claim to be a lawyer? When I get a crank call, I hang up. Nate spoke directly to DDA Cooper. We always used to joke with Scam, with Ethan, I mean, that he would wind up in jail one day. I thought he'd gotten a friend to pretend to be a cop, like it had finally happened, so I played along. You know, Fuentes said, misrepresenting yourself to a police officer, that's a felony. I didn't know who you were. 
Nate looked up at the two detectives, lowering the full weight of his disdain and his sister's on them. Really, Detective King, you were asking for some lawyer called Scam who didn't exist. And you kept talking about Terrence, who also doesn't exist. The whole thing was a joke, wasn't it? On you. The two of them took another shuffle backward. They'd lost track of a kid who was both a material witness to a homicide and the missing son of a prosecutor. On top of which, their department had lost a whole station's worth of suspects, with one of their own put into a coma in the process. Their confidence was shaken. You could see it in the unfocused glimmers of their awareness. They asked more questions, but Nate held his nerve. He and his sisters nodded and smiled when DDA Cooper spoke, shook their heads when the others did. Not so much that the detectives would notice, just enough to worry their hind brains, to urge them gently backward and out of the conversation. Soon, they were clear across the room. Ethan's mother had been stripped of their protection, left alone on the armchair, which had a broken spring and was never very comfortable. For a moment, Nate felt sorry for her. Raising Ethan couldn't be easy. You'd always wonder if the way he'd turned out was your fault. I haven't seen him since last summer. Nate said to her. He lost all his friends on the same day, spouted a bunch of stuff he couldn't take back. He saw that she believed every word of that. Maybe it was better to be caught off guard like this. If he'd had time to prepare, he would have come up with stories, lies. But the perfect weapon against Scam's mother was the truth, the one thing she'd never heard from her son's mouth. There was a group of you. Fuentes was still trying to sound tough, though by now he was backed up against a potted fern. Maybe one of the others might know where he is. Maybe so, but I lost touch with them all. After what Ethan said to us, he busted up the group. It was practically cheating, sticking so close to the facts, so he added a lie. I don't know how to find them. Just give us names, Detective King said, pulling out a notepad. Nate smiled and made up three names. Most teenagers didn't have listed phone numbers, and people moved away from Cambria all the time. If the detectives felt like they'd gotten something from the visit, they could leave without losing face. This had been instructive. But he was late for his meeting with Chizara. Thank you, said DDA Cooper before she departed, extending her hand. And for a moment, Nate worried that he'd connected too well. The last thing he wanted was for her to look him up again, hoping to learn more about her son. But he took her hand and deployed his warmest look of concern. We didn't part on the best of terms, but wherever Ethan is, I really hope he's okay. Chapter 38 Scam Rip out your spine and make you eat it! Ethan sent a spray of potato chips across the coffee table. He hadn't meant the spray as a distraction, but that was the moment when Tebow made his fatal mistake. His tree sprite dangled a moment too long from the embezzler vine and took a fireball right in his face. Die, 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 Ethan cried. This rage high felt good, like the fireballs were destroying the fact that he was being hunted. Turned out Red Scepter Three was the only thing that stopped him thinking about everyone who wanted him dead or in custody. The sprite made one last leap for the tree branch overhead, but a fireball connected halfway up. Finally! Ethan fell backward on the couch. I killed you good, T. He turned, ready to gloat some more, but T. Bo was staring at him wide-eyed. Oh, Ethan said, surveying the coffee table. Sorry about the chips. No. T. Bo still looked astonished. I m mean... Yes, that was disgusting, but you remembered me. Oh, right. Ethan had been fully into the game, all the way down in that animal level where every twitch of the wizard was an extension of his own body. But not once had he forgotten Tebow next to him. And not once had he thought about angry bank robbers or angry cops or his inevitably disappointed mom. Tebow was grinning hard, like a troop of Girl Scouts had just handed him all their cookies. Ethan looked back at the screen where he'd left his wizard motionless. Poor guy was getting pecked to death. Ethan chuckled. All that mattered was his revenge on Tebow for 17 straight losses. 
Ethan even remembered the score. 17 kills to one now. I guess we, like, bonded or something. Tebow laughed. Maybe you're like those bacteria that get resistant to antibiotics. Gee, thanks. This is a big deal. It felt even bigger than killing the tree sprite. I mean, has this ever happened to you before? With Nate, once or twice. Oh, right, of course. Glorious leader. He'd set up meetings. Tebow dropped the controller to his lap. Just me and him in the middle of an empty field, and the next day he'd email and tell me what we talked about like he'd taken notes. Impressive, Ethan said, despite feeling a stab of jealousy. Trust Glorious Leader to make it an experiment. Once we went camping in the Redwoods, Tebow said. We got as remote as we could, and he didn't lose me for three straight days. He'd record stuff with his phone or take notes while we sat around the campfire. It was almost like I was a normal person. Ethan squirmed. You mean, except for being recorded? Yeah, Nate's not normal himself exactly. It always feels like we're part of a game for him. Like, those training missions? I mean, seriously, training for what? Does he really have some big plan for the Zeros, or is he winging it like everybody else? Tebow was staring at the screen, watching the restart button pulse. You know what's weird? It kind of sucked not being able to disappear, not being able to do what I wanted, because this other person was around, expecting things, like conversation, all that stuff. Oh, man, small talk, I hate that. Tebow shrugged. It was too much being normal for that long. I don't know how you guys can stand to be seen all day. Normal doesn't work for me either, Ethan said. Talking for myself, I suck at that. The voice just knows, man. Trying to use it less, but never at all, I'd be toast. Tebow turned to face him. But what about all the damage it does? A guy got shot in that bank robbery. Not by me. Ethan held up both hands in surrender. He just managed to forget about the bank robbery again, but Tebow had to go and remind him. Those guys loaded their own guns. That's the kind of people they were. Seriously, T. Is there anything I could say to you that would make you kill someone? Don't make me answer that, Tebow said, and went silent. There was an intensity about him that kept Ethan quiet, too. When Tebow finally spoke again, the words came slowly, like something bubbling up from deep in the ground. You think you've got it made up in your fancy hotel room, all your fancy shirts, but none of it makes up for crawling home from the hospital and walking into your own house sick as a dog and finding grandma set up in your bedroom, your stuff given away to your brothers, mom and dad looking past you the way everyone does, talking to the person behind you like they never had an oldest son. Ethan stared. It was like Tebow was reciting some weird passage from a play almost like he was talking with another voice. Tebow kept going. And the funniest part is you think that calm place is in inside you. Bullshit, that's cold rage pushed right down where you can't see it anymore. But you can feel it, right? The room fell silent, and Ethan understood. That's what I said to you last summer, right? How'd you memorize it? It kept playing in my head over and over. Tebow flicked a potato chip across the floor. And yeah, what you said that day almost made me kill someone. Words can do that, Ethan. For a moment, he wore a look of unguarded rage. At Ethan. I'm sorry, T. I don't even know what I was talking about. I was just so mad at Nate. But it made sense now why Tebow lived in a hotel. His family had forgotten about him. I was pretty messed up. They really gave your room away? Ethan asked. I was at the hospital and my grandma needed a place to stay. Once she moved in, there were six people in the house, too many for them to remember me. The curve, like Nate always says. That sucks, Ethan said, suddenly glad that his power was strictly one-on-one. -on -one. No crazy crowd effects like the rest of them. Tebow sighed. 
The worst part of last summer wasn't what you said. It was that I felt grateful for someone saying it. Like, finally someone saw me. Sometimes I almost want to piss you off again just to prove that the voice would never forget my secrets. I guess people want to be known, even when it hurts. Like dogs that crawl back to the masters who beat them. Crap. Ethan had never felt so awful. Tebow wanted the voice to remember him because he didn't think Ethan could. I'm going to remember what you just told me, T. Not to diss you with it, but like as a friend. Oh, yeah? Prove it. Okay, Ethan said at once. Um, how? Tebow thought for a moment. I got a bad case of scepter breath. I need a shower and some serious toothbrush time. I'll shut both doors so you can't even hear the water. And when I come out again, we'll see what you remember. Ethan swallowed. A shower was maybe ten minutes, and if he failed, if Tebow walked back in and Ethan just stared at him, then every honest thing they'd shared would evaporate. Worst of all, it would mean the voice was a better friend than Ethan. No problem, Ethan said casually. Take your time. Tebow gave him a look like he expected to be disappointed, but Ethan shooed him away. Fine, I will, Tebow said. He got to his feet and headed for his room, shutting the door firmly behind him. Okay, Ethan muttered. Just waiting for my buddy T. He almost reached for the dropped controller, but slipping away into the game would be lethal. He stood and started pacing, keeping the blood flowing to his brain. Tebow is my buddy. Ethan pictured the guy's intense blue eyes, his long hair, the disappointed expression he would have if Ethan forgot him. He's just taking a shower, brushing his teeth. He stared out the window. It still gave him a buzz, seeing all of Cambria spread out below. He could see Ivy Street from up here, where the crag was no doubt lurking, ready to crush Ethan if he saw him. Not if I see you first, Ethan muttered. He wondered if a penny thrown from up here would kill someone. That had always sounded like bullshit. Maybe a shoe, though. And for a no-neck like the Craig? A couch. Crap. You're supposed to be thinking about someone else, not the Craig. He glanced at his palm. The ink had long since been rubbed off by a sheen of scepter sweat, but the gesture made it click in his brain. Tebow, he said aloud. He's gone, but he'll be back. He had scepter breath. Ha, scepter breath. Ethan breathed into his own hand. He had a little scepter breath himself, but brushing his teeth would probably make him zone out. No problem, just keep walking and thinking about Tebow. He made a tight circle around the padded armchairs in the middle of the room. Each time his attention started to slip, he'd check his hand again. The gesture kept reminding him of Tebow and everything he'd said. T had just told him why he'd left home, his parents forgetting him, something about his grandma, and how the voice had tortured him with it last summer. Ethan couldn't forget any of this ever, or he was a bad friend. Where had T gone? To the store? Ethan came to a halt, feeling sweat trickling down the inside of his arm. What store? It didn't matter. The point was that his name was Tebow, however the hell he spelled it, and he was Ethan's best there was a sound outside the door. T was back. Ethan crossed the living area and pulled it open. Tebow, he cried. But it was a young guy rolling past with a laundry cart. The guy came to a halt, looked at him, then at a clipboard hanging from the cart. Ethan's heart sank. He was hiding from the law and his mom and evil bank robbers, and now he'd open the door to a stranger. Housekeeping? The guy scratched his shaved head. Uh, I didn't know this room was occupied. Do you need service, sir? Um, Ethan began, then let the voice take over. We're staying here by a special arrangement. Mr. Pinka told us we wouldn't be disturbed. Sorry, sir, the guy waved the clipboard. You're not on the list, so nobody's going to bother you. Ethan returned to his real voice. Thank you, um, bye. He shut the door and leaned his back against it, swearing in a whisper. That had been a close one, but the guy had believed him. The voice wasn't all bad. 
no matter what Tebow said. Ethan smiled. The name, it was still with him. A moment later, Tebow appeared in his bathrobe, rubbing a towel through his hair and trying to look nonchalant. Right, he'd been taking a shower. Ethan tried to pretend he wasn't freaked out and soaked in sweat, that he hadn't forgotten where T was and stupidly opened the door to potential danger, because remembering your best friend's name was no big deal. He flopped onto the couch and said, Hey, scepter breath, want me to kick your ass some more? Chapter 39, Flicker. The hero of our tale seems to have a thing for cracks and walls, Lily said, a smirk in her voice. Flicker ignored the words, focusing on the photographs in Lily's hands. They were close-ups of faded graffiti, cracks in asphalt, and brick walls textured with age, all of which supported Nate's theory that Anon lived in a hotel here in downtown Cambria. According to Nate's notes, the style was something called wabi-sabi, which was about appreciating imperfect and transient things. An interesting choice for someone who slipped out of memory so easily. Flicker wondered if Nate had stolen the camera, or if Anon had given him the images. Did the boy called nothing want to be found? Quit shuffling them, Flicker said. Just focus on one. They had to be systematic. Everybody in town had seen that stupid video of Ethan by now. The two would need help soon, whether Anon wanted it or not. And these photos were the only way to find him. Lily grumbled, but chose a photo and settled herself against the cool stone of the Cambria Library main branch. The sounds of traffic were all around, and a soft breeze made the printout shiver in her hands. The photo showed a chip cement wall with a jagged crack running through it. Clinging to the wall was a tiny green plant that had taken root in the gap. More cracks stretched away from the leaves, as if the plant were pushing outward, a small force persistent and irresistible. Flicker placed a steadying hand on Lily's shoulder. Story, please. Okay, her sister began, eyes locked on the photo. The boy called nothing, stared at the walls of his secret castle. They were thick and strong, built to last a thousand years, but no wall is without cracks and fissures, and he knew that one day he would walk free, past the castle walls and out into the sunlight. As Lily spoke, Flicker left her sister's vision behind and flung herself outward into the crowd. She moved fast, fluttering from head to head, needing little more than glimpses. Nobody was staring at the walls, of course or at cracks in the pavement or the places where old paint had chipped away from brick walls. People stared at their phones or watched traffic lights or the heels of the people in front of them. They glanced at newspaper headlines, ads, and signs in shop windows. But in the periphery of those glances were the things that a boy called nothing took photos of. Fractures and crevices, broken pavement, bleached stone. In those edges of vision, Flicker was looking for a match. She hopped farther across the streets and down alleyways to the farthest reaches of her range, which was a long way here in the downtown crowds. But she found nothing that resembled the tiny green plant clinging to a gray cement wall. Then it struck her, and she sighed. Of course, it's a plant. Her sister's rambling story came to a halt. What? It's probably dead by now or flowered, or whatever, that picture could be from a year ago. Lily made another grumbly noise. She wasn't fully on board with the whole finding the fictional boyfriend project. When presented with the plan that morning at breakfast, she'd said, Sounds really mature, Riley. Like being one of those fans who forgot that TV actors aren't really the characters they play. But a few minutes of cajoling in their private accent had convinced Lily to come along. She liked being included when superpowers were involved. Can you find one without a plant? Flicker asked. Whatever. Lily shuffled through the printouts until she reached a photo of a wall painted a brilliant sky blue. The paint was gone in two big patches, leaving exposed stone bearing flecks of half a dozen other colors. Flicker squeezed her sister's shoulder. Perfect. The blue should be easy to spot. If you say so. Lily stared at the picture for a moment, as if collecting threads of narrative from the fissures and flecks, and began her story again. 
By the time late afternoon had covered the streets of downtown in shadow, they had found three matches. The blue wall, a rusted red door in an alleyway, a bus stop bench with splintered wooden slats. All three photographs had been taken in the same one-block area. What's around here? Flicker asked. She had retreated into blindness, dizzy from scattering her vision like leaves in a storm. Darkness felt steadying and solid. A couple of bars, Lily said. Not like the clubs on Ivy, scuzzier. Anywhere he could live? No apartment buildings, just offices. And the Magnifique, I guess. Of course, Flicker murmured. Her borrowed eyes had been glancing up to admire it all day, towering, terraced, wrapped in glass, the tallest and most expensive hotel in Cambria. The boy called nothing really did live in a castle. She'd found him. Seriously? Lily asked. That place is like a thousand a night. How rich is this guy? Not rich, magic. Haven't you been listening to your story? Yeah, but it's a story. And what you guys have isn't really magic. It's just a mutation or something, right? Or something, Flicker said with a shrug. Glorious Leader had a lot of theories. Mutations, radiation, eating genetically engineered foods or expired Twinkies. The fact that they'd all been born in 2000, a year with a lot of zeros in it, so to speak. You know, these are just stories, right? Lily sounded worn out. I'm just making stuff up. But that's what everyone does. Before we really know someone, we're looking at the surface and guessing, embroidering. Um, Riley, this is more like stalking than embroidering. This is me helping a friend. Well, I'm done here, Lily said. You coming home? Flicker shook her head. She was going to sit in the lobby of the Magnifique until she found Anonymous. He'd been alone long enough. Chapter 40 Bellwether This side of town was full of eyes. The Heights was a poor part of Cambria, watchful and tight-knit, wary of newcomers. As Nate drove onto the street where Chizara worked, he felt the weight of all that vision. Not that he was worried about the attention his mother's Audi attracted. Nate knew exactly what to do with attention. There were plenty of shady spots available, but he parked in the sun, where the car's chrome would sparkle. As he stepped onto the curb, he felt the focus of the street settle over him. The girls playing handball against the convenience store wall. Little kids swapping stories on a stoop. Old men playing dominoes. All of them paused a moment, and Nate smiled. He didn't try to deflect their admiration of the car, his dress shirt and hundred-dollar sunglasses, or the gold ring shining on his finger. Instead, he gathered every twitch of envy and smoothed it into respect. Nate felt it register with the crowd that he belonged here. Otherwise, how could he look so serene? He moved gently away from the parking spot, careful not to draw the web of attention with him. It settled where he had first smiled at them, the whole street suddenly wary and protective of that glittering car. Don't touch that. Someone important owns it. Took you long enough, Chizara said. She was hunched over what appeared to be the guts of an electric toaster. Heating elements, springs, a dozen screws lined up neatly on the wooden table. Only the deco chrome shell with its two bread slots revealed what those parts had been. What a waste, using her talents this way like a brain surgeon clubbing seals for a living. I had unexpected visitors, Nate said, putting a little tightness in his voice. Chizara's eyes widened, her annoyance derailed by a pulse of fear. Her mind had gone straight to the police. Nate nodded gravely. She carefully set down her screwdriver. My ride's here, Bob, gotta go. An older man hunched his own desk over another scattering of parts glimmered with interest. Nate settled him with a smile. As Shizara straightened her tools, Nate scanned the shelves lining the walls of the workroom. They were full of junky appliances and rusty parts. What would it be like to be too poor to buy a new toaster when yours broke? Nate liked money, 
It was a sleek and clever invention, beautiful in the way it lubricated power and focused people's attention. But it had a clumsy, brutal side, too. Money bludgeoned people without it into silence, shut them away in neighborhoods like this. Nate knew that anyone who rose to power had to take one side or another in that contest of meanings. But he hadn't decided which one suited him yet. You ready? Chizara said, brushing past him. I split my lunch with Bob. I'm hungry. Nate gave her his most radiant smile. I'm buying. There were two detectives and Ethan's mother. Chizara let out a slow breath between pursed lips. She's a detective, right? A district attorney. Nate looked for the waitress needing more water, but she'd disappeared again. The place was almost empty. He'd planned to take Chizara to a crowded restaurant downtown, somewhere with a crowd, an audience. But she'd insisted on this tiny Korean place near her home. Even full, it would barely contain enough people to get the curve going. Chizara wasn't giving him an inch. Did they say anything about Officer Bright? She asked. Nate took a moment to look somber. Of course not. Their visit had nothing to do with those criminals escaping. They just wanted to ask why Ethan called me. What did you tell them? The truth, that we used to be friends and now we're not. Chizara settled back into the squeaky plastic of the booth, looking thoughtful. Not friends anymore? You seemed happy to have him back yesterday. Whether he's my friend or not, Scam needs us, Nate said. We all need each other. Yeah, we do such great things together. Nate sighed to himself. He'd come up with that line in the car, and it had been a good one. But he'd used it without laying any groundwork, and the restaurant was too empty for his power to help. On top of that, his throat was dry, which made his voice sound weak and desperate. Where was the waitress? Chizara wore a grim smile. She knew he hated bad service. Nate gazed at the menu, which was coated in plastic and frayed at the corners. This is quaint. What do you recommend? I recommend that you delete my number from your phone, Chizara said, and that you and your friends stop playing with these powers. We're not playing. We're learning how they work. And what did you learn yesterday? How to get someone killed? Officer Bright isn't. Nate began, but arguing the definition of dead was exactly the wrong way to win her trust. It's terrible what happened, and it's my fault for pushing you too hard. But if you ignore what you are and let that itch build up, what do you think will happen? Chizara drew back in her seat, but she was still listening. Suddenly, he saw how to convince her. Not loyalty to the group, not self-improvement. An appeal to her morality. Let's say you keep yourself under control, Chizara, maybe for a year, maybe ten. But Crash is still inside you, growing stronger. In the end, what happens? You take out a hospital, an airplane overhead, a whole city. She held his gaze, but a nervous swallow moved her throat. We found out yesterday how powerful you are. You might be the strongest of us. The words gave him a shiver. Of jealousy? No, the irritation of seeing power wasted on the unwilling. So how do I stop myself? She asked softly. Not by repressing what you are, by mastering it. You have to practice like an athlete every day. Like Scam does? Chizara shook her head. Every time he lets that thing inside him talk, he winds up with less control, not more. Ethan's different, another species. Nate shuddered a little as he spoke. The last time he'd put it that harshly was last summer, about ten seconds before Scam tore the group to pieces. But keeping Chizara was worth playing every card. He doesn't get stronger in a crowd like the rest of us. His power's connected to his own ego, not to the people around him. He's the opposite of us. She was silent, staring out the window, and the waitress finally appeared. You order for both of us, Chizara. Let her be in control. She ordered everything extra hot, another way to keep him off balance. But nothing in this place would match his mother's love of habaneros. When they were alone again, he took a drink of water and said, 
It's not only the difference in your power, Chizara. It's who you are. You have discipline. You have ethics. Maybe for now, she said. But yesterday felt so good. What if I love crashing things too much to stop? Nate nodded, hiding his surprise. Anyone could see that Chizara enjoyed being crash, but he'd never heard her admit it aloud. Yesterday changed me. Her eyes glazed over, like they had after the crash yesterday. Her focus left him drifting into memories and doubt. Changed you how? What happened? A man's in the hospital because of us. What changed, Chizara? She looked frightened, ready to draw herself back and tell him nothing. He had to act now with no crowd to help him. All he had left was the twist in his power, the one he'd discovered two years ago when he'd been in love with Flicker. When he'd needed to show how much he trusted her, to reveal how vulnerable he was behind his charm. It hadn't worked out the way he'd hoped. They were still just friends. But showing himself to Flick had been worth it even so. The problem was, he didn't trust Chizara that way. But the Zeros couldn't lose her. They were all in danger if they didn't stick together. Nathaniel closed his eyes, weighing the full measure of the power inside him. And then he let it drop. His guts rose up in him, like he was in an elevator with a snapped cable. The channels of dominance that extended in all directions, hungry for attention and obedience, fluttered powerless. Now he sat exposed before Chizara, unprotected, feeling a wretched and unfamiliar sense of neediness. Please, he said. Tell me what happened. She stared at him a moment. She'd felt the absence right away. You four are what matters to me, he said. I can't lose any of you, not even Ethan, or I'm nothing. Zilch. Nada. His throat was dry again, and his voice sounded pathetic. He felt an awful certainty that if she rejected him now, his heart would break. I'm pointless without you, so if you're changing. I can fix things now, Chizara said. Nate sputtered to a halt, trying to understand. He was so thankful for any answer that it was hard to breathe. Fix things, he managed. My phone and my brother's video game, I reached inside and fixed them. Her voice sank to a whisper. Since what I did to the police station, I can uncrash things. It took a long time for the words to sink in. But when they did, they kicked Nate's power to spinning again. All his tendrils of dominance and attention twisted to life, hungrier now than ever. A moment later, the waitress was at his side, obediently filling his water. Nate drank it all in a gulp, then pointed at the glass again. She poured, lingering at the task, drawn by his greedy power. In the awkward silence, he searched for words to make Chizara understand. She was the only one of them whose power went beyond other human beings, reaching into the guts of objects and changing reality. If she could learn to transform as well as destroy, anything was possible. But telling her that wouldn't be enough. Chizara needed to see that she was not only powerful but worthy. She had to atone for the life that yesterday's mission had destroyed. To know that her power was worth embracing, Chizara had to save someone. It was up to Nate to make that happen. Chapter 41 Mob In the back room of Fuse, Kelsey watched Fig count out three grand. It was all ones and fives, beer-stained bills from the tip jar and register. It was taking a long, long time. Fig smoothed each note with the side of his hand and built clumsy piles of cash. When he was done, she stuffed the bundle into her bag. The scent of beer rose up from it. You couldn't take this to a bank and swap it for 20s? She asked. Would have been lighter, smelled better, too. Nah, Fig said. Too many bank robbers. Kelsey glanced up at him. Fig was managing not to break into a smile. We are so not laughing about this yet she said. My dad's in deep. 
Fig's expression grew sober. I know. Her dad's trouble was way bigger than anything Kelsey knew how to fix. Whenever she tried to come up with a way to help him, her thoughts circled along the same path. If only he hadn't taken that job with the bag robs, or tried to rob a bank, or if that creepy kid hadn't spooked him. Who was that guy anyhow? Craig said his name was Axel, and that he knew stuff he shouldn't. Seemed like Axel knew a lot of stuff. If that bank video was anything to go by, he knew more about her own dad than Kelsey did. She'd watched it 20 times by now. He'd really said Kelsey's name and mentioned her mom, too, which totally creeped her out. Maybe the bag robs had sent him to mess up the robbery. Maybe Axel had been following her dad, spying on him, waiting for an opportunity to screw him over. Well, it had worked. And sent Kelsey's whole life into freefall, too. She hadn't been home since Thursday night. She was tired and scared and homeless, and her thoughts kept coming back to Axel. The bank video was all over the internet, but the guy himself was missing in action. Where was he now? Fig said, You taking the cash to your old man tonight? I have to wait until he calls. Where are you staying? Fig asked. At Ling's. And tomorrow night, probably Remy's again. Then maybe Mikey's. She couldn't think that far ahead. It'll be okay, Kelsey, you'll see. Fig gave her a reassuring smile. You look nice. Kelsey shrugged. Trying to cheer her up, Ling had lent her the sparkliest silver dress she owned. She'd paired it with silver high tops, saying that they were going to have fun tonight. Kelsey was grateful for the clothes, but she didn't feel sparkly. She just felt scared. She hefted the messenger bag, the cash was like a brick in there. You gonna be okay with that? Fig asked. Anyone messes with me, I can always thump them with it. Thanks for coming through, Fig. He shrugged. I always pay my debts. They headed back out to the club. The music tonight was down tempo, chill out tracks with a subliminal tribal beat. The crowd was smiling and loose, ready to be soothed into a kind of syncopated mellowness. They danced and shook it out like a big, cheerful animal. Kelsey let herself drift into their simple, cruisy optimism, something she hadn't felt all day. There's the smile I've been looking for, Fig grinned at her. She linked an arm through his and leaned on his shoulder. Maybe it really would all be okay. Maybe her dad had a plan for the cash that would get him off the hook with everyone. But then something like a bucket of cold water hit Kelsey. She scanned the room for the source. Through the gentle rocking of the dancers came a different movement, something more determined. A group of six men pierced the dance floor like an arrowhead, a crowd within the crowd. She pulled the bag of money close. Was it the bag robs here in the club? But the men weren't headed her way. They were moving toward the door. And it was Craig, marching at the front of the group, a fierce expression on his face. Where is he going? Kelsey asked. Fig followed her gaze. To do some damage, someone spotted that kid from the bank video. She spun toward Fig. Axel? Where? Fig shrugged. Somebody who works at the Magnifique saw the guy in the penthouse. The penthouse? Living it up while Kelsey couch surfed her way into orphanhood. Craig's gang was almost at the door, their angry intent like a swarm of bees rolling across the room. Axel was in for the biggest beating of his life, which was fine with Kelsey, except that she had to find out what he knew about her dad in the bank robbery and the bag robs. She needed to know why he'd sent her life into this spiral. Gotta go, Fig. She gave his arm a squeeze and made a dash for the door, the heavy bag banging awkwardly on her hip. Chapter 42 Mob she made it to the Magnifique in record time. It helped that she knew all the alleyways in downtown Cambria. Plus, she was sprinting, and Craig's gang moved more like an army tank on legs. When she reached the Magnifique's lobby, the size of it made her pause. She'd been to underground dance parties before, in abandoned factories and warehouses. This lobby was as vast and echoey as those, but gleaming with expense. She felt small and exposed in her little sparkly dress. She headed for the elevators, feeling the buzz from the crowd around her. 
They were mostly guests, travelers looking for fun in a new town. She felt her own anticipation ramp theirs up a notch and loop back on her. She had to get to Axel before Craig and his goons did. In the elevator, she hit the button marked PH. It only blinked. The elevator doors didn't budge. Come on, she said. A man in a suit stepped into the elevator. He pulled out a plastic card with the swirly Magnifique logo on it and slotted it into the elevator controls. Then he pressed the fifth floor button, which stayed lit. Of course, a hotel this fancy had real security. Gratefully, Kelsey pressed PH again, but again the button only flickered. Gotta use your own card, the guy said. They're programmed for each floor. The door was already sliding shut, and Kelsey shot her arm out to catch it. The rubber bumpers bounced off her wrist. Oh, right, my boyfriend has it. She stepped out. As the door slid closed behind her, Kelsey scanned the lobby entrance. At least Craig and his gang weren't here yet. It had been a while since she'd picked anyone's pocket, not since she was 12 years old. But the old instincts clicked back in as she cased the lobby. A group was best, or someone in a hurry and they had to be rich, somebody who looked like they belonged on the penthouse floor. There was a large group at the concierge desk, arguing loudly with the guy behind it. As she closed in, Kelsey felt the undertow of their annoyance join forces with her own panic, redoubling both. Where are we supposed to eat? One of them shouted. The concierge stayed calm. The whole city's booked up with Fourth of July tourists, but we'll find you something. Kelsey bumped into the shouting man, got his wallet. She hit another of the group on the way past, fanning his coat pockets. Nothing. Behind a giant flower arrangement, she opened the wallet. There, slipped in among the credit cards, was the Magnifique logo. The guy was still yelling at the concierge, so she dropped his wallet into the flowers. Dickhead. But what were the chances he was staying on the top floor? She needed more keys. She scanned the crowd again, making a map in her head of pockets and bags, then twisted her connection with the tour group, sending her anxiety toward them. Their noise ramped until everyone in the lobby was looking at them, distracted. She bumped a man in a linen jacket, fanned his pants pockets and felt plastic, lifted it while he apologized to her. Kelsey kept moving, weaving in and out, skimming close. She brushed against a young woman and emptied her jacket pockets with two fingers. Some cash, a credit card, a key card. Kelsey slipped the rest of it back into the woman's other pocket on another pass. The woman never noticed a thing. Kelsey took the three stolen cards back to the elevator and swiped one across the reader, then another. PH only blinked. Come on, Kelsey muttered. She was down to her last card. Craig and his gang entered the lobby. Their black t-shirts seemed to swallow the light as they marched across the glossy marble floor. She swiped the last card across the reader and stabbed the PH button. It stayed stubbornly dark. Chapter 43 Flicker Flicker was in the concierge's eyes. His long fingers were scrolling a touchpad screen, his gaze flitting across requests from customers arriving in the next few days. The hotel was filling up, thanks to the big Fourth of July display. Everyone wanted a room with a view of the old Parker Hamilton Hotel, which was scheduled for demolition during the show. Every minute or so, the concierge looked up, scanning the lobby in a discreet and professional way, perfect for keeping watch which Flicker had been doing for a few hours now. It was making her weird and spacey, spreading her awareness through the lobby for this long. Flicker saw herself in her wingback chair, her bright red dress easy to spot. But as she gave herself a smile, the concierge's gaze slipped past her and came to rest on a huge man strolling across the lobby floor. The concierge stared. It was hard not to. The guy was as wide as a door, all shoulders and thighs, he wore a shiny black t-shirt made from enough silk for a parachute. Five other big guys cruised across the lobby floor with him, a formation of battleships. A man in a magnifique staff uniform came up and started talking to them, and the concierge's eyes dropped back to his computer screen. Flicker sent her vision into the big guy's eyes. She couldn't hear anything from across the lobby, but it didn't seem like a confrontation. 
The two were huddled close, the big guy's eyes moving warily from side to side. The hotel staffer, a short man with a shaved head, held out his empty palm, and a big guy pushed a stack of twenties into it. In return, the staffer produced a hotel key card and slipped it into the breast pocket of the big guy's shirt. This was getting interesting. Flicker unfolded her cane and stood. The big guy and his friends were headed straight for the elevators. But before he reached them, a woman, a girl really, no older than Flicker, in a very sparkly dress appeared and blocked his path. She stood about five feet tall and had as much chance as a rabbit trying to stop a bulldozer. But the guy came to a halt. The girl started talking to him, a fierce expression on her face. Flicker was already closing in and she caught their voices. Cares about your stupid money, the girl was saying. My dad's in jail because of him. I want to be there when you- Trust me, Kelsey, he interrupted. You don't want to see what I'm about to- their voices faded as Flicker passed. She couldn't stand there and eavesdrop, but this was way too interesting to ignore. And Kelsey, she'd heard that name recently. Right, Ethan's little rant at the bank. The voice had said Kelsey to the robbers. Crap, this was about the bank video, and these people were here at the Magnifique where Anon lived. It was all too much of a coincidence. Flicker reached for her new phone. She had to get Nate here. Not Nate. Glorious leader. This was a mission, saving Anons and Scam's lives. Flicker skipped her eyes around the room. The argument was attracting attention from all directions. The girl in the sparkly dress was in the big guy's face, practically yelling at him. The other five looked embarrassed that their leader was taking shit from this pipsqueak. But she kept going, talking with her hands, thumping the guy's chest, grabbing at his shirt. Something flashed in her hand as she pounded him. A hotel card key. Was she a guest here? Dial Nate, Flicker said to her phone. The big guy didn't get mad, just stared at the girl until he finally brushed her aside. For a second, Flicker thought the girl would go apeshit. But her anger seemed to switch off all at once. She watched them go, clutching her messenger bag, the hotel key still in her hand. Why the hell wasn't Glorious Leader picking up? Flicker pushed her vision back into the big guy's eyes. He led his men into an empty elevator, pulled the card key from his breast pocket, and slotted it into the reader. Then his gigantic thumb pushed the very top button on the controls, the one marked PH. Shit, Flicker said the penthouse. Where else in the palace would the boy called nothing live? Come on, answer. The button lit for a moment, then went dark again. The big guy's thumb pressed it once more. The phone went to voicemail, and Flicker's words came out in a rush. I'm downtown at the Hotel Magnifique. Anon lives here, and there's this gang of goons or whatever here to kick Scam's ass. We need to warn them. It wasn't just Ethan in danger, she realized with a pulse of real fear. Anyone they found with him would be dead meat, too. She turned and headed toward the reception desk, navigating by sound. Forget keeping Anon's secrets. Maybe she could convince hotel security to stop these guys, or to let her call the penthouse. She cast her vision back into the elevator. The big guy was still pressing the PH button. The number wouldn't light, and the door didn't close. He swiped the card again, but nothing seemed to work. Flicker slowed to a halt. Suddenly, the big guy was storming out, his eyes searching the lobby, coming to rest on the hotel staffer who'd sold him the key. He headed that way. Flicker stood where she was, frozen for a moment. None of this made sense. She flashed her vision across a hundred eyeballs, searching for the girl in the sparkly dress. There she was, disappearing into another elevator. Flicker tried to find her eyeballs, but a moment later, the girl was out of range, the elevator climbing away from the lobby crowd. Flicker's ringtone for glorious leader, hailed to the chief, echoed across the marble lobby. His voice was frantic. Flick, I'm in my car, what's happening? I'm not quite sure, she said, but it's definitely happening now. Chapter 44, Scam.
I never thought I'd say this, Ethan muttered, but I'm totally over Red Scepter 3. You're over losing, is what you mean. Ethan opened his mouth for a witty comeback, but then he clamped it shut. The voice was in charge of comebacks, and it had only been a little over 24 hours since his promise to Tebow not to use the voice. You suck was the best he could think up on his own. A knock shook the door, and both of them jumped. You order anything from room service? Tebow asked. Ethan had tried once, but he'd forgotten the passwords. The knocking came again, hard and insistent, before he could admit this. Does that sound like room service? Ethan hissed. He was already on his feet and headed to his bedroom. This was probably because of that cleaning guy who'd seen him earlier. The one he hadn't told T about. Crap. Hotel security must have figured out the room was occupied. But it was okay. Tebow would work his forgetting magic and the whole thing would blow over. No need to panic. Ethan stopped just inside the bedroom, out of view of the doorway. But he stayed where he could still see Tebow. The last thing he needed was to forget what was going on and wander back in. When T opened the door, his expression changed. Um, hello? Where is he? A girl's voice, angry. She took a step forward, straight up into Tebow's face. Ethan caught a glimpse of her before backing away. She wore a shiny silver dress with matching high tops. A white messenger bag was strapped across her shoulder. Definitely not Magnifique staff. T was too freaked out to answer. The girl pushed past him and marched into the room. She looked really pissed. Ethan drew back another step, out of sight now. There were a lot of pissed off girls in his past. Still, it was weird how he couldn't place this one. Even weirder that she'd tracked him down in a non-secret lair. More like impossible. It's just me here, Tebow was saying. Just you, huh? The girl said. So, why are there two sodas on the table and two game controllers? Axel was here, wasn't he? Axel, came Tebow's voice. Axel, Ethan whispered to himself. His knees went weak. The only time he'd ever heard that name was out of his own mouth, two nights ago on an ill-fated trip with a paranoid drug dealer in a beat-up Ford sedan, which meant this girl was a friend of the Craigs. We don't have time to screw around, the girl said. They're right behind me. They? Ethan wondered if hiding was such a good idea. If this girl had found him, who else was on the way? Listen, I don't know what you're... Tebow began. His words faded as Ethan stepped out of the bedroom. Who's right behind you? Ethan said. Now that he had a better look at the girl, she looked familiar. She had high cheekbones and soft blonde hair that curled to her shoulders. Her green eyes lit as she stared back at him. It's you, she said. From the video. It's you, he said. From the diner. She was still looking at him. Suddenly, all he wanted was for her to keep looking at him. He let the words bubble into his throat. I'm the one you want. I can help fix this. Whatever that meant, but at least the voice had stunned the girl for a moment. Her arms wrapped around her shoulders. You can? I can help your father, the voice said. I know how to make amends with the bag robs. The girl's gaze softened, filling with a hope that went straight through Ethan's skin. At the moment, he didn't care who the bag robs were. He just wanted to help her. Okay, but we have to go, she said. Craig's right behind me. Don't worry, the voice began, but a surge of panic sent Ethan's own words crashing into his mouth. Wait, the Craig's behind you? Cambria's angriest dude, she confirmed. The voice's spell was broken. She marched over to where he stood. We have to get out of here right now. She grabbed hold of his elbow and began dragging him toward the door. Ethan went along with it. It wasn't every day a really hot girl in a sparkly dress showed up to rescue you. And if the crag really was coming, it was time to move. But then Tebow stepped in front of them and the girl came to a startled halt. Who are you? She'd already forgotten him. Ethan would have killed for a power like Tebow's right then, anything so the Craig would forget he'd ever existed. 
How did you find us? Tebow asked. How did you get up here? No time for that, T, Ethan said. Grab your stuff. Tebow didn't move. My stuff. Ethan ran to the couch and pulled on his sneakers. Craig is the guy I stole that money from. We need to get out of here before he redecorates this room with our insides. Not just Craig, said the girl. He's got friends with him. Okay, so this girl in the sparkly dress was cute, but every time she talked, the situation got worse. Ethan pulled a pillowcase free of the pillow he'd been propping himself on to play scepter. He crouched by the mini bar and started sweeping little bottles and candy bars into the case. Seriously? Tebow said. You're taking the mini bar? I like the mini bar. If there's anything you want to keep, grab it. Ethan got to his feet. Your place is about to be visited by a guy with a tree trunk where his neck should be. And five of his meanest friends, the girl reminded them. She stood in the open doorway. If they find me here, I'm probably as dead as you guys, so move already. Ethan pulled Tebow through the door and into the hallway. Seriously, T, the guy is scary. Okay, but how do you know we can trust her? Ethan hesitated. He wasn't sure why he trusted her. Because she was pretty? Because she'd busted in and said the one name guaranteed to make him jump out of his skin? For all he knew, the girl might be working with the Craig. No way was he leading Tebow, his one friend, into a trap. She was holding open a door marked fire stairs, her eyes on the elevators. They're almost here, she whispered. Look at her tea, she's as scared as I am. We don't even know who she is. Use your voice, Ethan. You want me to, Ethan began, but it made sense. He desperately wanted to know who the girl really was. Surely the voice could say something that would make her tell him. The words came out in a rush. Your dad made it out of the police station, right, Kelsey? So where is he now? She stared at him a moment, then suddenly the messenger bag was off her shoulder and swinging through the air. It struck Ethan like a sack of books, sending him staggering. She had a great swing. You think I'd tell you? She cried. After you ruined his life? After all that stuff you said in the bank? Ow! Ethan had to grab hold of the wall to keep from falling. His mind spun back to those awful moments on the cold marble floor of the bank. Wait, you're Kelsey, the bank robber's daughter? Oh, great. Tebow was muttering to himself, this is perfect. Kelsey readied the bag for another swing. You know exactly who I am, Axel. You know way too much about everything. I'm Ethan, okay? And he didn't know much of anything. Except that now his choice was between the necklace majesty of the Craig and this pissed-off daughter of a violent criminal. The voice would never tell Ethan himself what to do with a choice like that, but it might tell someone else. Ethan opened his mouth, wanting very much to give T the best advice ever. Right then, the elevator doors chimed, and the voice only had three words. Run like hell. Chapter 45 Anonymous Damn it, no shoes again? But run like hell didn't leave room for argument, especially when Ethan's beast voice said it. So Thibault had run. At least this time he wasn't in a bathrobe. He took the stairs two at a time, the concrete cold under his bare feet. The others were already halfway down the first flight. The pillowcase bounced like a Santa sack on Ethan's shoulder, the many bar bottles clinking. The girl's high tops echoed in the stairwell, swinging Ethan around the turns. She was making their descent into a kind of dance. She'd forgotten Thibault was following. The bright lines of her awareness focused on the stairs and Ethan. But Thibault wasn't letting her out of his sight. He didn't trust her. She'd already whacked Ethan with her messenger bag. What would she do when she really got to know him? And where was she taking them anyway? Thibault caught up on the next landing and grabbed her sparkly shoulder. Kelsey. She cried out and spun from his grip. She started to swing her bag, but then her memory registered him. I can get us out of the building, Tebow said while he had her. But where then? Ivy Street. She pulled Ethan onward. 
T-Ball stayed close, grabbing a few wisps of her focus. Ivy Street. She slingshotted Ethan around the next landing. We can disappear in the crowds. I know places to hide there. Crowds are a bad idea. Everyone in town knows Ethan's face, and half of them want to punch it. But she'd gone from him already, her connection as fleeting as the cold shimmers the stairwell light sent over her dress. Ethan looked up at him, still bonded by their time together. Ivy Street, Ethan? Tebow shouted. Cops? More of Craig's buddies? Ethan tried to slow, but Kelsey wouldn't let him. And Ethan didn't want to resist her. Tebow had felt it the second Kelsey stepped through the door, Ethan's sharp, crackling interest. Man, look at the attention he was throwing after her. A big, fat cable of electric iridescence. An instant crush. Figured, even after almost two days together, Thibault was nothing compared to a cute girl in a sparkly dress. He sped up, grabbed hold of the stair rail, and swung around another landing. Gaining on Kelsey, he caught her bag strap. Kelsey, listen, your dad robbed a bank. Why the hell should we trust you? She flung him an exasperated look and pulled away. I want to keep Axel alive, or whatever his name is. Ethan, Ethan spoke up like this was a school dance. Thibault kept hold, scrabbling for the threads of her attention. Why do you care? We've got things to discuss, like why he set my dad up with a bunch of Russian mobsters. Russian mobsters? What the? Kelsey jumped four steps to the next landing. Ethan happily followed suit. Just shut up and run, okay? She called back at them both. Thibault started sliding down the handrails now, from landing to landing. Only the finest filament of awareness floated back over Ethan's shoulder. He was too busy following little Miss Sparkly into whatever trap was waiting. So much for all their heartfelt confessions. On about the fifth floor, it hit him. What would the Craig's guys do when they got into the penthouse and found no Ethan, no duffel bag full of money? Thibault groaned as he slid down the next railing. It had been bad enough letting Ethan into his lair. But now a band of drug-dealing heavies was going to tear the place apart, getting madder as they went. His clothes, his books. He reached the ground level just as the others darted off into a service corridor. Thibault followed at a run along the wide concrete hallway, past the Magnifique's kitchens and storerooms, past a couple of kitchen guys, Basir and some new hire, who shrank aside to let them pass. It was just stuff, Thibault told himself. It could all be replaced. He shouldn't have gotten so attached in the first place. This was a good lesson, a reminder that he was nothing, unattached to the world. He should be grateful he and Ethan weren't being punched into paste up there. Kelsey paused at a door, panting. What's on the other side of this? She asked Ethan. The lobby, Thibault said, pushing past Ethan to reach for the handle. Kelsey stared at him with confused half-recognition. Wait! Craig might have someone down here in case Ethan got past them. What do his guys look like? They don't know me. Like bouncers, only bigger. Black tees, black pants, tattoos. Kelsey was staying focused on him. Adrenaline helped. Got it. Thibault poked his head out the door and scanned the lobby. A hundred lines of awareness crisscrossed the vast room. The usual web of Saturday night buzz but then a sudden strand of attention smacked into his forehead. Near the entrance, a muscly guy in black was looking straight back at him. He'd noticed the service door opening. Thibault chopped the sticky strand clean off and shut the door. The lobby's no good. We'll go out the employee's entrance, this way. He led them back down the service corridor. He would have run, but a bald-headed manager, one he didn't recognize, was standing at the intersection ahead, staring at his phone. Thibault moved softly in bare feet, hoping the guy wouldn't look up. The others followed. Ethan knew and trusted him, and Kelsey was locked onto Ethan. Thibault would get them out of here, then call Nate and set up a meeting. Then Scam wouldn't be his problem anymore, and he could get back to check on his clothes and books, along with the thought gut-punched him, his laptop. He almost cried out right there, but the manager ahead of them was looking up from his phone now. Surprised to see guests wandering around back here, he looked down at Thibault's bare feet. When Thibault clipped the guy's attention, his gaze shifted to Ethan and Kelsey. 
but any misgivings were disguised with a bow and a tilt of head like a good member of Team Magnifique. Thibault hurried on toward the staff door. Everything on the laptop, journal, photo library, music, was password protected and backed up online. That stuff was okay. But he left the browser open. He'd been hunting for an alternate room for the 4th of July to get around those penthouse reservations. The first thing anyone would see was the hotel's system. They'd see that he'd use the manager's login and know someone had hacked the Magnifique. The game would be up, all his work unraveled, and he'd be homeless again. Suddenly, he hoped that Craig's henchmen would break every damn thing in the room, anything to get rid of the laptop. Thibault pushed open the metal staff door and held it wide for Kelsey and Ethan. On his way out, he glanced up at the Magnifique with a stab of pain. He had finagled his way so completely into this place, he knew it inside out, its rooms, its staff. It was a weird kind of home, but it was his. The only home he'd had for three years. Had he just lost all of it? Chapter 46 Flicker Getting kind of dizzy, Flicker said. Pace yourself. Glorious Leader's voice was in her earbud, along with the sound of car honks. He was still miles outside of town, caught in traffic. With the fourth coming up and the college students on vacation, downtown was hopping. Flicker took a deep breath, letting herself linger in the remaining big guy's eyes. He was watching the lobby, but nobody had come in or out except tourists and the usual party crowd. The other five guys in black had acquired a working card key and headed up to the penthouse a few minutes ago. Surely they were there by now. But where were Scam, Anonymous, and the girl in the sparkly dress? Careful not to make herself dizzy again, Flicker let her vision stray a little farther, out onto the streets around the Magnifique. She scanned the eyes of drivers edging their way across town, of stray revelers wandering over from Ivy, of window shoppers and a policeman on patrol. I can't find them outside. Glorious Leader swore. Can you call them somehow, warn them? I told the guy at the desk I had a friend in one of the penthouses, but he said they were unoccupied. He wouldn't even try. And one of those goons is watching the lobby? Glorious Leader asked. Yup. Flicker threw her vision back into the remaining thug's eyes. And there he was, the beautiful boy called nothing. Flicker's heart stuttered for just one beat. His dark hair, his haunted eyes and he was okay. But the boy made a chopping motion with his hand, and the guy's gaze drifted away. No. Flicker swept her vision around the lobby, seeking another vantage. But all she caught was a glimpse of a closing door. What's happening? Glorious Leader said. One second. She cast her eyes past the door, into the hotel spaces behind the scenes, wide corridors with gray concrete floors and painted yellow stripes on the walls. She found herself in a moving viewpoint, someone rolling a room service cart covered with the remains of a steak dinner, the white tablecloth spattered with red wine and french fries. Flicker realized she hadn't eaten since lunch. Then her borrowed eyes looked up, and at the intersection of two dark passageways, Flicker saw a bald man in a manager's uniform. It was the same man who had sold the big guy his hotel card key. Flicker jumped into the man's eyes. He was staring down at his phone, but the screen was dark, and every few seconds his eyes swept up and down the gray corridors of the hotel, watching, waiting. Got something, she murmured to Glorious Leader. My onboard says I'll be there in 15 minutes. Saturday night traffic. The bald man straightened. Down at the end of the hall, a sparkly dress had caught his eye, shimmering with the harsh fluorescence. Getting closer. There was Anon, his bare feet pale against the gray concrete. They must have left the penthouse in a hurry. The bald man barely looked up as the three went past. But his phone screen lit up, his thumb swiftly typing. Got him, headed toward a back exit. They're almost out, Flicker said. But they were spotted. By who? Glorious Leader demanded. You sure these aren't cops? The opposite, she said. Mierda. 
The sounds of fists pounding a steering wheel filled her earbuds. Twelve minutes out. She was in Scam's head now, his eyes tracking the sparkly girl's fluid motion in front of him. Flicker could hardly blame Ethan for looking. The girl moved like a dancer. She jumped into the girl's vision for a moment, just as the three of them burst out a big metal door and onto the street. The girl glanced back once to make sure Scam was still following. Her eyes hardly registered anonymous. And then she was running again, in the lead, her gaze steady on their goal. The crowds a few blocks away. The perfect place to disappear. Then they were out of range and Flicker was blind, her head throbbing from the workout. She pulled her cane out, heading toward the lobby exit. Change course for Ivy Street, she said. Party of three, one in a short, sparkly dress. Good work, Flick. Nine minutes and counting. Is Crash coming? She didn't answer her phone, but what do you think? Could be she's taking a tech break, Flicker sighed. Could be she saved Scam enough for one weekend. Maybe both. Nate gave a dry laugh. We'll just have to do this on our own. Chapter 47 Mob They were on Ivy Street at last, Kelsey's home turf. The Saturday night crowd was cheerful and easy, enjoying the night air between clubs. Kelsey tried to hook into their feel-good vibe, but she couldn't reach it. She was still holding on to the guy from the bank like a lifeline. He was going to fill in all the gaps about her dad until the world made sense again. He dragged her to a stop. I can't be out here like this. She rolled her eyes. Maybe she should have waited for Craig. He might have let her ask a few questions before he pummeled the guy to death. What's the matter? Past your bedtime? Seriously, there are a lot of people looking for me. He nodded toward Fuse. Including the cops? She followed his gaze. Half a dozen uniformed police were trailing into the club's front door. Of course, they were still looking for escaped criminals like her dad, and they probably wouldn't mind a chat with the kid in the bank video. No way was she letting anyone else question him before she did. I'll get us off the street, Kelsey said, but you've got some explaining to do, Ethan, right? Yeah. He looked happy she'd remembered. Listen, I don't know what it is you... Why were you in that bank on Friday? She cut in. How did you know my dad was going to rob the place? Ethan blinked. I didn't? Why would I walk into a bank robbery on purpose? Good question. She pulled him forward, weaving through the crowd. You said my father's name, even though he had a mask on. Then you said my name? You were screwing with his head. Why? Ow! Ethan replied. She loosened her grasp on his wrist. A little. And just now in your hotel room, you mentioned the Bagrovs. How do you know them? I don't, Ethan said. Kelsey tightened her grip again. It's hard to explain, Ethan whined. But I have this thing. She waited for him to say more. Ethan's expression was full of panic, but she could see the wheels spinning in his head. He was deciding what to tell her. But Kelsey needed the truth. She let everything that had happened to her in the last two days, her fear, her confusion, the loss of her home and her dad, her grief, rise up and reach for an outlet in the crowd. She felt the energy on the street shift up a gear. Ethan, please, tell me what's going on. It was working. Ethan looked devastated, which was exactly how she felt. He spoke in a rush. Okay, I have this power? He jerked suddenly away to one side. Somebody had bumped into him, a guy out of nowhere. He was dark and tall, familiar somehow. Oh, right, Kelsey murmured. There had been someone else upstairs, living with Ethan at the Magnifique. But he disappeared on the way here. Seriously? He was saying to Ethan. Was that you talking? You were just going to tell her? Sorry, man, Ethan said, staring at the ground. But she saved us. What were they talking about? Ethan had been about to say something, but this new guy was seriously distracting. She dragged Ethan closer, her mind focusing again. She'd let herself get distracted by the crowd around them. She had to get him someplace quiet. 
I need a pen, Ethan said nonsensically. What? To write his name with? Ethan was staring at the palm of his free hand. It rubbed off. I'm going to forget his name. Great. Turn out the guy was high or a psycho of some kind. Maybe he had just been babbling random words in the bank and gotten lucky with their names. But that didn't make sense. Jerry was a common name, but Kelsey? And both of them together? No. Somewhere down in his wasted brain, he knew something. Tebow, Ethan said, pulling on the front of his shirt. I remember because Tebow lent me his shirt. Do you have a pen? He was just here, but he disappears in crowds. Ethan wasn't what she'd been expecting. He was a lot weirder. Look, Ethan, she said. When Craig finds your room empty, he'll head back to Ivy. We have to get off the street. The mention of Craig made Ethan quiet and obedient again. He let her guide him down the street, mumbling the nonsense word Tebow over and over. Are you faking this? She finally said. You didn't seem this crazy upstairs, and in that bank video, you were totally smooth. He drew her to a halt and leaned in close to whisper, as if anyone could hear him over the blare of nightclub music and crowd babble. You deserve to know, but I need someplace quiet. It works better one-on-one. -on -one. Kelsey nodded as if that made sense. Whatever it took to get this guy someplace where she could interrogate him. She knew a bunch of hiding spots around here, just had to pick one where none of Craig's friends would stumble on them. Then she saw the boom room ahead, its guitar-shaped roof signboard lit up by a string of dancing lights. I know just the place. She tried to drag him forward, but Ethan anchored her to the spot. Now what? She spun. A short guy in a crumpled white jacket had his hand on Ethan's shoulder. He was rocking gently like he was happily stoned. You're that kid, the stranger said. Nah, I'm really not, Ethan said, trying to move around the stranger. From the internet. The stranger turned to his friends in the crowd. All of them looked just as stoned. Hey, bro, don't we know this kid from the internet? Totally, bro, said one of them. He's the kid in that bank video. Kelsey felt a bubble of curiosity surrounding Ethan. She tried to grab hold of the energy and tamp it back down. The last thing they needed was attention, but gossip was slippery and small, like minnows bursting out. One of the guys was shouting, Hey, we got a celebrity! Kelsey felt her ears pop. The focus of the crowd was gathering like a nasty weather. She dragged Ethan a few more steps toward the boom room. Usually a crowd was good cover, safety in numbers, but a feedback loop had already formed. People were staring at Ethan, then other people noticed and turned to see what everyone was staring at. A camera flash went off. Ethan put a hand up like he was warding off a blow. Coming through, Kelsey tried to break the growing focus of the crowd. Excuse me. Then someone was right in front of her, a tall, dark figure. Her brain searched and spun, the guy from upstairs again. Not this way, he said, hooking a thumb over his shoulder. Police. There were two cops near the door of the boom room, their eyes drawn by the rumblings of the crowd around Ethan. She scanned for an opening in the throng, but the tall guy placed a firm hand on her shoulder. Your bigger problem is back there, he said. There's not much I can do against those guys. Even as he said the words, Kelsey felt the heavy, unswerving approach. The mini crowd of giant men closing in, full of purpose. No point even looking. Craig was on Ivy Street. Thanks, she said, but to no one in particular. Great. Ethan's craziness was contagious. Now she was talking to herself. Beside her, Ethan let out a strangled whimper. The two police officers were closing in from the direction of the boom room, drawn by the activity around Ethan. She felt their professional curiosity merge with the crowd's more primitive, rampant interest. She felt Craig's intensity ramp up as he caught sight of Ethan. Get him out of here, someone whispered in her ear. I'm trying, Kelsey turned, but there were only strangers around her. She pulled her messenger bag in close. The crowd was starting to crackle with her uneasiness. That was good. It gave her something to work with. She took hold of their anxiety and pushed, enough to get them swirling, moving in a wheel around her. She glanced at Ethan. He was trapped in the same loop as the rest of the crowd, his panic arcing higher. 
She pinched and twisted his wrist hard. Ow, what was that for? You have to stay separate from the mob, she said. Trust me, okay, it's about to get crazy. Ethan didn't seem convinced. He still looked like he was going to make a bolt for it. Fair enough. Craig was still powering through the crowd behind them. The cops were closing in on her left. They needed cover. She had to unleash the full power of a crowd storm right now. She reached into her bag. Chapter 48, Bellwether. At last, the lights of Ivy appeared through the windshield, gaudy and chaotic. Nate parked the Audi on a side street, got out, and took a long look at the crowd. A short, sparkly dress, he muttered. Seemed like half the women in the street glittered, and every dress was the same length, about as short as it could be. He slipped one earbud back in as he walked. You still there, Flick? I'm on Ivy, she said. I think they're in trouble, but it's hard to track. Too many eyeballs. Try to get into Scam's head and stay there. Flicker didn't answer. Her breath was short and sharp in Nate's ears. Nate kept his voice calm. Tell me what you see, Flick. Can't tell whose vision is Scam's. Shit, I've never been down here at night before. Drunk eyeballs are the worst. Nate was at the edge of the crowd now. The flashing sign of the boom room threw trembling shadows on the sidewalk, and shoulders jostled him. No wonder Flicker was overloaded. It was a perfect summer evening, less than a week till July 4th, and everyone was here on Ivy. He'd have to use his own eyes. A bike rack next to the curb bristled with handlebars and wheels. A no-parking sign stood next to it. Nate placed a foot on top of the rack, grabbed the sign pole, and pulled himself up. He wobbled for a moment, but managed to steady himself. For a moment, he felt like a kid watching a parade. Once he opened up his sight, looking across the top of the crowd was dazzling. The glittering lines of their attention were scattered and spinning, pulled in all directions by flashing signs, thumping music, bare skin. No focus, nothing to work with. He swallowed a bitter taste. There was nothing more repellent than a shapeless, leaderless horde. Then he saw something, a channel of laser-like attention slicing through the crowd. It came from a cluster of men in dark clothes. They were big, and their black T-shirts sucked up the nightclub lights. Flicker, Nate said. Those guys who were after scam, were they wearing black tees? Yup, just got in their heads. They're looking straight at scam. Nate followed the lances of their focus down the crowded street and finally saw her, the girl in the sparkly dress. Beside her was Scam. They looked paralyzed, staring back at the approaching group of men. The girl's hand was locked around Scam's wrist, like he was a little boy she didn't want to lose in the crowd. Too far away for Nate to reach them in time, and he doubted he would distract those big men from their purpose. They looked too determined for charm to sway. But the crowd, a crowd would always listen to Bellwether. He just needed their attention. He jumped down from his wobbly vantage on the bike rack and ran for the nearest car, a Porsche sedan, late model and freshly waxed. There was no way it didn't have an alarm. He jumped up onto the hood, his heels landing with a metal crunch. A second's pause, and then an ear-splitting shriek erupted beneath him, pulsing in his feet, his ears, his bones. The crowd's attention whirled upon him, gathering into a web of focus. It was Bellwether who stepped onto the Porsche's roof as the energy built, raising his hands into the air, feeling the flow of focus streaming through his fingers. He was best with words and smiles, but sometimes one had to make do with gestures. He made two fists, readying to set the crowd in motion. But then something odd happened. A fluttering plume erupted into the air above Scam and the girl in the sparkly dress. The burst of paper billowed up and outward, carried in a roiling cloud by the ocean breeze. It was money, dozens of bills. The web of attention Bellwether had gathered shivered. A second later, it was unraveling, disintegrating in his hands. An explosion of money trumped a car alarm any day. 
but the organism he had forged from the crowd didn't fall apart. The focus he'd given it scattered as people lunged for flitters of cash in the air, but something new took shape. The mass began to swirl, a hurricane forming with Scam and the girl at its center. Nate stared at his own hands, empty of glittering light. Who was doing this? Who had stolen his crowd? Holy shit, what's happening? Came Flicker's voice in his ears, barely audible above the shriek of the car alarm. No lo sé, Nate murmured. Everyone just went ape shit. is that money? Yeah, and something else. A force was moving through the mass of people, shaping the shimmering lines of their attention. But it didn't point to anyone. It was like a thing let loose by the crowd itself, a whirlpool sustained by its own power. Was this some kind of natural phenomenon, like the greed storms Nate had seen at holiday sales? The girl in the sparkly dress was in motion again, dragging Scam through the swirling mass of people. Scam stumbled behind her, but she moved like an athlete, slipping gracefully into the current of the crowd. She seemed to know its contours perfectly. The cloud of money had broken the web of attention that Nate had made, changing it into something completely different. His own crowds always had a focus, himself. But this one had no leader, no center. It was nothing but a shape, an energy, as if all of them moved to the same unheard music. And that girl was the DJ. It's her, he said. What's her? Flicker's voice was wan in his earbuds. Shit, I'm going to be sick. Switch your vision off, Flick. I've got this. Go blind here? I'll get knocked down. Then get clear. Nate tore his eyes away from the sparkling girl for a moment, scanning the throng for his best friend. This crowd could go loco. Have to help the boy. Nate had lost sight of Flicker but he saw the big men in black trapped like trucks trying to thread their way through a flock of sheep. Their muscles and glares were no good to them here in this dancing, bouncing crowd. Where were Scam and the girl? Lost in the maelstrom. Merda. He should go after them, find out who she was. But Flicker was stuck in this riot somewhere, her vision overloaded. Beneath him, the car alarm chirped one last time and went silent. Nate looked down. A red-faced man in a blue shirt stood staring up at him, holding a key fob. What the hell are you doing on my car? Nate gave the man a soothing smile. Is this your car? If you'll just give me a moment to explain. Judging from the guy's face, it might take longer than that. Chapter 49 Flicker the crowd went wild when it saw the sparkly girl's money. Too many eyes were in Flicker's head, not like switching channels the way it usually worked, more like staring at a bank of a thousand TVs, everyone showing the shakiest vomit cam movie she'd ever seen. The sound was way up too high, the shouting of the greedy crowd pressing on her ears. The bump and crash of shoulders kept her off balance, so many feet stepping on hers. She shouldn't have gone so deep into the crowd, but Flicker had seen him, the beautiful boy, lost in the middle of it all. Which was worse in a riot, to be blind or invisible? It hurt having all these TVs colliding in her brain, but she couldn't turn her vision off, not yet. She needed another glimpse to make sure nothing was okay. Those guys in black were coming for scam, and the brave, beautiful boy might try to get in the way or the crowd itself might crush him. Flicker had never seen anything like it. The money flying into the air, the sudden change in intensity, all those points of vision in her mind, changing from eyeballs into a thousand floating cameras set loose in a hurricane. It had no pattern at first, just the random madness of everyone grasping after fluttering bills. But then suddenly, impossibly, a shape had started to form, as if the crowd had an intelligence. Back when they were both twelve, Nate had taken her on a bike ride one night. Flicker perched on his handlebars. To amuse himself, he'd bellwethered the other cyclists they'd met along the way, forming an armada of bikes. 
fixed gears and stocky off-road BMXs, carbon fiber wonders with solid disks instead of spokes, a flotilla of spinning chrome flowing around obstacles like a shiny blob of mercury let loose in the dark. Then he told Flicker to ride, to pedal and steer herself with her vision scattered through the peloton behind them. In the grip of Nate's power, those dozens of eyes merged into a single viewpoint, and she'd kept upright for mile after mile, wobbly but imperious, secure in the God's eye view of herself from all directions at once. It was happening again, all these drunken eyeballs somehow coalescing. But tonight, they weren't all staring in the same direction. Instead of focusing on one glorious leader, they formed a pattern, a spinning shape, a vortex made of people. Whatever was doing this wasn't leading the crowd, but forming it into some kind of creature, something with its own personality, its own logic. No, not logic. More like emotion. It's a new power, Flicker said to no one. Her earbuds had been yanked out in the tumult. Whatever was controlling the crowd grew stronger, the shape clearer in Flicker's mind. Her vision clicked a little farther into place, and she saw everything. The men in black tees brought to a puzzled halt. Glorious leader at the edge of the storm, working his charm on an angry man. The sparkly girl pulling Scam through the crowd like she knew every step of their wild dance. Like she was in charge. But Flicker didn't care about all that, because the boy called nothing was lost among all those eyes that couldn't track him. What if the crowd storm battered him to pieces? She spotted her own red dress, tried to guide herself toward where she'd first glimpsed him. The crowd shape was starting to fade already, or her brain was overloaded from juggling all those eyeballs. Flicker was buffeted and stumbled and fell. And someone caught her. Someone whose eyes she couldn't see through, whose hand fit into hers perfectly. They ran through the crowd together, and she caught only glancing images of his bare feet pale in the darkness as he danced across the glitter of broken beer bottles. It was him. It was that boy. Anonymous. Then they were out of the crowd in an alley between a nightclub and a closed tire changing shop. They stopped safe at last, and Flicker gratefully cast away her vision. Darkness crashed down around her, full of fireworks and shooting stars from her overloaded brain. Her head was pounding, her dizziness tipping the whole earth sideways underfoot. Anon, she said, just to ground herself. Whoa. His voice came. How'd you know it was me, Riley? She smiled, half motion sick, half giddy from her God's eye view. I just do. Chapter 50 Scam Ethan could feel the thud of dance music through his shoes. He was standing behind the biggest guitar he'd ever seen. Sure, it wasn't real, just a sign adorning the rooftop of the club Kelsey had dragged him into, past the bouncer and into a back room, up the stairs like she owned the place. I can't believe you did that, he said. The thing with the money, that was pretty badass. It had been seriously cool. Kelsey standing there in Ivy Street with her chin high, her arms flung up above her, and a rain of greenbacks falling past her shiny dress, the stuff music videos were made of. It wasn't badass, Kelsey said glumly. It was expensive. Right, sorry. Ethan realized that he didn't want to say the wrong thing here. He wanted Kelsey to think he was at least halfway as cool as her. Without really meaning to, he let the voice trickle into his throat. You probably needed your money for something more important. It was my dad's. Kelsey stared at the bag, her voice breaking. He needed it to save his life, thanks to this fix you put him in. And instead, I wasted it saving you. The voice had nothing. It was one of those situations where the best thing was not to talk, but putting the blame on him didn't seem fair. Ethan tried it on his own. Technically, your dad was already... Nope, the voice had been right. Kelsey's expression suggested that she didn't want to hear that technically her dad had already been robbing a bank when Ethan met him. Anyway, 
He switched gears. Thanks for getting us out of the Magnifique before the crag made me into ground meat, and for saving me again on the street down there. I didn't do it to save you, Kelsey said. Well, maybe I did, technically. But if you don't give me some answers, I'm going to start yelling until the Craig hears me. He'd probably be happy to parkour his way up the side of the boom right now. Ethan held up his hands in defeat. The thought of someone as huge as Craig precision jumping his way up the side of a two-story building was actually pretty frightening. Okay, he said softly. Whatever you need to know. Ethan glanced down at the canopied walkway in front of the club. No sign of the Craig, and the crowd was beginning to ease up. Just a few cops milling around, probably wondering what had happened. All the bills Kelsey had thrown into the air were gone. And no sign of the other guy, Ethan's friend. He'd been helping them escape, but they must have been separated in the crowd. Ethan held up his hand, but whatever he'd written there two days ago was gone. We played Red Scepter he said out loud. T-H-I-B, crap. What are you babbling about? Kelsey asked. Do you need some kind of medication? You sure you don't have a pen? He asked. I need a pen before I forget his name. But he'd already forgotten. Ethan glanced down at the shirt he was wearing. The shirt was his friend's, and his friend's name was Anon. I wasn't Quite it, but close. Kelsey glared at him, her green eyes shining. The sea breeze caught her hair and sent it out in a spray of pale curls above her shoulders. Her dress rippled and shone in the neon of the boom room sign. She was maybe the most awesome girl who'd ever hated him. He felt the voice lurch up, tickling his throat. He really wanted Kelsey to like him. The odds were pretty much against it, of course. She blamed him for a bunch of things already. And he couldn't trust the voice for this. It only cared about the short term. It said stuff that would make someone like you for the next five minutes, which usually meant lying. And when people found out about his lies, they never trusted him again. Ethan didn't want Kelsey to like him for only five minutes. Plus, one slip up with Kelsey, and she'd probably throw him off the roof and into the waiting arms of the Craig. He gritted his teeth against the voice. Kelsey gathered herself. She looked like she had a lot to talk about. So, what do you know about the new drug dealers in Cambria? The one selling crocodile? Ethan frowned. Was that a reptile? It's a drug, Kelsey explained. She looked really upset about it. Okay, let me start simpler. Why were you in the bank Friday? I was banking. This isn't a joke, Ethan. He felt the voice itching to get out, but clamped it down. Honest, I was in the bank to put away some money. Money I'd come into unexpectedly. You stole it from Craig. Kelsey watched him coolly. Pretty much. So why'd you decide to screw with my dad? I don't know anything about your dad, except that he is one scary guy. Which was the wrong thing to say, again. He isn't, Kelsey cried, looking like she was about to swing the bag at him. At least it would be lighter now. But this was not going well. Ethan gave in to the voice. He is when he's carrying a gun that big, Kells, and wearing a mask. But maybe that's not his usual outfit. The words seemed to make a difference. She looked at him, her eyes bright and green and sad. I guess you were scared. You were all pretty scared in there. Well, I was anyway. I still can't believe he did it. He's not like that. He's never hurt anyone. Kelsey leaned on the wall beside the guitar billboard. The pulsing neon light was making a halo of her hair. Now the bag rods are looking for my dad and me. I can't even go home. I can't go home either, Ethan said, and that made her turn and look at him again. Really look at him, like they shared something. The weird thing was, he'd said it with his real voice, and it had worked. Maybe if he stuck to honesty for once. All I wanted was a ride home. That's how this whole thing started. The Craig gave me a ride. Seriously, that guy did you a favor? He thought I was someone else. One of his boss's, um, henchmen? 
Kelsey nodded. I can see how you convinced him, what with your knowledge of criminal lingo. Seriously? Henchmen? She was making fun of him, but he didn't mind. There was nothing mean in it. Just the fact that she was talking to him made anything she said okay. But then her eyes fell. My dad's always been a criminal as long as I can remember. But he doesn't rob banks. He owed money. Ethan wondered what kind of cash flow problem would drive a guy to rob a bank. For a moment, he was glad for his voice. He could always weasel his way into money when he needed it or get a free ride somehow. And usually with less danger than the average bank robbery as long as he didn't get any more rides from paranoid drug dealers. How'd you know all that stuff about us? Kelsey asked. You said our names. You mentioned my mom. Ethan sighed. She was never going to let this go. And Ethan found he really wanted her to be okay. She'd saved him twice already that night. Plus, she was cute and sad and lonely. And Ethan got that. He was lonely, too. He wanted her to like him for more than just the next five minutes. Whatever helps Kelsey the most, he thought. Whatever makes us closer. He hoped those two things went together. Then he let the voice take over. That wasn't me talking, Ethan heard himself say. That was this thing inside me, my other voice. <laughs>